real quick, I just sent the link to everyone with the public comment uh, to share the public comment. I just want to make sure everybody received it. And I, I did send you a text message as well to confirm that. And then, Brandy, did you see the email from Kirsten saying she did not receive the Zoom link? I did, and I forwarded, okay. forwarded it to her as well. Excellent, thank you. Yes, and I just, I need someone to speak up if they did not get the link to share the public comment, just so I can make sure we were clear.
it's 10 o'clock, so I think I can, I think we have everybody. All right, it's a little after 10 o'clock, so I will call to order the meeting of the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners for Friday, May 1st of 2020. Would um, Commissioner Hubs, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Sorry, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Hubbs. Uh, Brandy, will you be calling the roll? Yes, sir. Chairman Johnston? Here. Vice Chairwoman East. Here. Commissioner Almberg. Here. Commissioner Barnes. Here. Commissioner Cavilia. Here. Commissioner Hubs. Here. Commissioner Keel. Here. Commissioner McNinch. Here. And Commissioner Valentine. Here. Okay, we'd ask that any cab members who are present in viewing the media through the YouTube link, should send an email to wildlifecommission at endow.org indicating their presence. With that, we'll move on to agenda item number two, approval of agenda, Chairman Brad Johnston for possible action. The commission will review the agenda and may take action to approve the agenda. The commission may remove items from the agenda continue items for consideration or take items out of order. Any comments or questions about the agenda? Seeing none, uh, Deputy Attorney General Burkett, do I need to take public comment on approval of the agenda? No. Um, with that, if there's any further discussion uh, or none, a motion with respect to agenda item number two. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. I'll second that. Okay, there's a motion to approve the agenda as presented by Commissioner Valentine, seconded by uh, Vice Chair East. All those in favor signify by saying aye, and I'd ask that you just raise your hand as well. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 9-0. With that, we'll move on to agenda item number three, member items, announcements, and correspondence, Chairman Brad Johnston, informational. Commissioners may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. The commission will review and may discuss correspondence sent or received by the commission since the last regular meeting and may provide copies for the exhibit file. Commissioners may provide hard copies of their correspondence for the written record Correspondence sent or received by Secretary Wosley may also be discussed. Uh, I received a number of emails with respect to agenda item numbers 6A and B. I forwarded those on to the department. Most of the commissioners were also copied on those, uh, but in terms of correspondence, mine all related to the quota setting. Uh, any other member items or announcements? Secretary Wosley, anything in that regard? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, no, I will add that um, the department received significant number of comments. Some of those comments were sent directly to the department. Some of the comments were sent directly to some or all the commissioners uh, and were sent to multiple different emails. Um, the department I believe captured all of those public comments, redistributed them to the entirety of, of the commission and have those chronicled and cataloged uh, for uh, public review should, should there be a desire to do so. So thank you. 
Thank you, Secretary Wasley. I, I just uh, want to thank everyone at the department, uh, and especially Brandy, for all her work and getting information circulated, the correspondence circulated, and everyone at the department who's undertook efforts to make sure this commission could continue uh, with its essential business uh, during these challenging times. I do appreciate the effort that everybody has put forward to make sure that we can proceed. Uh, I also want to thank um, one announcement. I want to thank the department for taking steps um, for uh, especially youth uh, in certain age ranges for allowing them to get their hunter safety education completed uh, by alternative means when there was no classes available. Uh, I know there was 11 and 12 year olds who had completed all their workbooks scheduled to go to class and they were able to do the final aspect via online programs, take their tests and get their hunter's education certificate so that they could apply for uh, the upcoming draw, uh, which I think was a, a, a very good thing for the department to do uh, for those individuals caught in a very unique set of circumstances. Uh, one of which was my oldest son who was 12, who had completed his workbook was very excited to go to his live class that happened to be canceled uh, due to the coronavirus uh, shutdown, but then had alternative means by which he was allowed to complete that class, take his test, and thankfully he passed it. So uh, I do want to thank the department because I know he wasn't the only one in that category of individuals who needed to get that completed to be eligible. So I want to thank the department uh, for allowing that to occur and making accommodations. There are no other member items or announcements or correspondence. Uh, we can close agenda item number three and move on to agenda item number four. Agenda item number four, approval of minutes. Chairman Brad Johnston for possible action. Commission minutes, minutes may be approved from the April 10th, 2020 meeting. Once the commission members have discussed this agenda item, a recess of a specific duration will be taken in order for the public to provide input at the following email address, wildlifecommission at endow.org. Before reconvening the meeting, public comments will be shared with, with the commission prior to taking any action. Any comments? Well, has everyone had a chance to review the minutes? Any comments from the commission on the minutes from the April 10th, 2020 meeting? Seeing none. Uh, what I'd like to do then is take a very short break until 1015 to receive any public comments on the minutes from the April 10th, 2020 meeting. Those public comments can be sent via email to wildlifecommission at endow.org, N-D-O-W.org. So we will reconvene in seven minutes at 1015 uh, after giving everyone who was watching via the live stream video on YouTube to submit their public comments on the April 10th minutes. Uh, Chairman, before we take a quick break, um, I had emailed some staff to send a test email to the Wildlife Commission address because I'm getting nothing from the cabs from a couple of agenda items ago and I've not received the test email. When we tested it last week, it worked. Um, so I'm not really sure what to do at this point. I'm communicated with our IT um, person, Eric, and we're, we're communicating outside of Zoom. Give me just a moment. It looks like another staff member can see those emails and she's going to forward them to me specifically so I can get caught up to see what's going on. I'll let you know when those come in.
Okay, those are coming in from an, another source. So it looks like we're good to go. I uh, just wanted to make sure we were in a good place. Let's go ahead and, and take that break until 10.15 and to receive the public comment on agenda item number four, which is approval of the minutes. Thank you.
Okay, I see that it's 1015, so. We have not received any public comment on the approval of the amended on the approval of the minutes from the April 10th, 2020 meeting. So if there are that's no further comments or discussion, entertain a motion. Chairman, I make a motion to approve the minutes of April 10th, 2020. Second that. Okay, I have a motion to approve the minutes from the April 10th, 2020 meeting as presented. Motion made by Vice Chair East, seconded by Commissioner Olmberg. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries 9-0. With that, we can move on to agenda item number five. County advisory boards to manage wildlife member items. Informational. Informational. CAB members may present emergent items at wildlifecommission at endow.org. These comments will be shared with the commission. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action will be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Accordingly, I request that if there are any CAB comments, they be emailed to wildlifecommission at endow.org. So we, those can then be shared with the commission. We're not going to take a break for those at this time, and we'll just move on to agenda item number six. But I hope that if the CAB members have any announcements or uh, items to present to the commission, they will do so via the email platform. With that, we'll move on to agenda item number six, commission regulations for possible action, public comment allowed. 6A, commission regulation 20-11, big game quotas for the 2020 2021 season, wildlife staff specialists, Cody Schroeder, Cody McKee, and Mike Cox for possible action. The commission will establish, establish regulations for the numbers of tags to be issued for mule deer, pronghorn antelope, elk, bighorn sheep, and mountain goats for the 2020-2021 seasons. Once the commission members have discussed this agenda item, a recess of a specific duration will be taken in order for the public to provide input at the following email address, wildlifecommission at endow.org. Before reconvening the meeting, public comments will be shared with the commission prior to taking any action. Okay, so what I'd like to do is, what we've done in the past, is move through this at least in pieces to get input from the department on the quota recommendations uh, and then take public comment and vote on this in, in distinct pieces of the proposed quotas and I intend to do that uh, again today. Uh, what I'd like to do is start off with the pronghorn the bighorn sheep tags, including the Nelson Desert bighorn sheep, California bighorn sheep, and the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep quotas, as well as the mountain goat. So that would be the first 10 pages of the proposed quotas in Com Commission Regulation 20-11. When we get through the discussion on that, we'll break for public comment on those items. And then what I hope to do is do um, the elk tags in one block and then the deer tags in a separate final block or third block. Does that make sense to everybody? And that's pretty consistent with what we have done in the past uh, and in, in terms of the quota setting meeting. So with that, uh, I, will, I will turn it over to the department, but before doing so, I do wanna say I do very much appreciate the department sharing in the support materials, the quota recommendation forms. To receive the proposed quotas along with the recommendation forms, and if you couple that with the CAB workshop that occurred in Ely, uh, I think this commission and any member of the public uh, could have an understanding of how the department arrived at each specific quota recommendation. So I do wanna 
thank the department for that. That was a, an addition that I don't believe I've seen in the past. Uh, I think this was the first time that occurred and it, it shed a lot of light as to the process by which the department arrived at its quota recommendations. And if you pair that with the CAB workshop that we had in Ely, it, it provides a lot of, uh, it dispels the mystery, I guess, so to speak, as to how specific numbers are arrived at. So uh, I wanna thank the department for that. So we can move on. I don't know if there's things from the department, uh, Secretary Wosley, Deputy Director Rob, or where we head first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Tony Wasley for the record. Uh, good morning to you and fellow commissioners. Um, thank you for your patience as we work through this unprecedented uh, time and a unique venue in which to uh, hold a commission meeting. And I, I want to extend a, a, some gratitude and appreciation to uh, key staff, uh, DATS Division Administrator Kim Munoz and our IT professional Eric Duggar for <clears throat> helping us through the, some of the technology here. Uh, it is truly a unique setting to have one of, if not the single most important meeting of the year. Uh, we have seven commission meetings a year. Uh, certainly season setting is important, but uh, quota meeting is, has typically been one of the most well attended, uh, heavily commented, uh, robustly debated um, meetings of the year. <clears throat> uh, we're already seeing some pretty remarkable interest in what Nevada has to offer through our big game application period, which is presently open. There's an overwhelming demand uh, by both residents and non-residents. It's a clear indication that there's something in Nevada uh, that, that hunters view it as valuable uh, and desire to have an opportunity to, to pursue. And with that, before we dive into the specific recommendations, I, I would like to have uh, Deputy Director Rob just provide us a really brief update as to where we are in this current application process. Um, again, this will be open until 11 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Monday, uh, May 4th. Uh, so we still have a few days left. And as history has shown us, those past few days have been um, significant in terms of the number of applications and applicants uh, that we get. Uh, however, I thought it would be valuable to kind of take a look at a snapshot of, of where we are um, and those, those timelines. So with that, I'll turn it over to Deputy Director Rob uh, to kind of give us an update on where we are with this current application period. Jack Rob, for the record, uh, I'm gonna share the dashboard with the commission and people watching on YouTube. Uh, the first dashboard I'm gonna go over, uh, the green line represents this year application period. The yellow is last year's application period. Uh, we did extend the application period for one week and it looks like we trailed behind most of the time, but we do have an extended one week period. To date, 54,278 people have applied. Uh, total number of applications of 238,284 at the moment, an average of 4.3 applications per applicant. Uh, yesterday, we had a great day. We did 15,496 applications. And of right now, we have 2,807 applications in. The next dashboard I'm going to show you is uh, by species number of applicants. The blue represents last year's totals. The green represents this year. Uh, one thing I really want to point out on this one is the elk last year we received 80, 87,744 applications compared to 76,708 applications for mule deer. You can see this year the mule deer is trending higher than the elk and there's a couple reasons for that. One of the reasons is we did not offer the delk tag as a possibility this year. Uh, the department uh, brought forward that proposal. Uh, we, we're trying to get more people in the field and having the same person with two tags uh, limited some opportunity to get additional people in the field, a, a different hunter in the field. And then we also limited people to one elk tag per 
draw. You can't have a cow tag and a bull tag at the same time. That has had an impact. That has been the biggest driver to our call center this year. Uh, people asking, do we do gender specific draw? Uh, because they're debating whether they're even going to put in for a cow tag this year, because if their cow draw number is lower than the bull, they will draw that cow prior to the bull. So the biggest question we've received on the phone this year is do we have a gender specific draw? And because we answer, we do not have a gender specific draw. We see a down tick in applications on elk combined with our delk tagged, uh, not having it on our sheep. Uh, we also do not have a gender specific draw. And uh, so you see a lot of people putting in for you tags are the ones that have already drawn a ram tag. Uh, historically, people don't put in for RAM and U in the same year because their U tags, uh, if they draw that U tag with a lower draw number, it would uh, exclude them from getting that RAM tag. The next uh, dashboard I'm going to show you is a customer breakdown. Uh, 54,278 people have applied. We have 2,579 new people in, 6,520 people that participated in the draw in 2018 did participate in the draw in 2019, but we got them back. And then 45,000 loyal customers have applied in the last two years. But the number that we are chasing right now is this 28,518. Uh, that's the number of people that applied last year that still haven't applied this year. And we only have days left. I mean, we close Monday and we still have that many people that did not apply. Another thing I wanna show on this is we can break it down by age group. You can see the 21 to 25 year old age group. They lag behind in applications pretty much every year. That's that college age, that's the time that uh, they get busy doing other things and then we have to try to get them back in these years. We have 8,000 approximately people that applied for tags in 2018 that didn't apply in 2019. And if they don't apply this year, they lose all their bonus points. We reviewed those 8,000 at 10 o'clock today. Calcomy sent out a text message to all 8,000 uh, individuals that they risk losing their bonus points. And what I found in a review of that is a lot of those people in that 8,000 fall within that, you know, basically 18 to 25 year old age group. Uh, they get busy doing other things, but they do sit on four or five different bonus points. Uh, and we're, we're chasing those customers to make sure that they don't lose those bonus points. I'm going to go to the big game map, geo map. This is uh, an interesting slide. If I hover over the counties, you can see the county number pull up here in the corner. But the interesting thing about this slide is Reno has the most applicants with 5,518, followed by Las Vegas with 5,339. And that goes to Sparks. Spring Creek, Henderson, Elko. So the three corners of the state are represented in the top six cities applying. The other thing uh, on this one, you can see 35, if I hover over a state, 35,618 people from Nevada have applied, 6,403 from California. We have applicants from every single state, but Rhode Island is still a blank. Uh, I'd like to get somebody from Rhode Island so we have all 50 states uh, represented. But at this point, we are still lacking Rhode Island. But this tells us where our customers are coming from and uh, enables us to do outreach. And when we do our outreach, uh, you can see some, some changes in marketing and, and our pushes. I'm going to go back to the original slide that I showed you. And I'm going to go over some of the things that you can see occurring. Uh, at the beginning, right here, we opened up day one 
uh, is the first day we started working from home. And we were 3,000 and below on most days. Uh, if I hover over it, you can see the number. And this was when the country and the state was in shock and trying to figure out what the new norm was. Uh, right here, uh, our numbers were poor enough, we decided we needed to start some campaigns. We were very light on campaigns through here. We'd sent out the big game uh, application guide prior to the first day of the application period. And then we do send out a postcard about a week into the application period. So they do get two mail reminders. We did send out a few emails, but when we were lagging behind through day 27, 28, we decided we needed to do something and let our customers know we were open. We did a We Are Open campaign, a simple campaign of just a, a neon sign that says we're open. We sent that to all applicants from last year. We posted on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and everything. And as soon as we did that, you can see our average did increase uh, daily after that point. This yellow dot, that represents Easter last year. Easter is historically a big day because that's the day that families get together. But you can tell, I do believe it's due to social distancing and families not even get together to try to stay safe and healthy for Nevada. Our Easter did not trend as high as it has in the past. It usually is a big day. We got today uh, 36, 35, 36, and we were running way behind. We were 5,700 applications behind. Uh, it was 14 days left, we were 5,700 applications behind. So we made an effort to do internal. We did podcast out of Endow. We started marketing campaigns with uh, Go Hunt, Epic Outdoors. We're working with Dead Eye Outfitters. We're working. We're going to work with uh, Remy Warren. Uh, these individuals have email lists. They have huge Instagram following. They have multiple things, and we're doing a lot of outreach through Endow. Uh, last Friday. We sent out a text message to everybody that applied last year telling them that when the deadline is that they can still get in and update their applications and they still can get in and apply for more species and to remind their friends. Uh, this 4.38 applications per applicant, if you click on a day, 4.08. What we're finding is no day meets that 4.38 average that we have. What that is telling us is people are updating their applications after they originally apply. And uh, so that's part of our drive. Uh, like I said, at 10 o'clock today, we did send out a, a text message to uh, the 8,000 people that risk losing bonus points. We are sending out another reminder text message today in the noon hour to 91,000 people uh, that have either applied in the this year or applied in the prior two years. So a total of 91,000 people should be getting text messages in the new hour, uh, trying to finish that strong. As Director Wosley indicated, the last two days are historically big. We have a bunch of procrastinators even within the department. And uh, it takes us about 27 days to get to 100,000 applications and then up to 44 days to get to that 200,000 applications and then we get net excess of 100,000 applications in that last week with last year receiving 62,000 applications in the last two days the application period was open. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and answer any questions anybody may have about what we just showed you. But uh, like I said, you can look at some trends like getting rid of the delk tag and allowing only one elk tag per species. We have a high expressed desire to get in the field. People really want that bull tag, but they also want to go cow hunting, but they don't want to risk that bull tag. So we're going to be bringing forward different options to the TAC Community Commission to meet that expressed desire we're hearing on the phones and through uh, our outreach that we're receiving. Uh, in the past couple of days, our internal staff has taken over 600 phone calls a day. And uh, we're, we just keep putting more bodies on the phones and 
certifying hunter ed cards and doing everything can to, to meet the customer needs. So I can answer any question anybody may have. Questions for direct Deputy Director Rob, Mr. Allmer. Yes, Jack, it, um, have you had any correspondence with any of our neighboring states? Are they seeing the same trend with the lack of, uh, of participation or, or not? I shouldn't say lack of participation, but lower than, than normal participation in their application periods? I have been in contact with uh, Epic and Go Hunt. Uh, they uh, do uh, consulting for Westwide applications. And what I hear through them, because they're in contact with all the states, just like they're in contact with us. Uh, New Mexico's draw closed a few days ago, or it, it closed a while back. Uh, we're the only ones that have been open only during the Corona uh, pandemic uh, shutdown but everybody else is still seeing strong numbers. The, the other states have not. Uh, New Mexico was actually up. Uh, some of the other states and their draws have actually had a slight increase. Uh, we were down, like I said, but as of this morning, looking at the number of days left, we're 16,000 applications ahead of where we were last year at this time. So we went from 5,700 behind to 16,000 ahead in just a little over a week. But we really stepped up our outreach with text messages, emails, social media. Uh, like I said, working with the Dead Eyes, the Go Hunts, Epics, uh, Remy Warren, others. Uh, they, they prove invaluable to, uh, if we send out that many messages, people get tired of us and, and they'll opt out of getting messages from us. But they're getting messages from other people and, and they don't get as tired of us that way. Any additional questions, Commissioner Hubs? Yes, um, typically when we're looking at our annual um, information, do we see higher numbers in Clark County? I noticed that Reno was actually higher than Clark County and I, I didn't know if there was any anomalies you're seeing potentially from the COVID-19 issue in different counties? No, uh, historically, uh, approximately a third of the applicants come from the Washoe County, Carson City, Douglas County area. A third come from Clark County and then a third comes from the rurals. Uh, no real difference in what I'm seeing in Clark County at this point. Uh, even though by city it showed Reno was the top one if I would have hovered over the counties, Clark County is the largest county uh, in applications at this point and, and customers. So geographically looking, you know, if you look at Fernley, Reno, Sparks, Carson, Douglas County, that equals Clark County. Uh, it's just the way the cities break down, uh, it, it doesn't represent it that way, but it does represent it that way if I'd had hovered over the counties. Mr. Hubs. Just one more question. Just in general, um, what, I mean, this is kind of a big question, but it, it's, I think it's something we should discuss is like, is Endow, does it have any position in terms of the governor's orders and hunting and recreation in general? Um, and, you know, what have you put out to the public and are there any, you know, I hear like people can't, can't do certain things in other states, like some people got really upset because they couldn't vote anymore or they couldn't do this. Do we, what is our position in terms of endo with COVID in general? We're, we're supporting the governor's stay at home order. Uh, we would love to be uh, putting out outreach uh, for fishing right now. And we're not, we're, we're definitely supporting the governor's stay at home order. We're optimistic that by hunting season, we will have some ability to get back into the field. Uh, but, uh, we have recognized that people staying home, uh, other activities have ceased and they do want to get out into the field. And I can tell you uh, that we are in the month of April, we have sold 57% more fishing license than we did in the month of April last year. 
and our wardens and our people that are out in the field are seeing a lot heavier use on some of our reservoirs uh, in northern Nevada than historically in the month of April. So uh, people's activities have changed, but we have not done any outreach because we do not want to conflict with the governor's stay at home order. We're doing the best to support that. Any other questions? Commissioner Hobbs. Another, another obvious question, I just think it should be asked. Um, so do we believe that the lower application numbers reflect the, the, the unprecedented stay at home issues, the COVID-19 and potentially economic distress within the state where people may not have funds to expend on recreation and wildlife and hunting or I'm assuming that's what we're interpreting, but I just wanted to be clear with the department. We were lower day over day represented by the green line, but we did extend the application period a week. And we've had a real strong uh, last two weeks. Uh, like I said, we were behind a day with 14 days left. We have a countdown clock and we measure it with number of days left. And uh, looking at number of days left at 14 days, we are 5,700 applications behind. And uh, with four days left, we are at 16,500 or so applications ahead at the, at when we started this morning, not counting with what we've done already today. So we were behind, but uh, through some targeted outreach and uh, some campaigns we put on multiple ways and through partners, we are now ahead of where we were last year with the number of days left. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, just some clarification. When Deputy Director Rob says we extended the application period a week, that was not in response to COVID-19. That was done well in advance. We had no idea that we would be in this scenario. We just know that since we're, we have such an automated process now, uh, we don't need the, the same amount of time to process all the applications that was once required uh, so we determined that we could safely extend the application period by a week. Um, to Commissioner Tubbs' question, we fully anticipate uh, that <clears throat> worst case scenario will be flat. We aren't looking at a decrease. It's just that we're kind of comparing apples and oranges when we compare last year's uh, application period to this year's because we have a longer duration to get to the same number. Uh, we could run lower day to day, but we have a longer duration. And with the uptick that we've seen recently, we fully anticipate that we'll be further ahead. Um, so we don't anticipate uh, you know, a, a, a revenue issue per se. We're not seeing people's lack of, of interest or willingness. And to uh, Commissioner Almberg's question, um, I participate on weekly calls uh, with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and get reports from other states. and. Uh, there is a tremendous interest in outdoor activities right now to Chairman Johnston's comment in our April 10th meeting. This could well be the most anticipated uh, draw period and upcoming hunting season. Uh, North Carolina has, has seen an uptick of 46% in their fishing license sales. Tennessee just set record turkey harvest and their spring turkey harvest is so high they're, they're con concerned about you know, potentially even over harvesting. Uh, Missouri, the interest at state uh, parks, and wildlife management areas, South Dakota. Um, so across the board, one of the silver linings is that uh, as people have been forced to slow down, they've been reconnecting with nature. And we've tailored uh, many of our outreach efforts and messages to <clears throat> we, when you're ready, again, consistent as Deputy Director Rob said, consistent with the governor's direction. When you're ready, we're here. Remember that we're here. Uh, whether it's fishing, whether it's wildlife management areas, hunting, camping, hiking, all of those things. Remember uh, when it is safe, when you determine it's right for you, we're here. Any, anything further before questions on that before we move into the quota recommendations? Okay. Uh I, I have a few additional comments, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted, before I turn it over to, to Mike Scott, um, to kind of 
lead the, the game biologist through these recommendations as you have laid out. Um, there's just a couple, couple points that I would like to make. And uh, first of all, that all of these recommendations are, are science-based with, with layers of, of conservatism built in, whether that conservatism is, is when the animal's being surveyed and, and if it's an antelope and you can't determine if it's a, a buck or a doe, the assumption is that it's, that it's a doe. Um, there, there are a number of decision points through this process from surveying to modeling to um, quota arrays and development of, of those quotas where a decision um, can be made. And at each one of those turns, at each one of those decision points, uh, the benefit is the benefit of the doubt is always given to the animal uh, with the determination that it's better to err on the behalf, on, the, on their behalf, the behalf of the animals rather than at their expense. So there are a, a number of layers of conservatism built into this process. None of these recommend, recommendations are being made at the expense of, of the herd. Um, again, they're science-based uh, harvest, although a very tangible source of mortality uh, for wildlife populations is not a limiting factor in our populations. Curtailing or limiting male harvest uh, does not yield population increases. And we need look no further than, than where this agency was in the mid eighties um, with buck ratios that were 23 to 25 bucks per 100 does. And look at where we are now at 10 or 15 more bucks per 100 does. And with that added conservatism over the past nearly three decades, uh, it has not corresponded to increases in, in the population. Last point I want to make is that, that Endow um, is not a, a faceless you know, governmental bureaucracy. Um, we're made up by deeply dedicated, passionate, professional, purposeful staff with academic backgrounds, professional training, extensive on the ground experience, who in most instances want as much or more from their hunting experiences. These men and women who compile this data and make these recommendations do not make these recommendations at the expense of the resource, um, rather in a sustainable and professional and scientifically defensible manner. Um, that's all I'll, I'll say uh, about these recommendations. And at this point, um, I'll turn it over to Game Division Administrator Mike Scott uh, to begin to, to walk through these quota recommendations. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Rosley. Uh, Mike, you ready to go? Yes, yes, I am. Uh, good morning, Chairman Johnston, members of the commission. For the record, my name is Mike Scott. I'm recently appointed Game Division Administrator. Uh, today, members of the Game Division will be presenting the Big Game Quota Recommendations that uh, represents months of work by the Game Division biologists, uh, supervisors, staff biologists, and and uh, uh, our administrative assistant, uh, as well as others. Um, as, as Tony mentioned, we have a, a lot of uh, highly motivated and dedicated uh, men and women in the game division. And this year especially has been difficult for uh, those, those 35 people or so to, to throttle back and, and stay home um, rather than head out into the wilds of Nevada and, and do the jobs they love. Um, and I want to say how lucky I feel and how proud I am of these people. Um, you know, there's times that, that they risk their lives to collect this data. Uh, and, you know, we use the, the data to provide these quota recommendations. Um, as a team, we analyze the data we collect uh, to provide the, the county game boards and the commission with the best information possible in order to make the best informed decisions. So uh, with that, I will pass it along to Cody Schroeder, who will be presenting the antelope quota recommendations. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schroeder. Everybody hear me okay? I can, yes. Okay, I uh, just wanted to uh, start out just with a kind of a broad overview um, with antelope recommendations. So overall for 2020, we're looking 
We're recommending about 4,300 antelope tags, a little over 3,000 horns longer than ears, and just about 2,000 horns shorter than ears. Uh, this is roughly an 85 uh, absolute number decrease from 2019. Uh, we use a, about 25 bucks per 100 does, uh, two year olds and older for our guidelines for quota recommendations. And we're looking at about 125 decrease in horns shorter than years for 2019. Um, I have been asked to provide a summary of the County Advisory Board alternative recommendations as well. And so I can, there weren't a whole lot. Um, so I'll probably just quickly uh, go over those before we get in. I think I can cover pretty much all the different weapon classes um, in a brief amount of time here. Um, so it looks like for the horns longer than ears, any legal weapon, uh, there were really only one uh, disagreement uh, from Mineral County Cab, which recommended a quota of 25 um, I believe is what we we also had approved last year. The rationale was to provide the same amount of opportunity as last year. Um, and I'll just kind of throw in, I guess while I'm going along, our thoughts on those. Um, kind of quickly went through our numbers and as Tony and Mike Scott both mentioned, you know, we put a lot of hard work and effort into these. Uh, we don't take these quota recommendations lightly. Um, in some cases, we risk our lives to collect some of the data. This particular herd, uh, it's a fairly low population, uh, really low population compared to some of our other herds. Um, we used a post hunt buck ratio objective of about 18, which is actually below um, what our guidelines um, recommend slightly. Um, and so this, this recommendation, this alternative recommendation really put us behind on that. Uh, we're only talking about a few animals and we would really like you to consider our recommendation for that horns longer than yours, any legal weapon uh, recommendation. Um, moving on to the muzzleloader. Uh, class, there was one disagreement from Washoe County Cab uh, in 015. You know, 015, they would actually like to increase the tags from what we are recommending from 5 to 15. And um, I sat in on the, on the Washoe Cab, so I'll kind of summarize some of their thoughts just from my memory, essentially. Uh, we didn't get a lot of written justification they just basically want to provide more opportunity. Success rates have been a bit lower in that unit. Um, you know, really there's not a huge biological uh, implication there. They just want to, you know, provide some more opportunity um, for uh, muzzleloader hunters. Um, we really don't have a huge issue with it, but, you know, we do want to stick to our recommendations and they are based on you know, our, our general buck to doe ratio um, for all the weapon classes. And so, you know, shifting some tags to this, although it's probably not on a large number of animals, um, you know, if our models are and our predictions are correct, this would, you know, dip in a little bit higher into that buck to doe ratio than we'd like. So we would like you to consider sticking with the department's recommendation. Moving on to the horns longer than your archery. Um, also a disagreement for Mineral County. They would uh, prefer to have 10 tags, the same as last year. Um, justification was basically just to provide the same opportunity as last year. Um, and again, I'll just kind of reiterate what I said before, you know, we're really looking to maintain a, a statewide buck to doe ratio, you know, north of 20 for two, two plus year olds. Um, it's really not a big increase, but um, I just kind of want to, I guess I'll just throw this out there that, you know, just going back to a last year's quota for us, um, doesn't make as much sense. The populations constantly change. That's why we go out and collect the data. 
That's why we go through all the trouble of making you know, new recommendations every year. We're constantly tweaking our models, our predictions and things like that. So it's not just a static thing. That's why, we, that's why we're looking at some of these changes. And then um, along the same lines of the archery unit, there was a disagreement from Washoe County Cab. They wanted to increase our recommendation from seven to 10 tags to provide more opportunity for archers. Um, again, same justification from our end on, on the muzzleloader. It's not a big, we're talking about three, three tag difference biologically, probably not gonna be uh, very significant, but we have seen you know, some slight decreases in that herd and the population with lower recruitment. So we would like to just consider sticking with our recommendation. And then moving on to the horns shorter than ears uh, category, there was really only one um, dissenting of view uh, from Pershing County uh, for units 041042. Um, they would like to see the tags drop from 40 to 25. Um, they, their justification is they would like to see some herd growth in that unit. The population is on a decline and they would like to see the population go up, not down. Um, you know, right now we're looking at about a 3% doe harvest rate. It actually, even with our um, harvest projections, that will allow herd growth. Um, and there was a slight uh, downtick in the population, um, but you know, really these are probably more condition dependent. This, this amount of uh, female harvest is really not significant enough to drive the population up or down. It's simply to provide some amount of opportunity. Um, that's all I had to say on that. There were uh, actually a few general um, comments, and one of them was from the Lander County Cab. They have been asking for three years to consider a ju junior, junior youth antelope hunt, and it has not been addressed. They feel it would reduce the stress on the deer herds and they would like to see this item addressed. Um, and I guess I'll just say to that, that, you know, we definitely support a junior antelope hunt. Um, this really isn't the appropriate venue to do that. We would have to consider it probably at the next, uh, you know, two year cycle of season setting. Um, it really has, there's no scientific evidence that it has anything to do with deer. I, I don't really, we would not support it for that justification, but simply to provide opportunity to youth, I think it'd be a great program personally, but it's gonna take us some time to figure out, you know, how the season structure would be, how the application would be, you know, the rules similar to what we have like for the junior deer program, but we definitely support that. And then um, for the mineral county, they also added on to all hemp categories, they would like the same hunter opportunity as last year. That really wasn't specific to antelope, but um, I'll just leave that one at that. And then Lyon County also wanted to uh, conduct surveys every year as part of the recommendation process. Without the surveys, the quota don't change from the previous year. Our cab is in favor of declaring a weapon for each hunt. All five choices need to be with the same weapon. We really can't do that at this point in time at this commission meeting. Um, that would take some, some changes to regulation. They want to look at relocating uh, mule deer on the sh and predator control on the Sheldon. So those aren't really specific to the antelope, but those are the general cut comments we received from cabs. So with that, I'll bring it back to the, uh, well, first, are there any questions from the mission? Hold, hold on a minute. I need to, I think, get to the, where the spreadsheet is taken down so I can see everybody on the video to see what questions there might be. Commissioner Hubs. 
Yeah, just in terms of the antelope, um, I know we are going, uh, we're recommend, the, the department is recommending fewer for, for both groups, the horns below the ears and the horns above the ears. And just, I, I haven't had, I was kind of cursorily going through this sick game status, but just overall, why are the numbers a bit lower for the state in general for this upcoming year? Yeah, for, uh, for the record, Cody Schroeder, Staff Specialist, Department of Wildlife. I, I think I forgot to introduce myself earlier. Apologize for that. Um, yeah, in general, um, that's, you know, on a statewide level, it's it's really about recruitment. Uh, we've had a couple areas and a couple of our bigger herds that uh, we just had some pretty poor recruitment, low fawn to doe ratios. Um, so in some cases, that's been consecutive. And so for that horns longer than years, you know, we're really managing, looking at this weapon class of the two-year-old for the ending legal weapon, um, two-year-olds and older because the, the yearlings aren't um, available for harvest legally. We're kind of looking two steps down the road. Um, we know we're probably gonna be facing some bigger, you know, cuts in year two, just because of these, as I mentioned, consecutive years of poor recruitment. So. That's largely what's driving this overall, is the change in recruitment for some of our bigger herds. And I'm sorry, what, I wanted to just do a follow-up question, um, Mr. Schroeder. Uh, what, why do you think there's poor recruitment in general? Like, in, is it in certain areas, or what? What do you think might be leading to poor recruitment? Yeah, uh, for the record, Cody Schroeder. This so. I mean, in general, it's probably, you know, weather and weather driven. Um, the, some of the areas that we've seen bigger significant declines in fawn recruitment have been in our Eastern region. So we had a pretty significant winter uh, last year. Um, this year it's been, you know, slightly below average, but uh, we had a pretty dry summer. So we, it's really kind of a one-two punch where we had animals in pretty poor condition uh, coming out of winter, followed by a fairly significant hot, dry summer, just poor forage conditions in general. Um, so it's probably mostly weather and forage driven is our best guess. Any additional questions? Commissioner East. Thank you. Um, Cody, what when you said um you know more cuts next year what are you looking at because i'm wondering if we shouldn't make a bigger cut now so that we're taking or maybe not not as big a cut next year and maybe you know giving more moderate cuts over the next two years so what are you what are you looking at next year well in terms of a number uh for the record cody schroeder department of wildlife for the, uh, for the most part, you know, it's that one-year-old class. So, um, I mean, we could take it, we could cut more, but there's really no need. There's, there's bucks out there. Our, our quota arrays and our, our calibrations are, are, you know, we're shooting for that center range on our 25 bucks per hundred does, two-year-old age class and, and older. But when you start thinking about recruitment, and again, it's really on a kind of a unit by unit basis that we would have to look at that. Um, we're probably gonna be looking at some, some you know, cuts in area 11, for instance, in Elko County. Um, we've had some really low fawn recruitment there. That's one example. Um, but we have factored that into our quota recommendations. So, you know, we're coming down, but there's probably not a whole lot of need to just drastically cut it all in, in one year. That answers your question. Any additional questions? Okay, I don't see any. Can we then move on to the bighorn sheep? Okay, I suspect that'll be Mr. Cox.
All right. Good morning, everyone. Mike Cox, the statewide big orange seed mountain goat program coordinator. And uh, start with desert big orange sheep. Statewide, we're looking uh, very similar to last year, just a few extra tags, but there is a lot of changes, uh, both up and down uh, throughout the, the various units. Um, you can see on the screen, uh, the percent change in the quota from last year. And I'm not gonna go through every one of those. Um, what's driving a lot of the increases is uh, lamb recruitment from five, six, seven, eight years ago. That is fueling those uh, mature rams now that are available to be harvested. And some of the decreases, but not all of them, are due to some recent disease events that we, we had. Um, highlight uh, 205 and, and 207, the Gabs Valley, Gillis Ranges. Um, we had a pneumonia event that really started about the uh, time the hunting season was was uh, jumping off in um, mid-November. Many observations from the hunters uh, were seeing clinical sign of pneumonia uh, that the rams were dealing with. And uh, so we're, as we typically do, we're, we're taking a conservative approach uh, on those particular two units. Uh, similar fashion to what we did with the Clan Alpine population two years ago when, when it um, was struck by a disease event. We're estimating right now that we probably could have lost up to 30% of the uh, adults in those two units, 205 and 207. But as we get more information post uh, spillover of that, a pneumonia event in the next coming years, um, we may we may see that it was worse. We may see that it was less. And then, of course, uh, the the biggest problem with many of these herds that that are uh, impacted by pneumonia is how many years are we going to face poor lamb recruitment? Um, and uh, that that's that's something that we're we're just not confident in until we start to see some trends. Um, you know, we've we've got several herds that we've already been reducing tags. Um, good example is Stonewall Mountain, um, and then just you know almost all of these populations. Uh, from central Nevada south uh, have been exposed to mycoplasma and there's a varied res herd response to, to that pathogen, uh, those polymicrobial several bacteria uh, working together on those pneumonia events. Um, but I, I would like to point out something I wrote in our statewide summary in the status book, and that is, I tallied up the estimated adult losses since the um, early 2000s, along with what I would have perceived actual losses in, in lambs. So if we didn't have pneumonia on the landscape, uh, we would have seen X number of lambs survive based on long-term lamb recruitment numbers. So if you couple that uh, loss of lambs in the adults, uh, we, we've, my estimate is we've lost 1,500 desert bighorn sheep since the early 2000s to pneumonia events. Um, that's 15% of our current population. And it's gonna really start, we're really gonna start to see that 
uh, manifest itself even more in RAM tags uh, in, the, in the coming years. So we've, we've got, you know, just for example, uh, the McCulloughs 263, um, Spring Mountains, uh, we still have a fair number, adequate number of ram, mature rams for, for the harvest. But uh, even looking back at the, the bears here, uh, we're, we're going to continue to see these tag quotas step down because uh, we don't have that lamb recruitment that's filling back in because of those pneumonia events. Uh, but, but for now, um, We've got a lot of herds that are doing well and uh, hanging it in there. And it's really buffered many of those losses that we've had statewide. So as you can see, there's a overall 1% um, increase in uh, desert big one ram tags. Residents uh, flat, non-residents are flat with a 90-10 split. The uh, Desert Bighorn U hunts for residents were uh, looking overall uh, reduction in tags, but um, that's mainly due to we're stepping down in um, the harvest in the Monte Cristo range. We're approaching our uh, population objective in the unit 213, so uh, we can back off on, on the removing the use. Muddy Mountains, um, we have a 20% increase in our recommended quota to remove the use that uh, we have a population objective. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share a, uh, just a two slide PowerPoint presentation. So this graph is uh, since 2003, actually projects into next year. Uh, this cream color area is the number of ewes that uh, we estimate in the Money Mountain population in late summer, early fall. Uh, the blue area is the number of rams that we estimate in that herd. Um, and keep your eye out on this 300 level here. Uh, that, that's gonna be a, a critical number, but you can see that we've had um, tremendous increases in that population from 350 to uh, approaching 700 animals uh, over the last two, three years. Um, the biggest limitation and, and the reason that we need to manage this herd down is water availability. Um, we are uh, ranching bighorn essentially, not only in this herd, but in so many where we've, we've added several water developments. Um, Historically, this population that is attached at the hip with the Black Mountains uh, had to water majority of the time on the Colorado River. And um, in the 80s, we um, found a lot of great bighorn habitat that we decided to add water to. And it's been a tremendous, tremendous, uh, as you can see, benefit um, to all of us, including the bighorn sheep. One of, the, one of the problems that uh, we really don't have any control over is the recharge of those water developments. And so um, we sometimes get the monsoonal rains in Clark County and sometimes we don't. Sometimes they come late, sometimes they come early. Um, sometimes we don't have the, the winter moisture to set up uh, good, body condition for, um, for the ewes to nurse their lambs. But uh, we've been 
um, Pat Cummings and Steve Kimball down south have been uh, evaluating our water um, situation down there. And, and uh, Pat went through a pretty extensive evaluation of each of the guzzlers, uh, the group of ewes that, that uh, use those guzzlers, and then um, his knowledge of what happens when those guzzlers go dry. Um, during those years, we don't have that recharge in the summer. So based on much of that information of uh, water, the uh, drawdown of that water by the, by the sheep, um, we feel currently 300 ewes is, is really our, is the objective that we need to stay focused on. Um, under the current situation. So uh, you can see we've, we've been over that 300 for quite some time. And uh, last year we, we uh, got as close to that. Um, I'm gonna show you uh, the significance of these three lines down here. The green line is lambs that are recruited into the population uh, at one year of age. So uh, the Muddy Mountains is, is a productive juggernaut. Um, it's got some tremendous vegetation that many of our mountain ranges don't have. And so we're, this, this production is, is uh, definitely above the statewide average. Uh, last year alone, we had 50 lambs per 100 ewes. Uh, in October, but this, this green line represents those lambs that survive through the fall, through the spring, and are recruited um, in the early spring. Down the, la the last two lines on the bottom are uh, the red line is the number of ewes removed, either by translocation or harvest. And the blue line is the number of rams that are also removed um, mostly by harvest, but uh, we have removed rams in the past um, in the early 2000s. So um, the key is um, projecting out to 2021, we, the, the quota that I just showed you that uh, the 70, um, resident tags and, and the non-resident tags, uh, we think will get us down to 275 ewes uh, in the fall. And then in, when you add um, the lamb recruitment, the, the female lambs in, in and uh, the mortality that we have on adults, uh, we're, we're gonna be hovering just above 300 next year. So if we continue uh, with the tag quotas uh, and, and wanting to get that population down to 300, um, uh, well, wanting to get that population down below 300 in the fall, um, I think we can maintain that population at 300 with that, with that uh, level of harvest. Next slide is uh, the questions, why can't we move those animals somewhere? Uh, why do we have to harvest them? So I'm gonna run through some of the reasons uh, where we're at and, and why that is. Currently, um, again, a surprise to many of us with so many other herds surrounding the Muddy Mountains that have been exposed to the key pathogen that we talk about a lot, which is mycoplasma over pneumonia, the Muddy Mountains have not. Um, they have not been um, exposed to that. So we consider them a clean herd and it's, uh, we need to address and manage those herds that are clean uh, differently than herds that have been exposed. Uh, I, I continue to be in close contact with my colleagues in Utah um, for opportunities that, that we have shared with them in the past in, in helping them build their, their 
statewide population of desert bighorn sheep as, as we did 20 some years ago. Uh, and I just had another phone call with my colleague, Jace Taylor, just uh, Monday, just to confirm uh, what we just talked about a few months ago. And they are not able to receive any sheep this fall but um, they're pretty, pretty confident that in 2021, uh, they're hopeful that they, they could receive 50 bighorn sheep from the Muddy Mountains uh, for a reintroduction in Southwest Utah. Looking down the road for five years, um, they are looking at some potential opportunities uh, beyond next year, uh, but there's still a lot of uncertainties um, in those, so we, we hope that they can continue to um, uh, work on those opportunities and, and we still have a, a clean herd to share with them. Where are we at in Nevada for using Muddy Mountain Sheep for translocation? We've internally um, made a commitment that we are not going to take clean, healthy sheep and put them in a bad situation. And um, so that, that's, that's, a, that's one that um, we're, we're gonna stand behind and we, we just can't um, throw sheep out there. And, and uh, especially if there is uh, mycoplasma in nearby or even within the herd, um, uh, many of those animals uh, could die. And We've had several of those examples westwide where we've, we've taken clean sheep um, and uh, put them into a population that has pneumonia and uh, we lose 10, 20, 30% of those animals uh, within a month uh, of them being translocated. Um, we're Similar fashion, uh, we, we just, we can't put uh, these clean sheep um, where there has been exposure to mycoplasma in a herd, even though that particular herd may be doing well, um, we're just not sure how uh, these animals that have never been exposed to it are gonna react to it. So, um, And I'm committed to sit down with our biologists statewide um, to, to continue to look at our historic unoccupied habitats to, uh, to put more sheep out there uh, where we do have um, uh, lim limitations that have been addressed. And you can see the various limitations there. Really the biggest one is, is uh, so many of our herds have been exposed to virulent pathogens. Um, we just, we just don't have a lot of good areas uh, to put, to put the uh, sheep like the Muddy Mountains into and risk uh, a mortality uh, from those animals that have been translocated. So right now we don't have any viable opportunities um, identified, but uh, one thing I wanna throw out is, a, is a, something that we've been talking about pretty seriously is trying to return back to the uh, use of drop nets in our desert populations, in particular the Muddy Mountains. Uh, right now, we do not have a secure site, um, but um, we've, been, we've been discussing um, with our staff and others of potentially um, developing um, a water development that would be secure, that we could use to drop uh, on during the summertime. And if we have those opportunities, I think it, it would open up um, some more parts of Nevada to use Muddy Mountain sheep, not only in Nevada, but, but also in, in Utah. All right, so uh, completing uh, the remainder of the bighorn sheep take order recommendations. Uh, again, a slight reduction in the non-resident U tags. Uh, again, um, 
primarily because of uh, reduction in the Monte Cristo range. California bighorn sheep, uh, really looking positive in many of our herds. So you can see there's a lot of green there and um, just, just really happy to see we're, we're almost a 20% increase in ram tags. So uh, that's pretty exciting. So whether it's the, the Black Rock, the, the Jacksons, um, we're, we're seeing some, some great increases in some of those herds and uh, gonna provide some, some more hunting opportunities. Non-residents, uh, again, pretty, it's, it's flat. Um, again, just to maintain that 90-10 split. If we were to go to seven, it would be over 10% going to the non-residents. Uh, the non-resident or the resident U hunt for California bighorn sheep in the Sheep Creek Range. Uh, we're recommending two tags. Um, last year, uh, it was approved for only one tag. Uh, we have had some discussions with our Western region and Eastern region. Uh, we are still hoping to use the Sheep Creek Range as we did last year for source stock. Um, this last year we used them for the lake range uh, reintroduction and we're hoping to use this population for the North McGee Mountain uh, augmentation. So uh, we would not be adverse to just having one tag in there. Rocky Mountain Big Orange Sheep, pretty stable. Um, there's a one tag decline from last year, and that is because we rotate every other year the Pilot Mountain Lepi Hill herd hunt with the state of Utah. So that was pulled, but other than that, all the tags in the remaining units are the same. And mountain goats, uh, we just have one tag increase in the Ruby Mountains, unit 102, and the rest are. Uh, same as last year. So with that, um, take any questions from the commission. Questions for Mr. Cox? Commissioner Hubbs? I guess, I mean, in light of everything we're going through with this current human pandemic and, and, and virus, we just, I've been on the commission now for four years, maybe, I think, or maybe five. I can't even keep track, but where are we at with this microplasma? Like, are we even anywhere near to being able to help this, you know, our bighorn sheep? It's just every year it becomes almost more dismal. And I guess I'm more conservative. Like, I don't want to harm them anymore. And we also have water issues in the muddies and we're we have an isolated population that has never been exposed. It's, it's really a complex issue. And I know this is a really treasured resource by many um, people in our state. And I just, it seems pretty bleak. I don't know what's going on or how we are, are strategizing to help the sheep population. And I think we should really talk about that and I don't know, you know, I'm always concerned, like if hunting them is really the best thing to do, if they're really struggling in certain areas with disease, I guess that's my point. And I just like to spend some time discussing that. So we know, like, what is the long term plan here? All very good questions. Um, and, and I think I was hoping during one of the off commission meetings that we would have a discussion. I could bring uh, a lot of the data forward of uh, what we know, what we don't know, some maps statewide. Um, and uh, and, and I, it, it would be too, too much time to take today to get to drill down deep. But I can tell you, it's been interesting, um, the analogies of the COVID-19 pandemic there's so many similarities to the polymicrobial bronchial pneumonia that has struck our bighorn sheep um, westwide, not just here in Nevada. And 
you know, it's everything is relative. Um, we're we're still over twelve thousand big orange sheep statewide. Um, this was the first year that we saw a decline in our big orange sheep, our desert big orange sheep. So we basically went below ten thousand desert big orange sheep for the first time in in about seven eight years. Um, there is uh, one of the and I don't want to make light of this, but we still continue to not be able to find a vaccine. There is no vaccine it really in wildlife populations. You, you can't touch every animal. And if you can't, you're going to have one or two carriers left in the herd. But it's, it's sheep separation. It's social distancing. And, and that's really the key management tool that we have today um, outside of uh, test, testing for those carriers, removing them lethally from the herd, or even starting over uh, and, and eliminating all the animals in a population that is struggling, that has carriers in the herd. Um, so uh, it's, it's not as simple as, uh, you know, someone's going to come and and give us a vaccine, and then we can recover everything. Um, and we're working with pathologists, epidemiologists statewide, westwide, um, to try to find answers. But our best answer right now is to maintain separation between herds that are struggling with definite impacts to their lamb recruitment. Um, and in those populations that are clean is to try to maintain separation with, with herds um, nearby. Uh, and, you know, the muddy mountains, it's not a matter of if, it's when. Um, and we, we were saying that for the rubies in the East Humboldts, and then uh, we were saying that for years, and we lost 95% of that herd. Um, so the best thing we can do is, is try to separate our herds and really harvest. Um, we're harvesting the rams. We're never, we are never going to issue a hunt or tags unless we have adequate mature rams. And then we are monitoring these herds. Um, our guys are out there in their helicopters. And as we see those declines, unfortunately, due to pneumonia, um, we will step down the, the tag quotas, and, which we've, we've done. And uh, I wish I could give you um, a happy ever after story, um, but one thing I can tell you is put things in perspective. We, we probably had over a million bighorn sheep the time that Lewis and Clark made their way west. We went down to 25,000 bighorn from Alberta to Texas, including Nevada in the 50s. We're back up to almost 90,000 westwide. And, and you've, you've heard the numbers before in Nevada. We went as probably as low as 2,500 to 3,000 uh, bighorn sheep in Nevada, and now we're over 12,000. So we're not, we're not going to be ever where we were uh, before European settlement, but um, I think we're doing pretty darn well and uh, with everything that we're dealing with. So sorry, I, I can't give you any more definitive answers of how to fix mycoplasma and rid uh, our landscape of it. This is my mom, my and my mom, my Water. I say, like, like, you know, you know, I'm like, we're so proud of our 
you know, know are we still still really going to go? And I'm trying to figure out why why that that might might be an issue there. there. Your voice um, was muffled to me. Did anyone um, hear what Commissioner Hubs was saying? No, and I don't know what the issue was, but uh, it, it came across garbled through the Zoom platform. Commissioner Hubs, if you could repeat that. We can hear noise, but we can't really understand what's being said. I don't know what that issue is. I think it, Commissioner Hubs, is it regarding water developments, guzzlers? Um, let me, let me just say that, um, another th- thing that happens, uh, that none of us see, uh, including the lambs that die of pneumonia is we live in the desert. Um, and even though we've got, um, uh, hundreds of, of water developments out there for our animals, we do have, uh, animals die of dehydration throughout the state and it's been happening forever. Um, and it's hard to, hard to quantify how many we have uh, that die of that every year. Um, you know, we're, we feel based on the forage in the Muddy Mountains that um, we really don't want that population to go any higher. Uh, we, could, we could add more water developments, um, but we do not want to see that population increase anymore. Um, so one of the things that I had on that slide was we are contemplating a water development um, that would possibly be associated with the Valley of Fire State Park. Um, and it would, it would help catch big orange sheep during those lean years that we did not get recharged from monsoonal rains, uh, from dying of dehydration. Um, we still need to put um, uh, harvest in play. We still need to remove animals for translocation to keep that population down below 300. Um, so even if we were to add that water development, we, we would not want to increase the objective, but it would give a release valve, if you will, if we had you know, a horrific um, dry spell and the animals could, could survive. Um, but uh, that's something that um, we're, gonna, we're gonna work on with our counterparts at State Parks. Um, I know our Deputy Director, Jack Robb, we, we've talked to him about it, but uh, um, you know, it, it's water developments have been hand in hand, the reason why we have 12,000 bighorn in, in Nevada but they're not always the answer everywhere, Um, but we've used them really well where we have. Other questions? Commissioner Valentine. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mike, you know my feelings on the U hunts. I don't think I have to explain it any further, but can you kind of explain to me and the rest of us, uh, what's holding Utah up on accepting additional transplants? And maybe you can explain the drop net, the summer drop drop net program you're talking about. Utah, like us, um, I, I always consider them to be about 15, 20 years behind um, our efforts that were highly successful. And they've been charging hard. Um, they, they received bighorn sheep from no less than four states this year, um, including us. Um, and we, we were the ones that were, uh, gave them sheep for the Mineral Mountains. But they have mycoplasma scattered throughout their populations also. And so they're struggling to um, find opportunities that are safe just like us, we, we uh, through, the, through the 90s, um, we, were, we were making hay. Um, we had a grandiose plan 
we had opportunities, we had an open landscape, and we filled them all in. We filled all the, all the good opportunities in with bighorn sheep to the point where they were spilling over and, and uh, pioneering in, in neighboring areas that we hadn't uh, expected. So Utah is reaching kind of critical mass themselves in some of these areas. Um, and uh, like the Mineral Mountains, for example, that, that was a multi-year uh, collaboration, sitting down with ranchers. Um, there was some domestic sheep issues nearby. Uh, there was concern from cattle ranchers. So they are, they are running into a lot of um, public land use issues, uh, some social issues um, that they have to work out just, just like we had to um, 10, 20 years ago. So um, they're, but they're, you know, continuing to try to resolve those issues. And so that's where Utah is at. Um, when we moved sheep, just give you an example, um, Mount Jefferson, uh, one of the biggest success stories that we have, um, we only put 20 sheep in there. Joe Bennett, um, had a record survey. Now he's estimating we have over 550 bighorn on Mount Jefferson. Just such, such a, an awesome um, reintroduction and uh, recovery of, of bighorn sheep there. That was a drop net in the summer. We moved sheep from the river mountains to the base of the mountain. And we gave them three months to figure it out. And now they're living at 11,000 feet and they deal with mountain lions, they deal with snow, uh, sub-zero temperatures. And I do think um, if we have a drop net, um, we may have some opportunities down the road in the next few years to, to do something similar to that, is to move them in the summertime, uh, allow them to know where their waters are, and uh, let them acclimate to the climate, to the environment. And, uh, but to, to throw, them, throw them in an environment like that, um, early, mid November, when the snow's flying, uh, temperatures are freezing at night, um, I just don't think it's uh, humane to do. So, so that, that's kind of where we're at with the potential um, of returning back to a drop net capture method. Any additional questions for Mr. Cox, Commissioner Olmberg? Yeah, I just wanted to, to uh, share my appreciation for the efforts that you did do, do last year in moving the sheep. It was a privilege to be a part of one of those uh, translocations. Um, it was great to see, uh, as, as Director Wasley said, uh, everybody involved was as enthusiastic as could be, professional about it could be. Uh, it was it was great. It was a great uh, to be able to participate in that. Uh, I, I do have great faith that if you do see opportunities, um, I have faith that you will, you will look into to taking those opportunities. The question I have for you is, do you ever see a path where we could re-enter, uh, we could uh, augment uh, healthy sheep into a previously recovered herd? Is there a path that we can, you know, a testing path or that we would know the impact of of taking healthy sheep into a recovered sheep population? Good, good question. Um, and uh, we really, first of all, I really want to appreciate your help during those captures. We, we put you to work, didn't we? <laughs> um, th there is a path forward. Um, you know, there, we, we as you know, we've done a lot of disease surveillance um, for several years now, and we've learned a ton. We've learned from our partners westwide. Um, as we see the years go by from an initial spillover uh, of a pneumonia event, we see the, the titers um, or the, uh, those animals that have been exposed, their, their immune system 
um, is still showing that um, uh, that, that, that pathogen is, is still in the population. But um, typically at about 10, 10 to 20 years now, we're getting some data from Arizona, data from California that, are, that had banked um, serum, and they're able to go back to look at what titers some of these animals have had. Um, there is still titers 20 years down the road that, um, that these populations are still holding on to these pathogens. And so I think um, westwide, we, we need to do some experiments in, in a controlled environment, probably not with an entire herd, but uh, we do, there are some facilities that if we have um, some animals that would be captured from a herd that no longer has the pathogen active, um, but that it's, it's still in the herd, uh, the immune system is still telling us they've been exposed in the past, but there has been good lamb recruitment and we have several herds that have that. And to say, okay, if we put in an animal that's never been, their immune system has never been exposed to that pathogen, how will they react? Um, what will happen to their lamb? And so uh, I do think there's opportunities for, for that work and, um, associated with Washington State University, for example, but uh, we haven't quite set uh, those things up. And the only other option is what we're doing right now, for example, in the snowstorms is a test and removal where um, we're, gonna, we're gonna test as many of the ewes as possible, find those that are actively shedding um, the mycoplasma over pneumonia and remove those from the herd and then once we have confidence that um, that herd is, is no longer has any active shedding, then, um, and we've removed any animals that uh, have a titer, we will augment and re restore that herd as long as we've removed the initial reason why that pneumonia came, that came from the source. So, I can't say that it's five years out, 10 years out, um, but I, I do think um, there is opportunity to do some of that experimentation in a controlled environment and, and to find out what, what we have to do to get us there. Um, and just as you said, to get us to a point where can we augment some of these herds that like, like Stonewall Mountain, like the bears, um, they're gonna continue to struggle, I think. Um, and it once once um, those pathogens are gone, are, will we feel safe that putting sheep in there will will restore the herd and not not cause them to die? Any additional questions, Commissioner East, and then Commissioner Cavilia? Thank you, Mike. I um. I, can you go back? Because I was, I, our technologies, <laughs> it's kind of hard to understand and hear sometimes. Um, can you go back to talking about the water development in the muddies that you were, you were talking about? I, I really have a hard time believing that we don't have anything that we could do down there. Is, did I understand that right or did I miss something? Uh, we need to live within our means. So... Uh, the desert is not an endless supply of feed. And it's, sheep can't live on water alone. There, there has to be feed also. And our past water development uh, teams working hand in hand with the fraternity have done a great job in siting and building the water developments that support that current population. Um, there is always going to be debate, differences of opinions um, from people that I have the utmost respect to, uh, whether it's Pat Cummings or uh, fraternity members, but um, we feel that 
we have a population that um, is, is, has reached its care and capacity um, and we need to manage it at its current levels uh, with the man-made waters that we have in there. And we just feel like if we add more water, all it's gonna do is create more problems. Um, it's gonna create more forage limitations surrounding those water developments and uh, more uncertainty during those years where we don't get the monsoonal rains to recharge. Um, and so, you know, you and I are trying to tackle wild horses on the landscape. And many of the horse advocates don't understand the environment. They don't understand how much feed and water a horse eats. Um, they want something artificial. And, and I fear that we are, we're, we're semi-artificial. Um, you know, we're ranching bighorn. And I think if we, if we press the, that edge too much more, um, we're, we're gonna be in the same light as, as wild horse management. And so I, I think we've done a great, great job. And I think we just have to live within our means currently with uh, the, the food that we have, the, the, the grasses and the forbs that exist down there in the desert and the current water developments. So are we, are we seeing bad body conditions? Are we, and can I just verify, because I've not hunted that area, 268 is the muddies, correct? Okay, I'm seeing nods, yes, okay. So um, are we seeing bad body conditions? Are we seeing um, starvation? What can you, I know this sounds really simple. Yes, I'm we- I'm not a biologist. We did, um, and in fact, I had a UTAG myself down there this year, uh, last year, I mean, and I saw some things that um, I, I don't wanna see, and it was sad. Um, we did not have rain, so essentially for four months, and we feel, um, you know, Pat Cummings with Steve Kimball and I, we sat down, uh, we went through the population model through his survey data. Uh, we had reports from hunters um, in November and December. Uh, we think we lost five to 10% of the population in the muddies to dehydration last year. And that's something that we just don't want to see again. Um, and it was because we, that population was too high for the availability of the water. Um, and we, so yes, we had, we had rams dying, we had, we had ewes dying, and um, it was, it, we don't know what body condition the ewes uh, were in when they gave birth just a few months ago, but we're likely gonna see a drop in, lamb, in uh, the lamb birth pulse and recruitment. So we, we would, that is one of the reasons why this U hunt exists or our opportunities to move sheep is to avoid them dying of dehydration. Um, so that, that's something I, I wish we didn't have happen, but uh, we feel it did, but we just don't know the magnitude. So, um... I will also make the same claim as Commissioner Valentine that I don't love the hunt, but I understand when there's a necessity for it. Um, I'd rather do other things, but I'm hearing you. And so, um, so we'll see how this goes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner East. Commissioner Cavillia, I think you had a question. Yeah, I guess I got a, I got a comment and a question. Um, I, I spent a bunch of just to kind of follow up to what Mr. Cox was saying. I spent a bunch of time in the muddies last year. Pretty much all the water went dry late fall. I was I found a bunch of dead sheep on the November hunt. I reported it to Endow. Um, I agree there. There were sheep that died last year. There's 
Uh, without the rain, there's so many sheep out there. They, they, even though we've got monster guzzlers there, they suck them dry. They really do without the recharge. Um, so I, I agree completely with Andow. And, and if we can't take those ewes anywhere, it, I think the more and more sheep you add to that place, it could compound the issue that's there right now. Um, uh, unrelated to the muddies, I do have a question on the bears in 253. It seems like, I know that herd's down, it looks like from 2014, from what I'm reading, it's down like 40 plus percent. Um, it seems like we've always almost had that six or seven tags in the bears and we're at seven tags again proposed this year. Um, I'm just I'm just wondering with the 40 plus percent drop in that population, we're, it seems like that's the tag number we've had in there for a long time, if, if that tag number needed to, and I know it, it looks like we didn't fly that last year either. Um, if I'm reading the data we were provided correctly. Uh, you are correct. Um, we have had that, that tag quota for, for several years now, or thereabouts. Um, when the heyday was, it was probably nine to 10 um, and above that. Uh, we do have um, the continued movement of sheep from the, um, uh, the bombing range, um, the NTTR that, that fill the void. But, uh, you know, based on hunter observations and the surveys that um, Pat was able to do previously, uh, we still feel that there is enough mature rams to accommodate seven, hunt, seven tag holders. But um, I think whether it's the bears, the Spring Mountains, um, we're going to continue to see that tag cord step down. So um, I think they're there, but uh, we'll probably see a reduction. Any additional questions? Mr. Cox, I guess I just, uh, going back to the, some of the alternative recommendations mainly from Mineral County, uh, essentially requesting that the quotas be set the same as last year in 202, 205, 207. That's, in some of those units, that's an adjustment of one or two tags and 205 would be an increase of five. Can you just speak to those briefly? Yes, uh, Commissioner Johnston. So, um, you know, every year, uh, and Cody talked about it, we were out there assessing our populations. And if not, if, if we can't get up in the helicopter, we're looking hard at hunter information from their hunts, uh, their, their summaries, um, their field observation forms, and things change from year to year for certain. And uh, we're seeing some ups and, and we are seeing some downs in Mineral County. So, uh, we're seeing increases um, in adjacent areas, but for 205 and 207, um, you know, I, I said earlier, I think we, we may have had up to 30% uh, mortality from that pneumonia event. And um, we just think it's um, responsible to, to back off a few tags this year until we get more information. Um, of what, what the severity, uh, the magnitude of, of the ram mortality was. And, and we've been having that sort of approach, whether it's the Rockies or, or deserts, um, and then we've been releasing that. So for example, in the Clan Alpines in, in unit 183, um, we, we decided to be conservative last year and reduce that quota down to four. Um, and then our surveys have shared more information about we didn't drop as low as we thought in terms of mortality. And so we're going to increase um, a couple tags in there. So um, I, I just don't want to throw some hunters out there and, and be guessing wrong that the, the rams died at a higher rate. So, so that's, that would be my response to Mineral County wanting to hold the line um, at 13 and, and five tags respectfully for 05, 07. And, and I, I think it's 
the responsible thing to do is to reduce those tags until we get more clarity on, on how many rams truly died. Thank you. Uh, any additional comments or questions? Okay, it's uh, 12 o'clock. We've gotten through it. Unless there's anything additional from the department on the pronghorn antelope, bighorn sheep, mountain goat, tag recommendations, you know, or any additional comments or questions from the commission before we'll take a break to receive the public comment. I'm just looking at the screen here to see if anybody else is raising their hand. So let's... Uh, Let's reconvene. I'm gonna take a little bit longer break because we've been going for about two hours. Give everybody an opportunity to take a break, receive the public comment, review the public comment. So how about we reconvene at 1220? That should give everybody sufficient time to break, get the public comment in, review it, and then we can reconvene. So we will reconvene at 1220. Thank you.
All right, I see my clock indicates it's 1221. Has everybody had a chance? Well, let's make sure everybody's back. Okay, did everyone have a chance to review the public comment? I, I guess I'll take that as a yes. Um, Deputy Attorney General Burkett, do I need to summarize the public comment? If you could just... Uh do it in a brief fashion that would be great okay i will do my best to do that okay uh we got comment from Lander County does not agree with the additional tag recommended uh, in 068 on the U hunt. Uh, the comment was this past year in down move sheep from the sheep Creek range to the Pyramid Lake range, the Lander cab feels that Indow should have moved an additional U during this time instead of coming back with the request to harvest another U from the sheep Creek range. Uh, there was a comment uh, as noted previously from the cab in Lander County for a youth antelope hunt. Uh, Glen Bunch, Mineral County uh, made a comment. The last survey was in 2019 with the results of 52 bucks per 100 does. Mr. Bunch also commented uh, with respect to bighorn sheep, a need is to help reduce the numbers. NDOT and NHP are working with NDOW to help with the sheep on the highway uh, that are getting hit with autos. We feel reduction in you know, 202 is not the answer. Uh, Therese Campbell uh, posed a question about the risk of the microplasma. Could it be spread from an infective sheep uh, to a healthy population due to hunters killing animals in an infected herd and then subsequently coming into contact with a previously uninfected herd. Steve Robinson uh, noted some of the recommendations that previously submitted by the Washoe County Cab, 015 muzzleloader uh, increasing to 15 instead of five and 015. And the archery pronghorn 033, 10 tags instead of seven. Uh, especially given the low hunter success. Uh, Mr. Robinson from the Washoe Cab further noted uh, that the Washoe County is opposed to the desert bighorn sheep you hunt in 268, but they did understand uh, the stated justifications from the department. They cannot find justifications for that hunt uh, with transplants being uh, proposed, uh, their recommendation in 068 would be zero tags. If that was possible, we'd recommend only one tag rather than two. Hopefully this hunt will be eliminated next year as I understand that, that was in reference to the U hunt in 068. Uh, additional comment from Washoe County Cab on 268 will we respect the presentation that was made by the department. There are other options to be considered to achieve the management goals. With the comment, there has to be other areas and states and states that are suitable for relocation that needs to be explored more aggressively. Last year, Chairman Johnston noted that the department needs 300 sheep removed to get a healthy herd in 268, but only 72 U tags are proposed for this year. This doesn't achieve the management objective. 
Paul Dixon submitted a comment uh, on his personal position that he supported uh, the big game quotas as presented by the department. Rex Flowers commented that in 015, uh, issuing the 10 extra tags uh, in the muzzleloader hunt for pronghorn antelope uh, would not present a biological issue given observed populations, buck doe ratios, and the hunter success. Uh, he commented that he'd like to see only one tag on the California U hunt in 068. In addition, that you could have the 033 pronghorn antelope hunt given information received in the big game status book and hunter success that uh, the three extra tags would have minimal impact and might result in only one additional uh, harvest. F Fred Volz offered a comment quite lengthy uh, Simply reviewing the proposed big game quotas for the 2020-2021 killing seasons bring up some huge irregularities in the methodology. Mr. Volts indicated that significant reductions in the quotas uh, need to be made, significant downward adjustments because the source data for the recommendations is not reliable. And he provided a number of calculations uh, by unit uh, in connection with his comment. Joe Krim uh, in the 041 antelope horns shorter than ears. If we are having a reduction in the total population, how can we justify harvesting females who inevitably produce more animals? Mr. Bunch offered another comment 205 to 208, this covers four different herds of antelope. If we removed six bucks from each herd, that would be 24 bucks. So that would justify the 25 quota. And Mr. Bunch on the resident antelope archery hunt, 205 to 208, same thing here, also four ranges, six bucks per range would be 24. And that was the extent of the public comment received on the proposed quotas for the pronghorn antelope, bighorn sheep, and mountain goat. Further discussion or comments from the commission or anything from the department? Commissioner Hubs. My, my only comment is, if, you know, just due to the circumstances, I'm more in line to just staying with the department suggestions at this time. I don't see any reason to significantly deviate. And, um, you know, it's difficult to have these meetings online. And um, I know it's difficult for all comments to come forward right now. And I'm going to rely mainly on what the department suggested, suggested. Um, especially in the state and, and conditions that our state is in right now, um, I really don't have any inclination to deviate. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Commissioner Hubs. Any additional comments? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I would agree. The department, um, uh, you know, brought up um, brought up buck to doe ratios in some of these uh, hunt areas where there's uh, proposed changes. Uh, um, recruitment is low, um, that, uh, you know, that there's still some opportunity in a couple areas by keeping the quotas up a little bit higher, that there are a couple of disease events that were impacting the quota recommendations. And uh, I appreciate that the department, uh, um, I, I know that it's just a, a few tags here and there. Um, historically, we've had a, a, you know some tolerance for that, but uh, considering that the department, um, you know, made the point that there were reasons uh, that you know justify the reasoning behind some of those, uh, leads me to uh, to the same spot where uh, you know I, I I feel pretty comfortable with the department regulations um, with respect to the antelope and the sheep at this point in time. 
Mr. Hubs. Sorry, I have two computers and I get confused with my mouse. But um, my only question is, and I don't think this is an issue, but it's more for the biologist. There was no interference with surveys this year, correct? In terms of our counts and some of our modeling, like because there were some um, conversations earlier that you know we're all under a stay-at-home order and our biologists are not out in the field, so on and so forth. I just want to make sure that we adequately surveyed um, and get that on record for the public. Um, or were were those surveys terminated prematurely? That's my only other concern, I guess. Uh, Commissioner Hubs, this is Mike Scott for the record. Um, I, I guess I would say that almost every year we have some surveys that are that are terminated because of wind or, or some other issue. So there are times that we do miss out on some surveys. With regard to bighorn sheep and antelope, most of our surveys were completed uh, that I'm aware of. Now with bighorn, we tend to try to survey some of those populations every other year. And depending on how many surveys we have to get done, there are times that, that surveys aren't completed on, on an annual basis, but they do get completed biannually. Now, with regard to the muddies, I believe the muddies are surveyed every year. So that survey should have been completed uh, if, unless, and I could be wrong, I, I could refer to Steve Kimball, but I believe that survey was completed. It was, Mike. Thank you. Additional comments or questions? Commissioner East. Thank you. Um, I am I am also looking at the pr proposed recommendations and I believe that uh, with respect to, to the horns shorter than ears, I would probably um, I would probably change that 041042 recommendation down to the 25. And I I just really struggle with the U hunt. I would probably drop that 268 U hunt down to 60, but I'm, I'm comfortable with most all of the other recommendations. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, Commissioner Allberg? Yes, I would, I would uh, uh, agree with Commissioner East on the reduction in 041, uh, 041 042 unless the biologist uh, is not going to rec recommend it based on on habitat conditions but it's a it's more of a conservative uh, re uh, reduction to increase the population that's already uh, decreasing so I, I think I'm inclined to support that unless uh, there's a good reason not to and then in going back to the to the you hunt uh, I mean it, we all I think are understand that the sportsmen are, are not in favor of both the you hunt and as soon as we can lower those numbers and drop drop the hunts all together, the better off we would. So I would just like to encourage us to, to go down the path of, 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 uh, of the study of, of being able to, to move healthy sheep into some of those. If, if there's something that we can do, I think we need to take those steps and also uh, pursue the other option um, of, uh, again, what, it, what does it take to start using the drop net and, and pursue those, those options? That, 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 that's how I perceive our ability to reduce the U hunts going down the road. Mr. Barnes. I guess I'm um, in relation to the uh, the U hunt. I guess I'm I, I would support it as uh, as presented. I think uh, Mike did a great job of explaining uh, what's going on down there. And, and the lack of some resources. And, and so I think we'd rather get ourselves uh, in trouble later, I would be inclined to, to support that recommendation by the department. Any other comments? Seeing that I, I think I agree with most of the sentiments uh, that have been expressed. I've expressed my view on the view hunts number of times. Uh, I do think though, given what Mr. Cox said earlier, 
about reducing the tags from two to one in 068, that that would be acceptable. I'd be inclined to uh, support that reduction. Uh, I, I similarly support uh, the reduction on the horn shorter than ears in the 041 and 042 units as expressed by Commissioner East and Commissioner Olmberg. Uh, the other, the other modification I think could be in the muzzleloader hunt in 015 for the resident antelope horns longer than ears. Uh, if I understood Mr. Schroeder, that could be increased. I don't think we need to go all the way back to the 15, but maybe increase that to 10. And I will reluctantly, after hearing what I heard today, support the proposed uh, you hunt in 268, although that's something I've, like others on this commission, have expressed reservations about for a long time. Uh, I'll go along with it uh, for the reasons stated in Mr. Cox's presentation, but it is something we need to do. I just don't want to exacerbate a problem by not having uh, the the hunt as proposed. So with that, I would uh, I would make the following motion that the commission approve that portion of the 2020 big game quota recommendations commission regulation 20-11 for pronghorn antelope desert bighorn sheep, California bighorn sheep Rocky, Rocky Mountain sheep and the mountain goats as presented with the following changes. In the resident antelope horns longer than ears muzzleloader hunt in unit 015, the quota be increased from five to 10. In the resident antelope horns shorter than ears any legal weapon hunt in 041042, the quota be reduced from 40 to 25. And then the resident California bighorn sheep, any you, any legal weapon hunt and unit 06A be reduced from two to one. And then we would, with any of those reductions, we would make the commensurate reductions in the non-resident hunts to the extent there is a corresponding non-resident hunt. Second. Is everyone clear on the motion? It's been seconded by Commissioner Barnes. Uh, Mr. Schroeder, Mr. Cox, Mr. Scott, are you all clear on where we're at? Yes. <clears throat> Any further discussion on the motion before I call for the vote? All aye. those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 9-0. With that, we'll move to the Starting on page 11 of the proposed uh, quarter recommendations, I believe this will be Mr. McKee on the proposed quotas for elk. Thank you, Chairman Johnson. Members of the commission, hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'm gonna provide just a brief overview of our harvest stats from last year and then kind of talk about where we're at with the department's recommendations. And then um, we can get into some of the alternative recommendations as well. So <clears throat> the 2019-2020 season was a banner year for elk hunting in the state. Um, we saw increases in overall success. We saw increases in the composition of 50 inch main beams in the harvest. And we saw increases in six point or greater in the harvest. And 
Um, you know, really what we what we believe that means is there's there was a little bit of a, an increase in age in the structure of the bulls that were taken this year. Um, overall, bull success was down slightly. Um, we attribute that to a couple things. One, there were a few seasons that were tough hunting this year um, due to weather. Um, we also had some really low success rates in 072 to 074, as well as our area 16 elk herds. And um, in, in both of those, they're, they're fairly high quotas. So low success uh, can, can drive overall success rates. Uh, one of the big things that uh, we, we often talk about is where we're at with respect to our population objectives. Um, the last few years, and it's no different this year, we've been about 90%, uh, at about 90% of our herds are either at or below the population objective uh, outlined in the elk management subplans for each individual herd. This year, the two notable exceptions are going to be our area 11 elk herd, so 111 to 115 and Cherry Creek 104, 108, and 121. In both of those areas, the department is recommending increases in both of our, in both our antlered elk tags as well as the antlerless tags. So really what does this mean for our recommendations uh, 2021? Well, we're gonna see a slight decline in the recommended quota for bulls, um, about 1%, and uh, that's really, we're kind of working at a maintenance mode right now. Um, again, our success in 072 and 161 to 164 was low. Those populations are both under management objectives so we can be responsive to, to those harvest metrics and reduce quotas slightly there. Uh, we're seeing a, a reduction in our overall spike tags. The spike tags, um, spike hunt opportunity is really a management tool that we use to um, help address elevated bull ratios in some of our areas. Um, we're, we're starting to get a better handle on those elevated bull ratios. And, uh, but we're also able to leave a few tags out there for hunters as, as an opportunity hunt. Spike success tends to be lower. Um, and, and we feel that in general, um, that low success is probably uh, compensatory mortality in the overall population. So we're, we're still offering some opportunity there. The big drop that people are probably um, noticing is the is our department recommendation for cow tags. It's dropping uh, by over 3,000 tags this year, and uh, or I'm sorry, by about 30 percent this year to 3,000 tags. And the big drop is due to the closure of our antlerless elk management hunts. That makes up the majority of that that drop. If we're only looking at regular cow and depredation hunts those quota recommendations are dropping by about 5%. So uh, in light of, of having a, a good elk hunting season last year, especially for our bull hunters, um, as well as where we're at with our population objectives, our recommendations this year are very much uh, a maintenance recommendation to kind of keep better, keep tracking along with our antler objectives, as well as making sure that we're in compliance with those elk management subplans and the population objectives that are outlined within. So Chairman Johnson, if you'd like, I can go through the alternate recommendations that the department received for, for our elk recommendations, or we can go into questions. Uh, why don't you go through some of the, why don't you go through the alternate recommendations that were received prior to the meeting and then we'll take questions. I think that's the, the, the better way to proceed. Okay, great. Uh, so the alternate recommendations we received, there was really only a handful. Um, most of these recommendations are uh, um, being provided as concerns about um, the upper level quality that are coming out of some of our, our areas. So the Elko Cab has recommended um, uh, uh, alternate recommendation to the department's recommendation in 076, 077, 079 early and late uh, to a quota of 50. The department's recommendation was 55. The Lincoln County, the Lincoln County Cab um, 
has recommended for the early and late hunts in 221 to 223, a quota of 60. The department recommended 70 for both those early and late hunts. The White Pine County cab has recommended a change or a, a, an alternative recommendation in 108, 131, 132 uh, of 55 tags during the uh, standard any legal weapon hunt. Uh, the department's recommendation is 60 tags. And then the White Pine County cab also recommended uh, the quota in the early hunt for 111 to 115 to be 90, which is a 10 tag reduction from last year. And the quota for 111 to 115 late uh, to be 80, which last year that quota was 90. So again, another 10 tag, tag reduction. Um, Similar to years past, the White Pine Cab has recommended shifting some of those tags into the muzzleloader hunt from the department's recommendation. So 10 tags from the early, any legal weapon hunt in 111 to 115 and 10 tags from the late hunt. So a total of 20 would be added to the muzzleloader quota. The and, I white, and I understood that to be then in the resident elk antlered muzzleloader hunt in 111 to 115, it would be a quarter of 30. That's correct. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Oh, no problem. Uh, there's a couple more rec alternative recommendations. So the White Pine County Cab also recommended reducing the antlerless archery quota in unit 113 from 40, 40 tags to 20. Um, the department's recommendation this year was for 40 tags. And also uh, the Elko cab um, was just addressing the concurrent change to the non-resident hunt for hunters in 076, 077, the any legal weapon uh, antler elk hunt uh, to change the late quota to five. Um, which um, we could, could address if the commission chooses to go with alternative recommendations. And that's the uh, extent of the, uh, the alternative recommendations that we received from CABS for elk hunts. Hey, Cody, this is, this is Tiffany. Could you state that last one again, the archery hunt, the antlerless Antler less archery, please. Yes. Yes. So that was uh, for unit 113. The department's recommendation was for 40, and the White Pine uh, County Advisory Board has recommended that quota to be 20. Thank you. And, uh, Chairman Johnston, um, if I may, I can. Um, pull up some information about age structure or I can answer questions and then we can we can get into to some other uh, information pertaining to the department's recommendations as well. Why don't we go with some questions first? I already see some of the commissioners have questions. Commissioner Allberg. Yes, I'm sorry, Cody. I just missed the Elko's recommendation on the elk antlered any legal weapon hunt. For the resident or for the non-resident? The resident. For the resident. Yes, so their, their recommendation was uh, in 076, 077, 79, 081. Uh, for both the early and late hunt, their alternative recommendation was for 50 tags each. Thank you. Additional questions for Mr. McKee, Commissioner Hubs. Basically, um, Mr. McKee, we have uh, over time a reduction in elk numbers is what you're stating. So last year we were at 90% of where we wanted to be. And again, this year, did we go back any farther than that or just the last two years? I mean, how are we doing overall? Because I know elk actually was doing quite well for some time. Yes, uh, that's a great question, 
Commissioner Hubs, um, and uh, it, it's one that um, has a conflicting uh, response, I guess. One is the elk were doing really well. Um, unfortunately, they were doing so well that in many areas they were well over their population objective. Right. And so what we've had to do, do successively over the last five to six years is um, kind of gradually tap into those elk numbers and, and we've been really successful in doing so and bringing the populations down. Um, by, by removing a substantial number of cow elk, we would inadvertently uh, elevate our bull ratio. So we, we also saw bull quotas increasing during those times. Um, it, however, as we've been able to kind of achieve management objective in many of those herds, we've been able to back off of our recommendations just so that we can maintain populations within the confines of those objectives and um, start to focus more on, on ensuring that we're providing a quality hunting experience. Okay. So uh, just again, I don't do a great deal of hunting, but that's why we're taking out the antlerless elk. Huh? Yes, yes, and yes. So like your objectives and actually we're a little bit below where we should be. So your recommendation is to not do those hunts right now. Right. So in areas where we where we're below our management objectives, what, what we and what we tend to do with our antlerless elk is is lower quotas. Um, we attempt to still continue to provide opportunity that's reasonable for the herd so that we can maintain um, numbers at a, at a stable level. And then we, we attempt to provide the uh, corresponding elk op or bull opportunity based on where those herds are um, and the, the management objectives that we've outlined in our internal policies. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions? I believe Mr. McKee, you had some additional information you wanted to provide to the commission and to the public. Yeah, that's correct, Chairman Johnson. Um, you know, every year we talk a little bit about these antler length objectives and, and it really is kind of a relatively new uh, metric that we're using. It's unique to all other Western states. Um, in fact, we're starting to get more interest from some of our Western colleagues and and trying to use this for their herds because it does eliminate a pretty cumbersome process of uh, soliciting hunters for teeth and, and submitting those teeth for aging and then turning around and getting that information out. So um, uh, with Mike Cox help, as well as uh, um, you know past funding contributions from federal aid and uh, the Nevada Wildlife Record Book, um, I pulled together some of our past elk tooth data sets and antler length data and I just wanted to provide the commission with a quick overview of what we saw in the, this, this substantial data set. And then um, hopefully we can put it in terms of where we're at right now um, in, our, in our bull populations in the state and what we see in our bull harvest. So I'm gonna try and share the screen real quick. Uh, let's see if I can, I need to get my uh, Zoom skills picked up here. All right. Okay, so you guys should see a, a picture of a, of a nice bowl um, with our antler length harvest objectives outlined on the left. Um, again, uh, based on our internal policies, internal guidelines, we are trying to shoot for about 25 to 35% of the overall harvest will have, uh, bulls will have 50 inch main beams or greater. And in our alternative areas, we're looking at 35 to 45% of the harvest. And then in our non-standard areas, we try to use just an evaluation of the harvest metrics. And the reason that we're using 50 inch main beam is that we've done some work in the past to, to show that bulls that have 50 inch main beams are tend to, tend to be around seven years of age or older. Um, and, and that's really kind of the time when bulls start to peak in antler growth and antler mass and, uh, and, and are, are uh, 
maximizing the, the trophy potential of those animals. So what we're looking at is just balancing that, that, that quality hunt experience with also opportunity to be out in the field. Uh, so this is cementum aging data uh, based on um, information going all the way back to 2001. We have not done a substantial tooth collection effort since 2015. Uh, however, because we have uh, implemented this antler length objective now for three years, I am interested in revisiting collecting teeth just so that we can uh, circle back to our antler length metric to make sure that uh, we're keeping things stable, which I believe we are. I believe all of our harvest data is, is very indicative of that. So uh, on the bottom of this graph, you'll see the year and on the left, you'll see the age of the bull. So going back to 2001, in each of these box plots, that dark line kind of in the middle of the rectangle, that rec represents the average, average age of a harvested bull for that given year based on the teeth data that we collected. And you'll see across the board going back to 2001, um, there's some slight variations, but in general, uh, we've been hovering around five to five and a half years of age very consistently across those years in the years where some may argue were the good old days of elk hunting in Nevada and then more recently where we really had to elevate harvest in order to get our populations back within their uh, population objectives. So uh, here's this quick summary. Um, this table on the left, I apologize for the, uh, the just, oh, just, just the clutterness of the information. Uh, this is just a summary of the number of teeth that were collected by year, the average age based on cementum aging analysis, the average beam length reported by hunters related to those. So um, in order to be reported on this spreadsheet, you would have both submitted a tooth and also provided us with an antler lake. Um, and then we had some additional antler lake measurements. What I really wanted to focus on was the four columns to the left, year, incisors, age, and beam length. This last year, the average beam length was 43.32 inches. And if you look at the values um, by year that we see in these columns for beam length um, and the age, we see in general a, a 43.32 inches would fall right in line with where we have been um, back to 2006. So um, although we're not currently collecting teeth, uh, our antler length metrics are still falling within lines of historical trends. And on the right, um, this is the graph that, that I think is, the, is, is really important and, and it goes back to our use of antler length information. On the bottom is again the age and on the left now, this is hunter reported uh, beam length. So a tooth and an antler length would have to have been reported to the department for your information to be uh, displayed here. And this is all of our data. So about uh, 1700 elk ages with antler measurements are reported in this graph going back to uh, 2006. And what we again see is that there's a very strong trend of increasing antler length with age until the bull reaches about seven or eight years of age. And that's when they hit 50 inches. And from that point on, that uh, main beam length fluctuates probably based on uh, some component of age and senescence, habitat, uh, productivity, uh, um, individual variation. Uh, so in general, uh, what we've seen is this very strong trend with age and beam length. And then once we go back and take a look at the um, average antler length that we're getting, we're feeling, we feel very confident that um, this year is, is not unlike any years in the past. Uh, where we've been able to provide both a quality hunt experience and opportunity to our hunters. Uh, one thing that I wanted to, to bring up, um, the 111 to 115 alternative recommendations are substantially different than what the department has recommended. Uh, the department has recommended an increase, and I would like to note that um, we had a lot of conversation about the magnitude of that increase, and um, I can tell the commission that the, the ultimate recommendation that we're carrying forward to you is actually less than the initial recommendation that we had started with. 
So we could have gone a lot higher in this population and we feel that the population could have sustained it and we still would have provided that, that uh, quality hunting experience. So um, what we saw this last year in 111 to 115 is 49% of the bulls harvested. So nearly half of the bulls harvested had a 50 inch main beam or longer. Uh, we saw a substantial increase in the uh, six point or greater in the harvest. It was 6% higher than the 10 year average for the unit group. And it was almost 10% higher than the statewide average for the year. Uh, we believe that um, this population um, certainly warrants a quota increase. The composition of 50 inch main beams or greater or longer falls outside of our target range of 40, 35 to 45 for this herd. Uh, and we also saw success rates go up. So all of our harvest metrics, in addition to our observed bull ratios from our aerial surveys, um, our modeled bull ratios, and also the boots on the ground that our biologists are getting, um, all support and warrant uh, increases in 111 to 115, not a quota reduction, which is what the alternative recommendation from the White Pine County Board would, would be. So I know this is, this is really data rich and data heavy, and that's kind of the world that I live in a lot of times, and uh, maybe um, maybe maybe difficult to, to provide connection at times when, when I cite data and not uh, real world experience. Um, I can say that we had 20,000, over 20,000 applications for just under 2,000 bull elk tags as of this morning. So only about 20% of those hunters are going to be receiving a tag. And as Mike and Cody both mentioned, a lot of work and effort goes into collecting these data. We feel very confident in the department's recommendations. Uh, you know, if I want to, I don't, I don't necessarily have a dog in the fight. I'm in a waiting period for bull elk tag, so this does not affect me. But I knew, do know there's a lot of hunters across the state in Lovelock, in Ely, Eureka, Las Vegas, that have these units that are uh, that our CABs have proposed alternative recommendations for. They have those units on their application. And when we're starting to talk about reducing tags by five or 10 from the department's recommendation, biologically, that's not gonna have an effect. We're not gonna be able to detect an improvement in quality with five fewer tags, but the people that are gonna really be affected, they're the guys that are sitting at home right now watching the YouTube video, um, just hoping that their application gets pulled in this year's upcoming draw. So with that, I can pull up the quota forms or we can uh, jump into um, additional questions. I have, a, I have a question. So in that 111, 115 early and late on the NA legal weapon hunt, uh, I understand the department making the recommended increase from last year. What about and I think this is about every year I think I've been on the quota setting. Uh, a lot of times White Pine has requested some of the any legal weapon tags to be shifted to the muzzle loader. So what's your view on that in terms of success or, or, or that? And, what, and I guess what I'm getting at is if you increase in that 111 to 115 any legal weapon if you took it from 100 to 110 and took the which would be 10 short of what the, the, the department's requested and you take in 111 to 115 uh, increasing it from 90 last year to 100 which is then 10 short of what the department is recommending but then we add 20 tags or, or more potentially in that muzzle loader hunt, it seems to me that might be consistent with both what the department is trying to accomplish and what with the White Pine County is asking for, which is really a shift in tags from one weapon class to another. Yeah, so Chairman Johnson, if I'm following you correctly, you're asking if we can take 10 tags off of the early and late recommendations uh, 
that the department made and shift those in, into the muzzleloader hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's appropriate. The muzzleloader quota um, for 111 and 115 is, is always low based on our demand success formula because success tends to be really high. And so uh, we have no issues making that switch. Um, you know, the, the concern overall is that the, the recommendation coming from the White Pine County Cab uh, was for a, an overall reduction in quota from what the department had recommend, had, had, been, had approved last year. Um, and again, based on all of these harvest metrics that we discussed, um, we don't feel that that reduction is warranted. Mr. Chairman, um, if I might also weigh in a little bit, um, it certainly um, could provide equal opportunities, um, you know, for people to get in the field. I think there's two pieces. One is that the allocation of tags by weapon class is determined by commission policy based on expressed interest by uh, those weapon classes. And so that determination, as I'm sure you're aware of, of how many are in the rifle hunt versus the muzzle loader hunt are based on um, the demand by weapon class, number one. Number two, uh, the other thing to possibly consider is that <clears throat> if there are market differences in hunter success by weapon class, um, even though we could have the same amount of opportunity within this upcoming hunting season, if there is much lower uh, or lower success on uh, muzzleloader, for example, compared to rifle, uh, then that could result in an increase in that, that bull ratio that could result in a higher recommended quota in subsequent years. That's not to say that you know the commission should or shouldn't do it. They're just other factors to consider um, in your deliberations. Thank you. Right, well, I guess that was the other question and which I had was, we have the department recommending an increased number of tags in the in illegal weapon hunt in 111 to 115, but a 25 reduction on the muzzleloader tags in the same unit. And I don't know if that was a function of the adjustments we made last year to moving tags from one weapon class to another or what, but it just struck me. That was just one question I had is, why, you know, uh, 40 or 50 more tags in the any legal weapon in the unit and then a drop of, of 25 in the muzzleloader tags. And, and if you went back and looked at the department's uh, recommendation from last year, I think you would find that it would be similar in terms of the proportional distribution across those weapon classes and, and White Pine County um, has traditionally um, had a desire for more of those tags to be in the muzzle loader. But again, what, what drives our distribution is that commission policy um, that is distributing tags according to weapon class based on desire. So I think the recommendation last year would be um, somewhat in line in terms of that proportional distribution of what you're seeing this year. But the reason why it's different than what was last year is because the commission likely made that adjustment to the expressed desires of White Pine County last year. And that's my recollection. Yeah, that's that's correct. That's um, that's exactly what happened. Uh, questions for Mr. McKee, Commissioner Allberg. Yes, um, uh, Cody. Uh, maybe you can answer this question. Maybe you have the statistics in front of you. Is there a a difference in uh, the percentage of the beam lengths over exceeding 50 uh, inches, is, is there a difference between the early and the late? Uh, I guess I'm just gonna assume, uh, but uh, that maybe there, there could be. Do you know if there is? Uh, off the top of my head, uh, Commissioner Allberg, I can't answer your question, but if you give me um, give me 30 seconds, I think I can I can pull it up. If you would. So for the early the early season, uh, forty percent. This is for a resident uh, resident any legal weapon hunters. Um, it certainly varies across the various weapon classes 
and what we tend to see are resident non-resident hunters uh, have a higher main main beam metric than others. Uh, however, uh, for the early season, it was 40%, and for the late season, it would have been 33%. Commissioner Albert? Yes, if, if I could. I mean, I guess one of the reasons I ask for, and, and part of this uh, uh, always uh, trying to preserve the, the quality and the, the number of the older age class animals there is, uh, you know, I guess just a personal recommendation. I was not able to attend uh, the, the, the cab meeting, the Wyoming County cab meeting, but uh, just as a recommendation, if we're trying to preserve some of those older class animals is if we're gonna have to have an increase, uh, maybe maybe we could have the increase in the late season versus the early season, and in in uh, I guess just in an effort to try to preserve some of those older class animals. I mean that's a seven percent difference. Yeah, I, Commissioner Allberg, it, it's hard to say what happened during the the late hunt. That was not uh, that was a trend that was kind of carried uh, carried across many of our areas. If you remember, there was a fairly substantial winter uh, snowstorm that hit during our lake, late elk hunts. And what we saw in area 22 and 11 and several others is um, there's some belief that maybe those, those storms affected people's success. Whether or not that's true, it may have just been that um, they just weren't finding what they're looking for. Uh, so uh, certainly that's, that is one solution is, is shifting tags around to, to address that. Commissioner Well, I guess you just brought up an, another point. Uh, was there, in fact, a difference in overall success rate? I mean, what you gave me there was a difference in the length of main 50 inch main beams. What was the the difference in success rates? So for 111 to 115, or for statewide? No, just for 111, 115. So in 111 and 115, uh, we increased the early season by one percent. So we went from 65% to 66%. Again, I'm uh, just referring to resident bull hunters. And for our late season, we went from 61% to 64%. So both the early and late seasons, we saw an increase in success uh, in 111 to 115 for resident and illegal weapon hunters. Any additional questions? Commissioner Valentine. Thank you. Uh, Cody, did you have any issues with Lincoln County's recommendations? Yeah, Commissioner Valentine. Uh, I, I may have hit at that subtly um, in my presentation. Um, the, the department's recommending our quotas based on a variety of information and data sources, and, and we, we're definitely standing firm with our recommendations where they're at. Uh, I do believe, and I think that it's the belief of the department and our field biologists and, and others involved in this process, that those reductions that are being uh, recommended are not gonna have a, have a, real, a realized effect on age class. We're probably not gonna be able to notice it, uh, but what we will notice is uh, 10 fewer hunters out in the field this year, um, or 20 fewer hunters out in the field this year that um, they could have the, have the opportunity to, to experience a very unique uh, hunt in, uh, in the Western US. And, it, and I would add, um, add that to all of our recommendations that have received alternative recommendations from the county advisory boards. Um, uh, for instance, the 076-077 alternative recommendation, as well as the 108, 131, 132. Those reduction, the, the proposed alternative recommendations that are uh, slight reductions from what the department's recommending or, or increases, I guess. Uh, 
uh, are probably not going to have the, the desired effect of in, increasing trophy quality um, to hunters. And, and we're probably not going to be able to measure it in the harvest statistics after the season. So Cody, I guess what I'm hearing is when, when you take that, for example, with the record or every alternate request from 55 to 50 tags of both that early and late season in 07, 6, 7, 7, 7, 9, and 081, is that reducing the tags by a total of 10, five in each of the two seasons and the resulting reduction in however many bulls are taken as a result of that reduction, it's not gonna have the desired effect that's prompting the request to reduce it by 10. Yes, that's correct, Chairman Johnson. Um, 076 is, is an exception in that we're, the department's actually recommending a reduction from last year's quotas. Um, that unit fell outside of the standard harvest objective of uh, 25 to 35 percent main beam or greater, it was 24 percent. And um, when we're talking about those reductions, that herd is uh, below the management objective. Um, we just tried to make a magnitude change that we felt was appropriate to get us in line with that that 50 inch main beam objective. I would add that success was still really high and six point or greater was still really high for those hunts. And again, when we're talking about 10 total tags with a success rate of 50 to 60%, um, it's probably five or six more dead bulls, which again, with the number of tags we issue for that area, it's, it's unlikely to be noticeable. Okay, any additional questions? You know, kind of in light of that, I, I just don't see the point of taking tags out of people's hands if it's not going to produce some noticeable result that's trying to be achieved by the alternate recommendation. Well, that's that's my view of that. And, well, if there's no other questions, it's probably now and no other comments to take a break to allow public comment on the proposed elk quotas. Is there any other questions or comments before I do that? Okay, seeing none, it's 118. I think given the number of alternative recommendations that we've received, I think it's fair to say we can reconvene at 130. That should give us opportunity to receive whatever public comment there might be on the elk quotas, review them, reconvene, um, and then we can move on to uh, the deer once we complete the elk. All right, so we'll reconvene now in uh, roughly 11 minutes at 1.30. If you have public comment, uh, please submit it via email to wildlifecommission at endow.org. Thank you all. Thank you.
All right, my clock indicates it's 1.30, so uh, let's try to reconvene. All right, did everybody have a chance to review the public comments we received? I'm hoping so, because they were fairly limited. Um, I, I know, I will note one, we received one from White Pine with respect to deer quotas. I'll hold off on summarizing that until we get to the deer quota setting. The additional public comment, one was from Paul Dixon in support of the recommendations uh, as proposed by the Department of Wildlife. Uh, we did receive uh, public comment from Joel McConnell on the Elko cab, uh, reiterating Elko cab's position for the reduction of tags from 55 to 50, in both the early and late 076, 7779 and 081 hunts. Uh, reiterating a reduction in uh, bull harvest of main beam over 50 inches. Uh, and, and there was a, a comment or somewhat of a question or observation made by Mr. McConnell that going, if, if reducing tags by five is insignificant, why go from 60 to 55 uh, as proposed from last year to this year by the department? Why not go uh, with a further reduction to 50? I believe that adequately summarizes the public comment. We did receive, um, with the addition one from Jeff Rogers, I feel there should be not be a reduction in the muzzleloader hunt. And I believe that's it. Uh, Further comments, discussions, Mr. McKee, anything to add? Um, you know, I can speak to uh, Mr. McConnell's cab comment um, and, and I appreciate his question. Um, it's, it's a good point. Uh, I, I would just reiterate where we are at with our main beam objectives. And again, um, success was high. The six pointer grader is high but we fell just outside of that main beam objective. And so again, it was an incremental step down in our recommendations to try and get back in within those objectives. Um, you know, going too low, we may run the risk of overshooting that and then coming back next year and having to, having to ask the commission for uh, an increase because we, we cut too much. Comments or additional questions from the commission? Commissioner Hobbs. Again, my thoughts are in line more with the departments, um, given the fact that we have had multiple years of only meeting a 90% objective, I'm more apt to um, follow their guidelines and suggestions for this year in regard to the elk. Um, they obviously feel that I mean, based on what I've heard is that there was a surplus of elk. We've kind of limited that over time, but we're a little bit limited at this point. We maybe did a little bit too much. So they want to be a bit more conservative and I would be more prone to uh, follow their um, quota settings at this point in time. Additional comments or questions? I'm not seeing any. Um, I certainly wouldn't be opposed. I, I, based upon what I've heard, I, the, the, the only change that I envision um, personally supporting would be not a reduction of tags in 111 to 115, but perhaps a shift in chat, tags and based upon weapon class. That's something that seems to occur almost every year uh, at the request of the white pine cap. And, and I don't ever recall any hearing real, any strong objection to it. 
Uh, and so that's that's where I I'm at. Commissioner Allberg. Yes, uh, uh, I, I I guess I I would agree with with uh, uh, Chairman Johnson's comment on the swap swapping out on weapon class. They've done it uh, religiously. It helps distribute the people out. Um, so so I don't have any opposition to that. Um, I, I'm not going to support their reductions, uh, White Pines reductions in 111, 115. I think that the the bull ratio is up. Everything supports uh, you know. Um, the, the department's recommendation. The only thing that I may uh, consider or, or would think about is swapping some of those numbers from the early to the late season. Um, part of the concern in reducing those numbers, again, is preserving those older class animals. And clearly there is a difference between not necessarily the success rate in the early hunt versus the late hunt, but of uh, some of those older class bulls, I believe, you know, they found their hiding spots and they stay there and they survive that later hunt. Um, either that or they're back into some more remote country and, and they, uh, they're just not uh, as easily accessible. So if we swap them, you know, we st we're still providing opportunity, but we may in fact help ourselves a little bit in preserving some of those older class animals. Mr. McNitch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Cody did mention that these uh, recommendations for 111, 115 were um, a little lower than they were originally going to propose. Um, so I guess it really boils down to what are you trying to accomplish? If you're trying to get some people, some muzzleloaders out, um, maybe there's room to just add a few tags to it and not mess with the recommendations on the 111 through 115. Um, during the, uh, the any legal weapon hunt. So um, I think that there's a couple of, of options. I'm not opposed to doing uh, what you and uh, Commissioner Omberg have suggested by um, shifting a few, but maybe uh, um, leaving those where they're at um, and adding a few to 111, 115. Cody, did I miss here or misunderstand that earlier? Uh, Commissioner McNinch, no, that that uh, is spot on from our conversations. And I think, um, you know, maybe uh, counter to what some of our viewers and, and folks might think that uh, um, we're all we're all about opportunity. Um, we, we certainly many of us are hunters and we want to provide a quality hunt experience. And I think when we were looking at our original recommendations for quotas in 111 and 115 um, and, and how big that jump could have been, we did have concerns that, uh, you know, along with the White Piney, Pine County cab, that if we went too high, maybe we would start to affect um, some of that hunter experience and, and quality in the field. Uh, so this is kind of a, an incremental step towards where we want to be. And uh, hopefully this is a level that we can, can maintain going forward or, or continue to be responsive without su substantial increases or decreases. Um, granted, uh, we continue to have population fluctuations year over year. We get years where in successive years of low recruitment that down the line, much like bighorn sheep can affect our elk herds, just like other ungulates. But um, again, yes, we, we talked about uh, going higher. The population could certainly sustain that. Um, I, I do have some concerns uh, adding too many tags to muzzleloader without shifting them from other areas. Um, on what that may end up doing to the hunt experience. Okay, any other comments or questions? Commissioner East. So, um, Commissioner Allmark, are you suggesting we flip the 111 to 115 early and late and do 110 in the early and 120 in the late? I am. Okay. That's what I thought, but I just wanted to clarify. Okay, I'm good, thank you.
Any other? Uh, uh, sorry for the interruption, uh, Commissioner Johnson. I just pulled up the, the quota table um, for your review. Um, if you need me to scroll up or down, just let me know. I'm fine. I've got the printout in front of me, so. Okay. Any additional comments or questions? None. Someone would like to make a motion? I can certainly try. I think I understand it. Um, I move to accept the resident elk antler hunts as presented by staff with the following change, and that would be in the any legal weapon hunt elk antler resident swapping the 111 to 115 early uh, with the 111 to 115 late so that they would be 110 and 120 respectively. Oh, and adding in the muzzle loader hunt uh, 20 additional tags in the 111 to 115 hunt, making that 30. Does that? I believe those were the only changes. And were you in seeking to include the non resident elk hunts as well in the motion? Were we? I'm, I'm happy to do that. Let me find them. <laughs> okay, so we would swap. Oh, the non resident elk early and late seasons, respectively, in hunts 111 through 115. So they would be 13 and then 14. And then the muzzle loader would stay remain at two. Is that correct? So you added 20 tags to the resident muzzle loader hunt in your motion in 111 to 115. And with that going from 10, I believe, to 30 per your motion, you might want to consider whether you would increase the non-resident oh yes we would have to do that per per statute i think right that, i think that would take it up to three okay so you're better, you're better at math than i am There's a commission, a motion by Commissioner East. Is there a second? I'll second that, but but I do have a question for for Cody. Um, do we need to take uh, those twenty uh, tags from the early and late season and put them in the muzzleloader, or will the twenty uh, tag increase be okay? I'm going to fall back on my, uh, uh, my input that I've received from the biologist um, and that we should probably try and stick with uh, no net change in the number of tags for that unit group. So that would mean um, taking 10 out of the early and late any legal weapon uh, for residents. All right, so I have a, I have a okay. First of all, Cody, can you take down the spreadsheet? Because I can't see everybody when the spreadsheet's up. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. There you go. So there's a motion by Commissioner East, seconded by Commissioner Almberg, to approve the elk quotas as presented with the following changes. That the any legal weapon resident elk antler hunt in unit 111 to 115 have 110 tags in the late season in 111 to 115 have 120 tags with the resident elk antlered muzzleloader hunt being increased from 10 to 30 tags in 111 to 115 with the commensurate changes to the non-resident hunts 
in those units. Mm -hmm. That's the motion that's been seconded it's on the table. I'm not gonna support the motion. I'm not gonna support the motion because after hearing Mr. McKee did not, not wanting to see a net increase in the tags, um, I don't think it'd be appropriate to just add 20 more tags into the muzzleloader season with additional non-resident tags. So I, I'm not gonna support the motion uh, as presented. Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I would agree with that. I, that was kind of why I was asking the question is if um, because of the, um, uh, the room on the quotas that they had mentioned earlier that that would be possible. So I agree with you on that one. And um, I guess the question is, is um, uh, we could do it through a friendly amendment or we could just start over if this doesn't go through with the um, uh, John, would you still want to see those two flipped if, if they were to go back to um, I think it gets complicated. I won't even go there right now. We'll just see where this plays out. And I apologize, but I thought I thought I heard Cody say he wouldn't have a problem adding those. So I, I'm open to a friendly amendment. Or we can just start over. <laughs> I apologize if I wasn't uh, if I was not clear and direct on that. I could have been been more straightforward. I believe procedurally, if the second withdraws the second and the motion maker then withdraws the motion, then we can start over. I'll, I'll withdraw the second because I, I would like to correct that. I will withdraw my motion. Thank you. Okay. So Commissioner Alberg has withdrawn a second on Vice Chair East's motion and she has in turn withdrawn her motion. So I think I'm going to take. Let me see if I can get this right. I would move that we that we approve that uh, portion of Commission Regulation 20-11, the 2020 Big Game Quota recommendations for all outcomes as presented with the following changes. In the elk antlered any legal weapon hunt resident in unit 111 to 115 early, the quota will be 100. In the 111 to 115 late hunt, the quota will be 110. In the resident elk antlered muzzleloader hunt in unit 111 to 115, the total number of tags will be increased from 10 to 30. And we will make the requisite changes to the non resident hunt to fulfill 10% uh, of the tags going to non-residents in those units. Second. Okay. Department clear on the motion? Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, motion by me, seconded by Commissioner East. Is everyone clear on the motion? Any discussion on the motion? Commissioner Hobbs? Yeah, I... You just muted your mic, Commissioner Hobbs. There you go. Okay, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask Mr. Schroeder if he feels comfortable with the increase as stated by this motion or if you still have concerns. Uh, no, uh, um, we, this is a, gonna end up in a no net change in the, the number of tags that we're recommending, uh, shifting tags as we've done in the past from the early and late rifle hunts to muzzleloaders. So, um, the department supports the motion that's currently being considered. Okay, thank you. Everyone clear on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Motion carries opposed. Motion carries 9-0. With that, we can then move on to the mule deer hunts. Those begin on page 18 of the proposed quotas. And I suspect we might be going back to Mr. Schroeder for this. Yes, that's correct for the record. Uh, Cody Schroeder, Department of Wildlife. Just to check everyone, can, can everyone hear me? We can, thank you. 
Um, but yeah, I'll just provide, start kind of with a brief um, overview of some of our recommendations. And as before, I'll present uh, some of the alternative recommendations that we received from the CABs. Overall, um, the department is recommending a total of 17,606 mule deer tags for the 2020 season. Um, that includes a little over 13,000 buck tags for any legal weapon, muzzleloader, and archery. Uh, compared to a little over 12,000 recommended in the 2019 season. Uh, so about a 6% increase. For the juniors, uh, we're looking at about 3,321 year tags recommended for the 2020 season. And then for the mule deer antlerless tags, we're looking at 1,110 uh, tags, <clears throat> slightly increased from uh, 1,035 that we recommended in 2019. Um, use a buck to doe ratio, a management objective of 30 bucks per hundred does for standard units and 35 bucks per hundred does in alternative units. It is important to note that this means uh, there would be a 30 to 35 buck per hundred doe left after the season concluded. Um, so we use a pre-hunt buck ratio objectives to, to factor in our quotas. Um, and then for non-standard hunts, um, some of these areas where they're not surveyed and we have lower mule deer densities, our objective is to manage for a 45% greater success rate. Um, last year, statewide uh, success rate was down about 10% across the state. So that's, that is probably one of the most you know, important factors that's driving these increased quotas. Essentially, we didn't get the harvest that we were expecting. We're running higher buck to doe ratios than what we would like. This is kind of a general comment across the state, not all areas. Um, came in right last year, right at about 28 bucks per hundred does on our survey. Um, that's right in the range that we're looking at to, to manage, but we do have some that are higher than what we would like. <clears throat> Then moving on to the um, County Advisory Board alternative recommendations, they're quite extensive. Um, I'm only going to state the ones that, uh, I'll state the alternative recommendations and probably hold off on comment on uh, until later on the justification, I guess. Um, so starting out with resident junior mule deer, um, antler or antlerless, Lincoln County had an alternative recommendation um, in units 131, 134. They would like a quota of 50. The department is 150. The department is recommending 170. Mineral County would like a quota of 25. Uh, same as last year, the department is recommending a quota of 10 and their justification was to provide uh, the same opportunity as last year. Uh, and the White Pine Cab uh, has an alternative recommendation in, again, in one, units 131, 134 to reduce tags from our recommendation of 170 to 140. Washoe Cab also had some alternative recommendations in units 011, 013, they would like to reduce tags from 30 to 20 and in unit 014 reduce tags from 20 to 15. Uh, and then moving on to the resident mule deer antlerless, any legal weapon hunt, uh, only one cab had uh, alternative recommendations. The Elko cab agreed with all our, all other uh, Recommendations with the exception of unit 061, 6264, 66 through 68 early season to have 225 tags uh, in the early season, 062, 067, 068 late to 200 tags. In area 7, 071, 079, 091, they would like 275 tags and in units 101, 102, 109, uh, to have 200 
tags. And I did not receive uh, justification on those. Moving on to the uh, any legal weapon resident mule deer antlered hunt. Um, the Elko cab would like to, has an alternative recommendation for 061 early to 850. Unit group 061 late to 110. 071 unit group early season to 800. 071, 079 late season to 200. The 081 unit to 50. And the 101 to 109 early to 675 tags. And the mid season for 101 to 109 to 675 tags. For Lincoln County, uh, there are alternative recommendations for 131, 134, early season, recommending a quota of 300. For unit 231, a quota of 140. In unit 241, 245, a quota of 85. Um, they had some concerns about no spring surveys, coupled with the overall population status. In unit 231, it was noted that the post hunt buck ratio was 12 per 100. And um, the trend has been in the mid to high 20s the last few years. Cody, before you go any further, can you back up to the alternative recommendation you've got in area, in the 101 to 109 early? Uh, 675. Okay, and that was the same for alternative recommendation for the mid? Yes, that's correct. And no alternative for the late, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and then I apologize, 131 to 134 early, the alternative recommendation was 300? 300. 300 from the Lincoln cab. All right, and then in 241 to 245, it was 85, correct? That's correct. So I'm just making sure I've got them so I can follow. Chairman Johnson, I'm going to need somebody to go back to the other, the previous hunts that he was going through because I wasn't getting those hunt units. He was mentioning areas, but I didn't, I was totally confused. Could you go back to the junior? Um, I'm sorry, Cody. Actually, I could probably just share the file. You lost me. Um, it might be easier. Okay. Second. Pull that up. Everybody see this? I can see it. I'm not so certain I can read it. It's, it's, uh, there we go. Um, so I'll do, you, would you like me to just go back to the reg for the any legal weapon hunt? Or start from the beginning with the junior? I, I got lost on the juniors. I've got all the illegal weapon. I got lost at the juniors and the antler list. Okay. Sorry. I'll just start over with the junior. So uh, Lincoln County uh, has an alternative recommendation for units 131, 134. Uh, they would like a quota of 150. Mineral County has an alternative recommendation of 25, same as last year. 
And, so um, what, what unit is right. that confused? Because we got pages of this stuff. Um, so it's unit, it's going to be on page 19 of the quota re recommendations, unit 202, 205 to 208. Thank you. They want 25. Yes. Thank you. White Pine uh, is recommending in units, uh, there's a typo, 131 to 134. Um, our recommendations is 170. They would like 140. That's it for juniors. Okay. Antler list too. Um, actually, I missed the uh, Washoe cap. <laughs> yeah, Washoe cap also changes. My apologies. Yeah. Uh, okay. Washoe Cab also had for juniors uh, in units 101, or zero, I'm sorry, 011, 013, uh, they would like in 014, they would like 15 tags. Okay, I'm good with those. And then we did we go to antler lists? Antler lists. Uh, there was only one cab that was Elko with alternative recommendations in units 061, 062, 064, 066 to 68 early, reduced to 225. 062, 067, 06. Eight late to 200. 071, 079, 091 to 275. And then in units 101, 102, 109 to 200. Okay. And then we had uh, changes to the Resident mule deer, any legal weapon hunt from Washoe, correct? Uh, for which one? I'm sorry. The next, the um, hunt thir 1331, the any legal weapon. Yes. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I got some from Washoe. They're not showing up on here, but I haven't written down. Um, would you like me to go back through all of the any legal weapon antlered or just start off with where I was and add Washoe? I'm okay if you if you just keep going with Washoe because I think I got the rest of those. I was just confused on the others. But okay. I'll leave that up to the chairman too. Um, um, I think you the last, I don't know if we've covered them all, but because um, I have, I'm, I have notes from what I reviewed prior to the meeting and what I'm getting today too. So why don't we just start over, give the alternative recommendations on the resident mule deer antlered and illegal weapon hunt. And that way we're all clear as to where we're at in terms of what the department is recommending and what any alternative recommendations have been. All right, starting over, uh, resident mule deer antlered, any legal weapon hunt actually does have washos in red at the bottom. I apologize for that. We had some issues with getting their um, online survey completed. Um, so starting at the top, we have Elko um, agrees with the exception of 061, 062, 064, Six 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 eight early to eight hundred and fifty zero six one six two six four six 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 eight late to one hundred and ten seven one oh nine one early to eight hundred zero seven one zero seven nine zero seven seven nine oh nine one late to two hundred. 
zero eight one to fifty to fifty quota of fifty for unit zero eight one. 101, 109 early to 675. And 101, 109 mid to 675. Moving on to Lincoln County, uh, their alternative recommendation for unit 131, 134 early. Uh, they recommend a quota of 300. Unit 231, a quota of 140. Units 241 to 245, a quota of 85. And they have some concerns about spring surveys and overall population status. In unit 231, the buck to doe ratio post hunt was 12 per 100. That was the survey, uh, observed survey. And then other factors existed at the time. The historical trend was mid to high 20s the last few years. Lyon County had really didn't have an alternative recommendation per se, but they would like to cancel all the doe hunts where deer are in decline. Mineral County uh, would like an alternative recommendation. They don't list the hunt unit, but it would be for units 205 to 208. Uh, recommendation of 55 seems last year. Pershing County uh, had an alternative recommendation in unit 041 to 042. Uh, they would like the tags reduced from 25 to 15. These deer are not surveyed and the population estimate is low. Hunter success was 34%. They feel a hunter opportunity is adequate at 15 tags. Unit 043, 046. Uh, they would like to see tags reduce from our recommendation of 90 to 50 in the early season and from 40 to 20 in the late season. And they felt that the declining population and poor recruitment necessitate an approach to try and save some of the population for the future. Moving on for, to White Pine. Uh, they have a recommendation for unit 111 to 113 early to reduce tags from 208 to 270. In unit 111 to 113 late, uh, they want a quota of 25. Reduce our recommendation from 30 to 25. In unit 121 early, reduce our recommended quota from 160 to 120. Yeah, on 121 late reduce uh, our recommended tags from 15 to 12. And continuing with White Pine in unit 131, 134 early reduce tags from 325 to 275. In the unit 131, 134 late reduce tags from 35 to 25. In units 221, 223 early, reduced tax from 250 to 300. That's the early season. Unit 221, 223 mid, reduced tax from 150 to 130. And for the late 221 to 223 unit, reduced tax from 25 to 20. And then Washoe. Mr. Chairman, um, Cody. Yes. R real quick, um, Dave McNinch here. On the uh, 221, 223 early, um, I thought I heard you say go from 250 to 300. And I just wanted to make sure that it, that it the note I have is 230. Yes. yes. The reduction. Uh, Mr. McNinch, that's yeah. correct. I may okay. have said that incorrectly. They, uh, White Pine is making a recommendation of 230 in okay. 21. Yeah. I didn't know if I had just misheard or what. I just wanted to make sure. Thanks. For the Washoe County Cab, uh, they have an alternative recommendation in unit 011 to 013. Uh, 
to reduce our recommendation from 85, they would like a quota of 50. Unit 014, reduce the department's recommendation from 30 to 15. In unit 015, reduce our recommend, recommendation from 50 to 35. And in unit 022, reduce tags from 50 to 35. In units 033, reduce tags from 30 to 15. Moving on to the, did everybody get those before I move on? Yeah, I thought I saw Humboldt County wanted an 035 from 75 to 70. Um, I, we did not receive that correspondence, at least, at least I didn't, so. Uh, Possibly, can you repeat the recommendation for Humboldt? Yeah, I believe Humboldt made an alternative recommendation in 035 from 75 that the department has recommended to 70, 70. Okay. Moving on to the resident mule deer antlered muzzleloader hunt. Uh, Carson City would like to see in unit 192 an increase from 5 to 15. Douglas County has the exact same uh, alternative recommendation. Uh, Elko. Uh, has an alternative recommendation in the muzzleloader hunt for unit 061, 062, 064, 66 six to 68. They would like to see a quota of 80. And unit 071 to 79 and 091, quota of 75. And 081, a quota of 10. And then continuing with Elko muzzleloader recommendation in unit 101 to 109, a quota of 130. Then moving on to Mineral County recommendation for the muzzleloader hunt. Um, they would like 15 tags uh, in units. Two hundred two, two hundred five, same as last year. It's two hundred two, two hundred five to two hundred eight. Um, moving on to Pershing County, they have an alternative recommendation in the muzzleloader hunt in units O four one, O four two. Uh, they would like to see the tags reduced from 10 to five uh, to basically follow in line with their reductions in the any legal weapon hunt. Um, in units 043046, they would like to see the tags reduced from 20 to 10, uh, again, following along with the any legal weapon uh, reductions. And then finally for muzzleloader, the white pine cab recommends adding 10 tags from the resident any legal weapon hunt 111 to 113 early. In unit 131 to 134, it would like to reduce the tags from 45 to 30. Everybody clear on the muzzleloader? 
Yes. Units. Okay, moving on to resident mule deer antlered archery. Carson City has a recommend alternative recommendation in unit 195, increase from five to 10. Uh, Douglas County alternative recommendation for unit 192 early should increase from 10 to 25. Unit 192 late should increase from 15 to 20. And unit 195 from 5 to 10. And this is for the archery hunt. Uh, Elko has an alternative recommendation um, in units 061, 62, 64, 66, 68. They would like to see a quota of 295. In unit 071790091 early, quota of 260. In the 071079091 late, quota of 25. In the 101 to 109 early to 450, quota of 450. And in the late 101 to 109, a quota of 40. Um, Mineral County um, like the same archery tags as last year. They don't provide a hunt unit. I, I think that would be the, the 202, 205, 208 late right. is where we're recommending a reduction. So I believe that's, they want to see 10 in the 202, 205, 208 late. Moving on to Pershing County uh, Archery again, we would like to see tags reduced from 15 to 10, uh, following in line with any legal weapon reduction. And then in 043046, it would like a the tags reduced from 60 to 35. And then the White Pine County CAB alternative recommendation, you know, 131, 134, reduced tags from 70 to 50. In unit 221, 223, reduced tags from 75 to 65. And then for the non resident mule deer, uh, not all the cabs actually made an alternative recommendation commensurate with the non-resident, but Lincoln County did in unit 131, 134 early, recommending a quota of 20, unit 231, a quota of 14, and units 241, 245, a quota of eight. Pershing County provided alternative recommendation for 041. This is for non-resident 041, 042. Uh, they would like to see the tags reduced from three to two to be in line with the resident reductions. And then in 043, 046, they would like the non-resident tags reduced from six to five in the early season and from three to two in the late season. Again, basically, and to follow in line with the resident, uh, any legal weapon reductions. And then these are the general comments that aren't specific to a species. And I actually already read them before, but if you'd like, I can provide them again. Essentially, the lander cab would like us to consider a junior hunt for antelope. The lion cab would like us to, and Don needs to conduct surveys every year of the part of the quota recommendation process. Without surveys, the quotas shouldn't change from the previous year. They're in favor of declaring a weapon for each hunt. All five choices need to be the same weapon. Look to relocating mule deer. They don't say where predator control on the Sheldon and continue managing 
horse populations and fix the party hunt tag application. Mineral County essentially is saying that they want the same opportunity for all the hunts as they had last year. And those are the only uh, comments that, that we received. Cody, uh, I guess I'll start off. We got a lot of alternative recommendations. And yep. with the exception of a, of a few fairly modest requests for increase in tags from Carson, Douglas, and Mineral County, a lot, if not all of the remaining requests from the cabs were reductions in tags. So can you, Mr. Scott, Tony, someone speak to that? I mean, I mean, way I'm hearing, and I'm gonna, in a very, very general sense, is a lot of the cabs saying, we're seeing declining deer numbers, therefore we want a reduction in tax. And that might be a oversimplification of it, but I think that's the general message that I feel like I'm receiving with these alternative recommendations. Chairman Johnston, uh, members of the commission, Mike Scott for the record. <clears throat> uh, we manage these, these populations uh, to, the, to the recommendations um, that are in our, our guidelines. Uh, the standard units, we try to manage to 30 bucks per hundred. Uh, alternative uh, units are, are at 35 and the non-standard units um, we manage on a, on a success rate, um, kind of using the demand success ratio, uh, demand success formula, sorry. <clears throat> so when we see populations um, that, are, that are above those objectives, that's when we tend to increase tags to get back down to where we are. And in, in a lot of these units, <clears throat> we do have uh, buck ratios that are above the, the objectives. And so that's why you see some of the increases. And we're just trying to manage to, to the uh, objective that we said we would. So Mr. Chairman, I might, I might also try to clarify a little bit. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes when we think about the quotas, uh, we think that they're um, directly proportional to population levels. And what happens is that when there is a decrease in that population estimate um, and people see an increase in the tag quota, it's counterintuitive. And you ask yourselves, that we don't understand. If the population is decreasing, how can the department make a recommendation to increase the tags for a number of reasons? They, they ask that question. One reason is that the sportsman or, or hunting harvest is one of the most tangible sources of mortality. And when a population isn't doing well or a population is flat or declining, uh, it's intuitive that we control the sources of mortality. And one of the most tangible sources of mortality is hunters. And we think, well, this, we want this population to grow, therefore we must reduce mortality. Um, however, uh, when we're talking about males only in the majority of these areas, um, th these aren't having population level effects. Um, curtailing male only harvest, um, which is what we've done for almost 30 years following the 92, 93 winter. And we can demonstrate clearly in our data uh, an increasing buck ratio through time. But that buck ratio, as it increases, it isn't resulting in increased populations, but it is resulting in increased recommendations of quotas. So going back to the original point that if, <clears throat> if we're seeing a population flat or declining, how can the department come in with a flat or increasing quota? It has to do with that ratio and that buck ratio. There are more bucks in these populations, even though the population the total population number may be flat to decreasing. It's the exact point that uh, Game Division Administrator Scott just made. We're seeing these buck ratios go higher and higher and higher. So even though the populations aren't growing or maybe declining, uh, the recommendations are based on growing buck ratios, higher and higher bucks. So the availability of those animals is there. And it goes back to 
one of the, the points I made at the outset of the meeting today, our biologists aren't making uh, recommendations at the expense of the animals or at the expense of the quality of the experience or at the expense of the herd. Uh, it's because there are uh, available males uh, in these populations and, and the guidance, the guidelines um, as set forth um, can accommodate that opportunity without impacting the quality. Okay. Other questions for Mr. Schroeder, Director Wasley, Mr. Scott, Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, Cody, Tony, um, Mike, the couldn't the same thing be happening with uh, regards to a herd that's that's hitting carrying capacity, where you're, um, you know, intuitively you're. You know, maybe some of these recommendations are coming back saying, hey, our deer herd's kind of uh, heading south. Um, let's save deer so that we have something to work with when, in fact, saving them could perpetuate um, staying over a carrying capacity. When, in fact, your quotas that might be a little bit higher could be driving that back down to some place where the animals that are there would would be healthier, uh, more capable of of uh, recovering, you know, provided that the habitat change that, that it feels like that might be a play here too. Well, I'll uh, take first stab at this and then maybe let Mike or Cody weigh in. And, and it's certainly possible, uh, Commissioner McNinch. I mean, um, the, the thing is, is that Nevada is not unique in the challenges that we have with our mule deer populations. Um, West wide, you know, there's certainly there's some bright spots that people like to point to uh, and maybe use those bright spots as a standard by which all other states and places should be measured. Um, the, the challenges uh, are significant. They're broad, they're diverse, going from, from predators to drought to fire and invasives. Uh, they run the gamut. Um, and we're certainly doing uh, a lot of those things to address those challenges on the landscape. One thing that I think we feel pretty confident about is that curtailing male only harvest isn't going to be the recovery, uh, you know, panacea that these populations uh, need. And, and I think all we need to do is look back for the last 27 years and chronicle where our buck ratios have been, where they are, and, and what's happened. And we have seen we have achieved the exact result that we've tried to achieve, which is increasing buck ratios um, for the last 27 years. We've incrementally increased those buck ratios. During that time, we have not seen a commensurate increase in the population size. We haven't seen a commensurate increase in the proportion of, uh, of any of those um, measures of success. Um, you know, record book entries or, or any of those uh, desired objectives. Um, but what we have done is we have measurably increased the buck ratio. Simultaneous with that, we've seen a decrease in fawn recruitment. Our spring surveys for fawns um, have, have demonstrated whether those things are related, uh, whether there's carrying capacity issues. Um, I'm sure it varies around the landscape. Um, some places have been hit harder by drought, harder by fire and invasives, potentially harder by predators. Those, those are all very real threats. But at the end of the day, curtailing male only harvest uh, is, is not going to result in population level growth. The notion that if we save some bucks today that that population is going to be bigger tomorrow um, is not based in, in science and is not realistic in, in terms of an expectation. Mike or Cody? Yeah, I would I would add to that, Tony, that um, some of the changes that you see with some of these quotas are are pretty small, and um, that when we go and survey next year, we may not even be able to detect a, the difference biologically um, in in what quota we had. Um, versus, you know, one versus the other. So um, all you're doing by reducing some of these quotas would be keeping people out of the field. Um, and I would also say that 
when when you when we have those target objectives and some of these quotas end up uh, reduced next year when we go and survey and come back with our quota recommendations they may be even higher and than they are this year so uh, anyway and I, I would even refer to Cody Schroeder to add more to that if he has Uh, for the record, Cody Schroeder, Department of Wildlife. Yeah, just to kind of continue on with that. So uh, although some of these, you know, changes don't seem like a lot, you know, five here, 10 there, overall with, with all the CABS um, recommendations, printed recommendations, we'd be looking about 800 fewer tags for mule deer. Um, and as Mike Scott, you know, mentioned, that's there's really no reason for that, for, to take away that opportunity. Um, you know, Commissioner Johnson mentioned that this may be the most anticipated big game season of all time or in, in recent history due to the you know, current uh, events in our lives. That's 800 people that could be out there. It still fits into the biological uh, sideboards that we've imposed on ourselves, um, that 30 bucks per hundred does is basically what we consider a balance between opportunity and still providing a high quality experience. And then we still have these alternative recommendations throughout the, throughout the various regions where we're managed even higher. So if, uh, sportsmen that are interested in that can put in for late seasons, they can put in for some of these alternative areas and have fewer people in the field. Um, and, but there is there is a biological ramification to going too high. And I talked about it at the Washoe Cab. Um, and it has to do with interspecific competition. So in years where we have these high, heavy snow years, some of our ranges, winter ranges are in poor condition. Um, these animals are basically competing with themselves. And to commission, commission, uh, Commissioner McNish's comments, some of our herds are at carrying capacity. Could be running the risk of, you know, does and fawns in poor condition or, you know, even worse survival than we've had if we were to run lower buck to doe ratios. Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of what we're looking at. We're looking at holistically trying to get people out in the field, but still, you know, falling within the, the guidelines we've set for ourselves that are, you know, biologically based, they're, they're backed by science and, that's where we're at with our recommendations. Commissioner Ease. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Thank you. Um, will somebody remind me of the doe fawn ratio? I know the buck doe ratio, but I'm not sure about the fawn ratio. Nobody's gonna respond. Commissioner uh, East. Uh, this, um, so we really don't have an objective per se on our fawn to doe ratio. Um, it's really hard to manage for something like that, that we're basically at the mercy of mother nature, you know, and the, and the does to produce more or less fawn. So we don't necessarily have an objective on our fawn to doe ratio, but the fawn to doe ratio plays in to the overall picture, because if you have a low fawn to doe ratio, and especially if you have it for a couple of years in a row, that's going to, you know, the population is probably going to, to decline. Uh, mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily mean you can be carrying bucks on the landscape. And I know this is a very hard concept to grasp, but you know, if we want to get down to the nitty gritty and specifics, our area seven herd is probably one of these areas where we're looking at this. We had a couple of years of very poor recruitment. Um, but we've been really, really conservative on our quotas in the past. And we're really carrying a lot of bucks on the landscape, more than we would like. Uh, we observe them on survey. We have cameras set up. We know that there's high quality bucks in there. And so that's one of the instances where we're really trying to get that buck ratio down to a manageable ratio so that we're not doing harm um, or causing undue harm on those, on the fawns. Hope that answers your question. It does. It helps me. Thank you. I have one more question and a comment. Um, is augmentation possible for the antlerless mule deer? Can we move them to an area where maybe a herd isn't doing as well? Is that a possibility? Okay. 
I, I can maybe provide a high level perspective on that and then Cody can dive into the science a little bit. So uh, historically, mule deer have been viewed as a species that um, is probably the least uh, successful in translocation. So if we, even if we put aside all of the, the veterinarian's concerns, which are significant at this point in terms of moving animals and what kind of pathogens, um, you know, we, we have some um, very strong policies and guidelines in the wildlife communities about moving animals and it prohibits us from moving all kinds of, of animals. Um, part, of the, part of the hindrance in getting sheep to Utah has to do with, with some of those uh, protocols and some of the testing. Um, so even if we put those concerns aside and we just look at uh, the logistics of it, on the one hand, um, mule deer uh, have very slow um, adaptation in, in terms of diet. So you would you'd want to put them in, you know, kind of a like for like scenario and not expect any uh, rash changes. When, when I was area 10 biologist, we uh, captured uh, 40 some odd deer from the town of Lamoille and, and we moved them uh, 150 or so miles away. Uh, some of those animals return. Um, so th there's also some, um, some th the notion that if, if the habitat, um, th that there is suitable but unoccupied habitat somewhere. So the question of where you would put them, you're assuming that there is suitable habitat that is unoccupied. But one of the things that the deer do really well um, in good habitat is reproduce. And so if they aren't reproducing, and if you have a population that's below carrying capacity, you have to ask yourself, you know, why? What, what are the limitations? And would your money be better spent in uh, putting more water, removing predators, you know, removing invasives, whatever the, the, those uh, limitations are, rather than doing something that's really expensive, um, risky wildlife health-wise with the possibility that those animals will return when it may be easier just to modify the habitat or directly address the risk. But um, I know Cody's work with the Mule Deer Working Group through the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. There's been a couple states uh, recently that have, have tried to translocate mule deer more than they have in the past. And I, don't, I haven't been able to follow what those results are like. But Cody, can you share any insights from I don't know, New Mexico or um, Utah in particular? Yeah, so Commissioner East, to, to uh, address your, um, your question, uh, Tony pretty much hit it on the head, you know, both from a, a success standpoint, uh, notwithstanding disease, um, really it's kind of a mixed track record. And, and New Mexico and Utah were in recent past, you know, translocating deer, trying to augment populations. Utah's was a little more focused on removing urban deer and putting them into you know more wild landscapes where they had urban deer issues. New Mexico's was you know augmenting unoccupied or or low density herds, and uh, you know they really had just low success or, or mixed success, I should say. And then, but I should mention you know at our last uh, WAFWA update our meeting, uh, we got an update from those states, and neither one of them are no, are translocating deer, and that's primarily the disease. Uh, implications, which is probably, you know, the most important. So CWD, chronic waste disease, is a really big deal. It's unfortunately marching its way westward. We have not detected it in Nevada yet, um, but it doesn't mean that we don't have it. We do share interstate herds, you know, with Idaho, with Utah. Utah has chronic waste disease in central Utah in their deer herds. Uh, that's why they are no longer translocating deer. Um, there are other diseases that we know our deer have been exposed to, EHD, uh, blue tongue, BVD, which is a cattle-borne disease that's unfortunately circulating in our deer herds. Um, and we really, similar to the sheep uh, issue, we don't want to expose other deer herds potentially to some of these, these diseases. We know we have the exposure to the not CWD, but those other diseases, because we've been t blood sampling for several years and we have titers in the blood samples, which essentially means they've been exposed to these disease events in the past. So that's our primary reason for not translocating uh, deer. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and Chairman, I just got a text from the Carson County and they have been trying to, it says dial in, and they said you can't dial in, you need to send your changes to the email where you call it comment, but is that where they may have some additional changes? Okay, you, you faded out there, I didn't catch. So I got an e a text from the uh, Carson County Cab and they've been trying to dial in. I'm not sure what they mean by that, but I said, you can't dial in. You need to send your comments now during public comment to the email. So it sounds like we may have some additional suggestions or alternative numbers coming. Okay. All right, Commissioner Hubs, did you have a question? I need to speak to what Tiffany just, excuse me, Commissioner East just spoke to. Um, Mr. Rob Bomer of the Carson Cab uh, had emailed me saying his emails to the Wildlife Commission email address weren't going through. And I said, just send them to my personal email address and I'll get them posted. And he did, and I just pasted what he just sent me. They're trying to do tests from their end. So I'm wondering if that's what they mean by dialing in. Okay, so if, if, if people, I don't know what the issue may be, the, if you are seeking to submit public comment at the appropriate time, the email address is wildlifecommission at endow.org. It is not Nevada Wildlife Commission, it is just wildlifecommission at endow.org. Um, Commissioner Hubs, did you have a question? I believe you may have had your hand up before, Commissioner. I feel like I'm teaching school almost remotely with people raising their hands, but Commissioner Hubs? Yes, I um, I just wanted to get my comments in really quickly on in regard to the mule deer population. Um, one thing that I noticed um, is that a lot of the postseason surveys were not completed. Some were just not conducted at all, and some were not conducted because of the COVID-19. And what data are we extracting from postseason? Because I think postseason is giving us our bucks to doe ratio, and I'm really concerned the more I looked at every area that the major, I'd say the majority have not been adequately surveyed postseason. I can speak to that, Commissioner Hubs, for the record, uh, Cody Schroeder, Department of Wildlife. Um, so you are correct in that we, we, you know, we did miss uh, a fair amount of uh, postseason surveys. It wasn't, that was not due to the disease event, the human disease event. Um, it was primarily due to just weather delays. We've experienced that in the past. Um, some of the spring surveys were cut short uh, for sure because of the shutdown due to the COVID virus. Um, but really the answer is we have, that's the reason we have population models. So um, that's the whole point of the model is, you know, even in years past, we, we, we are not surveying some of these deer herds in the spring and the fall every year. Um, in, in areas where we have gaps, we can use, you know, surrounding units, we can use a three-year average on our fond to ratio that does, you are correct, that does have, that drives, you know, the population estimate. Um, but, and then the third point I would say is our harvest data. So we use, that's probably our strongest piece of data that we get um, every year due to the mandatory harvest questionnaire form. So uh, we have a really good handle on our harvest metrics. Um, so we can account for, you know, the number of bucks, the number of does that were harvested, even down to the junior hunts, which, you know, you can harvest a doe or a buck, we can account for the percentage of, of does that were taken. Um, and so just because we don't have that data doesn't mean we can't make quota recommendations. We have several hunt units uh, throughout the state where we don't survey data. We don't survey um, at all in a year. Um, we just rely on harvest metrics and, you know, on the ground observations and things like that. So. So that data is, is good to have, and we, we rely on it heavily, that survey data, but we don't necessarily have to use it. Um, that's what we use the population models for. 
So that's understood. So, but when, when we read this, it says, the department uses statewide postseason management objectives of 30 bucks per 100 does for standard hunts and 35 bucks per 100 does and alternative hunts. That's a huge assumption if you're not surveying a lot of those areas. That's what I was kind of thinking. I'm like, well, if we're if we're basing some of our our quota setting, I mean, we should talk about how many areas were surveyed statewide because when I go into each area, when I look at them in this in this manual, sometimes I like to go back and forth. This is the one I'm referring to. Like a lot of the areas are not postseason surveyed. And some are not postseason surveyed because of the COVID-19. Some are just not postseason surveyed overall. So I guess my only issue is, are we, could we potentially be missing a mark here? And if so, what would that mark be? Like, could it be our 30 bucks per 100 dose is off? Could we be making assumptions? I know we're using a model, but part of the input into the model is the postseason input. So, Mr. Chairman, if, if, if I might um, help provide an answer to Commissioner Hub's question. So, um, in reference to the, the big game status book, uh, if you go to, um, shoot, I think it is um, in the appendix, uh, page A30, um, and this is some of the harvest data that uh, Cody was referencing when he says we use harvest metrics. What he means is that we look at at hunter success, um, and you won't have uh, you won't be able to maintain hunter success in areas where the bucks aren't available. In addition to that, you look at the percent of point class. And so on page A30, if you just look at area seven, for example. And if you look uh, starting at 2014, I'll let you get there. So if you go down to 071 through 079, and then across the top is the years. And if you look at 2014, you'll see that 071 through 079 in 2014 had 33% four points or better, four point or greater mule deer in the harvest. The year after that went up to 40%, the year after it went to 51%, the year after it went to 54%, increased to 56%. Last year it was at 61%. Uh, at the same time, you're seeing a larger and larger percentage of the harvest comprised of old age class mature mule deer. You're also seeing a similar increase in hunter success. So those harvest statistics tell you, holy cow, uh, you know, we know that we not only have an abundant male segment of this population relative to the quota, but we know that we have very strong age class representation in that male segment of the population. So, you know, we, we certainly, um, you know, endeavor to, to survey those units um, that, you know, have significant opportunity in them or would be, uh, you know, pushed hard biologically. Quite frankly, we don't have any units that we push hard biologically. There are no units that are uh, anywhere near any kind of a biological threshold where our harvest uh, could be um, you know, damaging the population, either in terms of the magnitude or in terms of its ability to reproduce. And so these harvest metrics, and I know just saying harvest metrics doesn't break out that detail, but as you, as you look at the percent under success, percent point class, and you look at those long-term trends, uh, for example, that one's going back five or six years, you can see there's no way you could sustain or increase that without, um, you know, an, an abundant male segment of old age class in there. So even though we, we survey that, we know that that population is very stable and very secure as a result of those harvest metrics. That's very helpful, um, Secretary Wesley. I was wondering, um, when you look at that, what, I mean, just in, um, what do we want to see in our percentage if we have a good ratio? What would be a good harvest for unit by unit group? That's a, that's a, really, a really good question. And what, what Nevada has maintained 
for a very long period of time, we've, we've kind of looked at uh, you know, 40% as kind of this threshold above which we have existed uh, for both hunter success and percent four point or greater in the harvest. Um, last year, statewide, we were at 45% um, four point or better in the harvest. And if you look at that same, that same page, that A30, and you look at where we've been for the last seven years, and we look at the state, we went from 37% statewide four point or better, again, 37, then 38, 41, 43, 41, and 45 last year, which is the highest that it's been uh, going back all the way, you know, 10 years to 2009. That's telling us that we have uh, an abundant four point or better in that age class. That doesn't mean that the, all those four points are 27 or 28 inch wide four points that, that, you know, some of those could be 19 inch wide four points or, uh, but it, it means that, uh, you know, it, that they are mature animals. They're not yearlings. They're not one year old, you know, or two year old animals. So thank you for kind of leading me through that. I just felt like potentially if we weren't surveying as diligently, we might be off, you know, um, sometimes it's just hard to get there. And if that's an important estimate, I just wanted to make sure we talked about it. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a valid point. I, I think it is, it is one, the, the survey is a sample and it is one data point. Um, Cody Schroeder talked about the population models and he talked about the harvest metrics. Um, and we've heard from a number of calves um, pointing out the, the lack of survey or wanting surveys every year. Um, and you know, it, it is a sample of the population that allows us one more data point to check against all these other factors and variables, but it isn't the end all be all census that some people view it to be. It is not a population census, it's a population sample, and it adds to, to the overall picture of all these other metrics and, and tools. Commissioner Barnes, did you have a comment or question? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I do have um, comments to make. Um, it just seems like um, wherever I go the last couple of years, I, there's there's a reoccurring issue that people want to visit with me about, and it's the lack of the of the deer herds, especially in in northern Nevada in this Elko area. And um, so I just wanted to kind of to to bring that up, just to um, let a lot of those people that uh, express their concerns to me. Let me know that, I, that I'm voicing that to the department and the commission. And I, and I do understand where the department is coming from, uh, how, they, how they figure their, their quotas and, and some of the obstacles that, that they have to address when putting this together. You know, this area has been heavily influenced by wildfire. And, and I think a lot of people don't realize that, uh, you know, it's not the summer habitat we're worried about, but it's, it's the winter habitat. Um, there's some people that say that, you know, let's just roll the dice and, and hope for a good winter where these animals can sur survive and, and thrive. But it, but it is a, it is a concern um, because we don't want to have a lot of uh, winter kill. Um, you know, it just, it just brings into light to how devastating these wildfires are. It seems like while these fires are burning, they're on the news and everybody's concerned. And then two years later, you know, everything is good again. Well, Mother Nature doesn't work that way. It takes it takes time to uh, to rehab a lot of this thing, and and I think maybe that's that's where we are. But there is a huge concern um, with sportsmen and others around with with the deer the deer numbers. And and as I look at these quotas, really they're pretty moderate to where where we've been in the past. I can remember looking at quotas, you know, years ago when our numbers were a lot higher. And I look at some of the, uh, the suggestions made by the other calves where really it's just a few, really it's just a few tags, which really is not gonna have that big of an impact on the, uh, on the population. I look at some of the, uh, the antlerless suggestions, changing it from like 50 and 25 tags, you know, really, I mean, we're only talking, you know, 25 or, or 50 deer at the most, which really isn't gonna have a huge impact um, on the population. 
so it's just just a few comments that that I wanted to make before we went any further. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barney. Uh, I guess uh, I just appreciate the very thoughtful discussion from the department, the commissioners, the cab input, and when I listen to to it all, I mean, I, I think what I'm I see is some very well intentioned alternative proposals from the cabs, which is a concern over declining numbers. Therefore, the cabs saying, we wanna see a reduction in tags and, and sportsmen saying, we're willing to forfeit the number of tags in the hope that that produces uh, a result in terms of increased deer numbers. But what I'm hearing is the reduction in these tags is being proposed in the alternatives is not gonna produce the intended result of a population rebound, but perhaps just create one thing, which is taking the tags out of people's hands, which is the unintended consequence, rather than what the intent behind the alternative proposals are. And I certainly commend the, the community of sportsmen who are willing to come forward to this commission uh, with the idea and recommendation that they'll forfeit opportunity with the belief that that's going to rebound and, and address declining numbers. But if it's not going to address and produce that result, I'm just not prepared to deny these people who are unidentified right now, we're all going into a draw that's going to happen at the end of the month, that opportunity. So is there comments or questions or is it time to break out of oh, Commissioner Chameleon? I have a, I'm sorry, I have a couple of unit, I have a couple specific unit questions regarding as White Pine and Lincoln. Um, 131 through 134, they're both, they both want reductions there. And I'm looking at the quota recommendation form. We didn't have a fall survey. There was a spring survey that was down and then I go to the harvest results and pretty much across the board, other than the late hunt, which is limited tags, it's down. Uh, the four point or better is up, but your overall harvest appears to be down. Um, and then you're increasing the tags there. So I can see why White Pine and Lincoln have a concern on that, those specific units, I guess, unless I'm missing something. So that's, that's my question on that unit, uh, 221 through 223. Kind of the same thing. The archery success is down. Muzzleloader success is down. Any legal weapon success is down other than the late hunt, which is very limited tags. Again, four point or better is up, but again, your overall success appears to be down. Um, and I know White Pine talking to, I grew up in White Pine and talking to the residents there, they have major concerns in 221 and 223 uh, with that hunt. So. I guess I have a question there. I mean, the tag numbers are pretty much stagnant. We're not really changing anything, but I know they're requesting it goes down. So I have a question on that one. And then the the last question I had is on 231, that postseason, the fall survey, the buck to doe ratios, it did go way down according to the report. And I'm just curious what uh, what Endow's thoughts were on that. It's, show, it's showing a 12, uh, 12 bucks per 100 does. And I know Lincoln County brought that up and that the last couple of years it's been in the high twenties and what the cause of that was. Um, so if I can get an answer on that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Cavillia, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, you know, I was the biologist in, in those, some of those units for, for a long time. And uh, the, that, Buck ratio in specifically in area 23 is very concerning to me to see a, a 12 um, in, a, in a place like that. But I also uh, had a conversation with, with the uh, chairman of the county game board down there yesterday. And uh, I, I, I asked him, I said, you know, what do you think? And he said, you know, it's entirely possible that a lot of those deer were on pine nuts and we didn't get a we didn't get a, a a survey. He says that he believes those bucks are there. Um, the population model says that the the ratio should be at 
in the in the high thirties actually, and <clears throat> I do think that um, the quota that we recommended is is appropriate. Um, but I also would like to throw some additional resources down there this next year. Um, make sure we do a complete survey, um, and and I also would like to look at doing some surveys in in some of those alfalfa fields that we count for landowners. I believe we could actually. Um, have our landowner biologist actually do some surveys to to see if those those ratios match up to where uh, what you know if it's what we see on survey from the helicopter is actually what we see from the in a spotlight when we go and do landowner counts. Any additional comments or questions, Commissioner? Yes, um, I, I guess I'd like to address a little bit of some of our, our correspondence that we receive. And I think that this has been a discussion item on every every time we do the quota units in Northern Washoe. And if you look at the same the same chart on A30 uh, in, in the big game status book, uh, you know, and you look at those 014, 015, uh, ratios, they are going completely opposite of what the state is. You know, we went, we started at 60%, we're at 28% of the older class animals. And, uh, you know, so, so when we have keep having those reductions up and through there and, and, uh, population loss, you know, I, I, I believe that that's where a lot of the discussions come and what can we do to help the population and get older class animals in, in Northern Washoe? I mean, the population's down, the older class animals are down. And uh, it, it, it's very obvious that they need help. What help can we do? I'll take a stab at that, uh, Cody Schroeder, for the record. Um, Mr. Allenberg, I think it's a fair point. Um, I guess I would take slight exception to, you know, just kind of characterizing all of Washoe County as being in that position. Um, we are actually seeing some rebounds in 011, 013 um, on the Sheldon 033 is definitely not what it used to be, um, but we're seeing some increasing trends there. Um, so we're kind of turning the corner there a bit. Um, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it. We've talked about them before. You know, drought was probably one of the most significant ones. Um, fires, uh, burn, winter range, you know, horses, wild horses, um, predators. Those are just to name a few. Um, I think it's a valid point on the, on the 014 unit. That's an alternative unit. It's been doing very poorly. Our data, as you pointed out on our recommendation form, it's struggling, uh, both from a harvest metric standpoint, as well as, you know, some of our surveys. We're still running high buck to doe ratios, even though we are getting, you know, much fewer deer counted in there. So that's kind of what is driving that recommendation. Um, but, you know, it, I don't have, I guess we don't have uh, a huge dog in the fight, so to speak on the, on that one, you know, um, in, in terms of what we're doing to address it, we are looking at that intensively. We've, um, you know, we're looking at some habitat projects potentially. I think mother nature is going to help us out a lot um, if we continue to get, you know, even average moisture. Um, there were some horse removals in the granites this year uh, scheduled, and I think there are more to go. That That's going to help out a lot. Um, and we're open to the idea of, you know, looking at predator control. As well, there's actually some going on in there now, currently for bighorn sheep, um, but that is going to be part of our equation. We also kind of uh, Pat Jackson might might talk about this a bit, but uh, we're kind of embarking potentially on a study too in all Washoe County just to get a handle on what kind of predators out there, what kind of numbers, the deer um, deer abundance. We do have radio collars out there we're monitoring. Uh, we've seen some high mortality on those, so we definitely have concerns. We share those concerns. We want to do. We want to do it right too. We want to look at it from all aspects. Uh, you know, starts with habitat for me, but um, you know, certainly removing some of those horses and anything we can do uh, to to boost them up, uh, we're gonna we're gonna pursue that. And then while I'm while I'm here, uh, just to kind of go back at uh, Commissioner Caviglia's, uh, he had some comments on Area 13. 
131, 134 as well. And again, it's an alternative unit. Um, so we're, we're on the top end of our kind of our management objectives already. Um, but we really feel strongly that the, the buck segment is there. Um, we're trying to inch that down um, to, you know, what our objective is, is 35. Um, we did see, you rightfully pointed out, we've seen kind of some lower success last year, but that wasn't unique to Area 13. We saw that all over. We're not really sure why it could have been due to the, you know, it was pretty warm and dry in, in October. Um, deer distribution could have been affected, just hunter, hunter effectiveness. So that right there, just, you know, bumping that success down due to our demand success formula, all things being equal, that's going to cause an increase in our, in our quota right there. Cause we're trying to get that again, get that buck ratio back down. I know it seems counterintuitive on the low recruitment. Uh, it was down in 2020, but the year before we actually ran 23, or I'm sorry, 33 fawns, uh, you know, pretty good recruitment past few years and really just showed a very slight decline in the population estimate. Uh, but again, due to that poor success, um, some of the other metrics, you know, are there. The four pointer better really looks good. Some of the muzzleloader, Archery success is some of the highest we've seen in the state. That late season success is high. We're still above average if you look at area 131 to 134. Um, and so that's that's kind of what those, those quotas that we're recommending are coming from. I did pull some data uh, just from our model, uh, something that you probably won't see in the forms, but we do model out uh, numbers by age class. And our model for mature bucks uh, essentially is showing for 2018, two, for, this is for four-year-olds and older, 264, 200, two, 2019, 260, 2020, 327. So we're seeing this increase in the uh, adult mature buck, uh, this, the age structure in that buck population. And you're seeing that on that um, buck ratio. So even our observed ratio the last time we got, you know, survey data in there, we were at the very top end, for almost 40 bucks per hundred does. Um, so that's where we're coming out with that uh, area 13 recommendation. Okay, any other questions or comments before we recess for public comment? Okay, seeing none, it's, it's 3.08. Uh, let's break until 3.20. Uh, if you have public comment on the proposed mule deer quotas, please submit those via email. The email address is wildlifecommission at endow.org and we'll reconvene at 320. Thank you.
All right, it's a little past 320. Uh, I apologize for the delay. I'm trying to get through the public comments. I will, I'll try to get through them as quickly as, as possible. Uh, Shane Bourne from White Pine Cab uh, offered comment on low fawn ratios in 111 to 113, 121, 131 to 134, as well as lower buck to doe ratios in 20, 221 to 223 uh, as a basis for some of the alternate proposals from White Pine. Uh, Rob Beamer uh, confirmed Carson Cab was requesting say, the same as Douglas County. Uh, Mr. Cooney from the Elko Cab uh, commented that the antlerless mule deer tag should be reduced because of lower populations. Mr. Bunch from Mineral County indicated that the form they received did not have unit specific areas to fill out that. I think that was just a explanation as why they may not have uh, included specific unit groups. He noted the success rate was 58% uh, in, in that area uh, due to, uh, and how that hunt and migration is weather dependent. Uh, the Washoe County Cab uh, spoke to their concerns over the deer populations in especially Northern Washoe uh, and a basis for a reduction in the number of tags. Uh, Paul Dixon offered a comment in support of the elk quotas as the department had presented. Uh, Jeff Rogers submitted an email that uh, indicated he supported the alternate recommendations in 241 to 245, both for the legal weapon and muzzle loader, the reduction in the legal weapon increase in the muzzle loader, supported the tag reduction in 015, as well as 114 to 115, and supported the tag increase in 114 to 115 on the muzzle loader hunt. Uh, Craig Burnside. The Douglas Cab recommend changes to the primitive weapons hunts in 192 and 195, consistent with the number of tags approved last year. Uh, I said the area biologist has no issues with the recommendations. Uh, Joel McConnell from the Elko Cab uh, noted a great deal of concerns about the continued decline in deer populations. Uh, as a result, they were hesitant support continuing or an increase in the antlerless tags. Um, several members of the public even supported canceling the antlerless hunts. Steve Robinson uh, commented from the Washoe Cab uh, with the proposals and the changes they suggested. Uh, Joe Krim. Uh, offered a comment. I appreciate the work of the department, but 041, 042 hasn't had a survey. The population is declining. Uh, 043 to 046, the population has been declining since 2013 and recruitment is low. Uh, Mel Belding, uh, Washoe County sportsmen and women in the cab have asked for reduced tags for the past five years or more. We are concerned about the declining population. By reducing these quotas on bucks, we might have a chance to see some make it to their prime age of around six. It's not all about quantity, but rather the quality. Rex Flowers, the department is not giving all the data, comments on the units in Washoe are seeing a rebound, but units 011 to 013 014 and 033 are down 63% since 25, 2015. Need to ask for populations by year. It is very discomfort, discomforting that it is a known, we are losing our herds and all we hear, we're looking at sun items, but where is the boots on the ground and when? Therese Campbell commented 
as the newest member of the Clark County Advisory Board. I want to comment briefly regarding Nevada's upcoming bear hunt. I will wait to read or address that comment until we get to that agenda item. I believe I've covered all the public comment we received on mule deer. Did everyone have an opportunity to review those public comments? So I, I think the public comments are quite consistent with what we heard from the CAPS in, in terms of why certain individuals as well as certain CAPS are requesting reductions in the number of tags uh, and that being without oversimplifying it because people offered a lot more detail in their comments, both prior to this meeting and during this meeting. I should know, I re did receive a lot of comments prior to the meeting uh, that were forwarded on to the department and the rest of the commission regarding mule deer quotas. So I don't wanna suggest that we didn't receive and didn't review those comments prior to this meeting, but a lot of the comments received during the meeting were consistent or very similar to the same comments that were received by this commission prior to the meeting on mule deer quotas. Uh, any further comments, discussions, or questions from the commission? Commissioner East. Yeah, I, um, I just want to thank the cabs and the public for their input, because I think it's really important that we continue to seek input from all sides. I appreciate the department's recommendations as well and the conversations I've had over the last couple of weeks. Um, with staff and, and other commissioners, I still struggle with Washoe County. It is such a declining population and we just don't see them. I hunted area 32 last fall and um, it has a 21% success rate and it, it, it just, it's just not there. And I, I feel like it's just not there in a lot of the Washoe County units and so I will be supporting reductions for Washoe County in particular but I would also be considering those in other areas just because I see and I appreciate the comments by people outside of us and outside of the department. Additional comments? Commissioner Hubs. Yeah, so I guess I'm just trying to understand. So what we have going on here is basically like when I, you know, going back to Secretary Wasley's comments on the deer harvest, and there are certain areas that are very high, have high percentages. My only question would be, what could possibly be driving those percentages high and yet the population is low? So I guess what I'm saying is like, could it potentially be that like the biology of the mule deer in and of itself that what you're having is larger male deers on the landscape, but the population in itself is not doing well. So I guess my question is, could we be getting harvest information that's skewed? because we don't have a lot of postseason data, like that was my one concern. I guess it just doesn't, it, it, I'm finding that it doesn't add up. And is there a reason why that could be? So for instance, if you're going out on the landscape hunting, could you potentially be taking down larger deer or bucks or more mature uh, males, which I'm uh, assuming can outcompete others um, and that we just have a lower abundance of deer in general, but we have larger bucks. Does that make sense? Uh, Commissioner Hubs, for the record, Cody Schroeder. Uh, I didn't en entirely follow, but uh, I mean, in theory, you, you could be correct. I mean, it is possible to have a, re, a declining population or have one year of uh, poor recruitment, but still be carrying, you know, a lot of bucks on the landscape, mature bucks. Um, and that's, um, you know, that's what we use in the recommendation process. Uh, just because we didn't get a postseason survey that year doesn't mean that we're not confident the bucks are there. We may have got a survey the year before 
an observed survey. And so when we talk about the postseason ratio, I think maybe, I don't know if this helps clarify or not, but we actually have a projected postseason ratio. And that's what we're targeting after the season, after the hunting season is over. And so what we then do is we take that data, the hunter, the harvest data we get back and we essentially say, okay, this is where we were at last year with our model. Here's how many bucks we had predicted that were available. Here's how many were killed. Did they match up? You know, did our, um, did our predictions come true essentially? Um, and usually they are very, very close. Now they're not always going to be spot on because you can have these perturbations. I mean, you can have a low success rate that you weren't predicting, which is what we saw last year. Overall statewide, I mentioned it was 10% down, but some units actually had lower than that. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll just kind of point to is we, we look at trends. So we don't just look at one year of data. Most of these, in fact, the demand success formula that we use to develop the quota has a three year average success rate in it built in. And that is, you know, in part to kind of smooth out these, uh, you know, there's variation, natural variation that we might see due to weather or due to the deer herd or whatever it is. Um, and so we are really confident in that harvest data. It's a big part of the modeling process. Um, and then the postseason survey, you know, really is just kind of to check on that, on that model number. And so what we, we typically like to see is our model population, our buck ratio being slightly higher than what we're observing when we go fly postseason. And that's because, and I brought this up at, our, at the meeting in um, Ely, I believe, we've covered this at several commission meetings. You know, our helicopter survey data is not, it doesn't have perfect detection. Um, we know there's bias in there. The bucks are harder to detect than the does just because there's fewer of them out there. We try to, you know, as best we can uh, count them when they're, when they're in these groups when they're with the does, but that's not always possible. But that's what we use. We, it, there's a multitude of checks and balances built into this and a lot of conservatism, as Tony mentioned early in his comments. There's conservatism in the modeling process. There's conservatism in the harvest objectives. And then when we make our own recommendations, we kind of give them the reality check of, okay, does this number make sense given all the other metrics and what we're seeing out there on the landscape? Maybe it's, uh, you know, collecting camera data or what we saw on survey, or we go out and do a ground count. We have many ways to kind of uh, do these checks and balances in the modeling and the harvest data process. process. Yes, my concern is that there we have the harvest data, which is great because it just it is what it is. We don't have a lot of postseason data and get a lot of anecdotal information from people from all over the county. I'm just trying to make to understand that complexity right now. Like, are we being too risky? It sounds like the overarching emphasis is that potentially we may be over harvesting and folks are saying, hey, you know, my success rate was kind of low. You said it was 10% down. So, it, you know, I mean, I guess I'm just going to call it out. I mean, do you think it's just overall loss of habitat over time that we're detecting here? Or is this something we should be concerned about? Cody, if I might. Uh, try to address Commissioner Hubbs. Um, there's two things um, I think it's important. When you talk about are we being risky and over harvesting, <clears throat> the harvest recommendations that are being made are relative to a post hunt buck ratio objective. And when we're talking about these objectives in the mid 30s to high 30s, uh, the, the low range on the standard, the low end of the range on for standard is at 30. And so <clears throat> it isn't risky in terms of, you know, biologically pushing these populations to where there's an insufficient number of bucks to breed. It, you know, if we're talking about risk relative to overshooting that objective, I'd go point right back to the conservatism that, that Cody mentioned. And, um, you know, we talked about bias in our surveys and there is a bias against observing bucks in the surveys. Um, 
not only is there you know sexual segregation other than the peak of rut where the bucks isolate cody mentioned they're less numerous they're also more secretive and they also tend to adhere to to cover um, so when we're doing a survey and that's why i said what i said about the surveys before is it isn't the the census that some people portray them to be it's a sample and it's one data point of of many um, in terms of the, the question of, you know, what is it that's limiting our, our populations? I mean, we're, we're in a mega drought in the West. Um, there's a great article in USA Today just recently that talked about this mega drought. When I said this situation is not unique uh, to Nevada, it, it's not unique to Nevada. And when we look at, um, you know, pronghorn, you know, doing fairly well, elk doing fairly well, all of our recovery efforts on sheep, Really, mule deer are the anomalous species, not only in Nevada, but in many other Western states. Um, it's not as though the department is or wants to sit idly by and watch you know, mule deer populations fall off the cliff. The question is, what can we do? What do we have the resources to do? Where can we be effective in addressing it? And it is a myriad of issues. Even if it is a mega drought, the drought conditions uh, limit the available water and, and mule deer are going to use water more predictably, which makes predation more likely, uh, makes fire more likely. With fire, uh, you're going to have a replacement with invasive uh, grass, cheat grasses, which is going to ignite more. And so all these things are inextricably linked. Um, and if there was, I mean, you, you sit there, you, you look at Cody Schroeder and the, the backdrop, you know, went on the wall behind him and and Mike Scott and Tom Donham and, and myself, we are passionate outdoor people. Uh, you know, we want to hunt, we want to have a quality experience just as anybody else does. I don't think there is disagreement on the objectives at the end of the day. I think we all want the same thing. We want healthy herds, we want high quality experience, we want high quality animals, we want to, you know, have have a good time in pursuing it. So I think it's really important when you say risk, are we pushing these populations? Um, the only thing um, that, that you could make a, a statement that uh, there's potential risk, it's potential risk of, of, of surpassing an extremely conservative post hunt buck ratio objective, in which case uh, biologically, if you land at 32 bucks per 100 does instead of 35, you're still almost 10 bucks per 100 does higher than you were in the supposed heyday of, of mule deer and mule deer hunting in Nevada. Um, there is a tremendous amount of variability, not only across the state, there are some legitimate challenges. Uh, certainly Northern Washoe presents some of those challenges, challenges in, in habitat quality, uh, predation, given its proximity to California, Oregon, fire, drought, water, all of it. Um, so it, you also have a lot of variability when you look at hunter success and you look at point class from year to year, whether it's a cool, wet season, whether there's early snow or whether it's hot and dry as it was last year. There's greater variability in the harvest data as a result of weather and hunting conditions typically than there is as a result of availability uh, of, of those animals. We see bigger swings as a result of hunting conditions than we do population levels. Um, so it's really tough um, to answer some of your questions as far as a statewide uh, basis general rule because there is so much variability from area to area, unit to unit, and year to year. But I have absolutely 100% confidence in, in the recommendations that we're making. Um, you know, certainly understand uh, the concern and I, I agree with Chairman Johnston that it's admirable that there are individuals out there that are willing to sacrifice their own opportunity for the betterment of these populations. And at the end of the day, the question is, would that sacrifice result in the desired change? And unfortunately, it's not that simple uh, because there's a whole lot of us that work at the department that would be the first ones to sign up for that. We would have done it a long time ago. Any additional comments or questions? I'm not seeing any. 
Someone wish to make a motion. Don't all speak at once. Well, I mean, if I might interject, Chairman Johnston, I'm sorry. I mean, if we if we can bank on the the, I mean, with the recommendations of the CABS, do we see any similarities with the harvest data, the ones where they have very high harvest, um, and um, making sure that we obviously don't cause detriment in those areas for sure, right? That's what I'm assuming, that if we're seeing the high harvest, I've circled several of them for 2019, we don't want to under pull numbers down in those areas for sure. That's what I'm interpreting from the data. So those would be like, if I'm looking above them, that's definitely not 021 or 022 or uh, 071 through 079 and 091, um, 081, 114 and 115, you know, 221 through 223, 231, 241 through 245, 251 through 253, 261 through 268, 271 through, or and 272, those are all really high. So we don't want to thwart the department's effort. So I wouldn't change anything in those areas if they think that might help those populations. So I don't know major, the major um, areas, because you know I kind of stand off in this when we debate all these things in terms of the hunt groups or the unit groups, because I don't know, but I'm seeing those from a biological perspective. We don't want to really vary those. Does that make sense? Am I interpreting that incorrectly? Mr. Chairman, if I might, um, you, you are interpreting it correctly, but that's one data point. Another data point might be hunter success. And you could have very low hunter success. For example, if there weren't enough bucks in an area, maybe you would only have 10% hunter success, uh, but those hunters uh, happen to stumble onto a group of old age animals. So you wouldn't wanna base that solely on that one data point. The other data points uh, may include observed buck ratio if there is one, may include observed fawn ratio if there is one, should include hunter success if there is one, should also look at percent four point or better. So rather than to focus on that, um, that single data point, I would, I would encourage, you know, consideration of a broader suite. But again, um, you know, before, and, and certainly it's prerogative of the commission to go the direction you, you choose, um, it could get really complicated in a hurry when you start to take all those data points. And that's what the department has done in our recommendation is that we've gone through these data points and we've looked at observed ratios where they exist, whether it be a buck ratio in the fall or a fawn ratio in the spring. We've looked at hunter success. We've looked at trends of hunter success. We've looked at percent four point better in the harvest. And we've looked at trends in percent four point better in the harvest. We've used commission policy to divide this opportunity by express desire by weapon class and looked at three year average success by weapon class to generate this recommendation. So in some ways um, that work has been done for you and is present in the recommendation before you. It's difficult for me because, like I said, more of this anecdotal information that's coming in from the cabs. Um, me, and these are folks that live out there all the time, right, and hunting. So I'm assuming um, it's not completely to be thrown out either. You know what I mean? If there's some concerns, and I'm sensing some concerns, that we pay attention as well to that and really spend some time to make sure we get it right. And I'm sure the department's done everything I, I have a lot of faith in the department. I just want to make sure that if we modify anything, it's not to the detriment of those herds in those areas. That's all. Commissioner Olmberg. Yes, Cody. I just would like to ask a question in regards to the resident mule deer antlerless hunt. And if we were to follow Elko's recommendation in reducing the doe population, because the doe population 
as we all are fully aware of, is that that is how you increase populations and how you maintain it is through the female population. Would Does the department have a heartburn with reducing um, the, the, the quotas uh, to Elko's recommendation on the antlerless hunt? Uh, Commissioner Allenberg, uh, for the record, Cody Schroeder, Department of Wildlife. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, I think we're, you know, we're okay with those recommendations, the alternative recommendations. Um, you know, I would say in like in area six, for instance, we're not really wanting to allow the herd to grow. <laughs> we're trying to actually manage that below about 10,000 just because of the, all the fires some of the challenges those deer face um, in all, you know, in all reality, some of the, those proposed uh, alternative recommendations probably wouldn't make that big of a difference. Um, but we do want to kind of stay on these deer, uh, you know, and that's really the only way you can affect population trajectory is through the female hunt, the, the female harvest in terms of trying to allow it to grow by restricting harvest or, you know, trying to, um, decrease it in some cases. That's what we've been doing with Area 6 the last few years. We've been fairly aggressive and successful at, at um, some of those antlerless hunts. We've instituted the emergency doe hunt, you know, with the fires at times. And I think it's a just a great success story, really, and, and um, just shows that what we can do, the effect we can have by having some of this doe harvest. The, Area 6 has been doing great. Um, in terms of the, the buck quality and, and the population. Um, I mean, we would like it to see it go higher if, if the habitat could, could support it, but we're really trying to just maintain it in, the, in that area. But overall, I would say to answer your question, you know, those are fairly modest requests and we would be okay with them. Um, knowing that if we do have an issue over the winter or whatever, you know, we may come back next year with, with a little bit more aggressive um, recommendation if, if it warrants it. If Mr. Chairman, just to add some clarification there when, when Cody was talking about area six. So I think it's really important to recognize that over 90% of the crucial winter range in association with the Southern portion of that herd has, has been destroyed by wildfire. And it has incredible potential in the habitat on the summer range, area six has traditionally produced and recruited 10 fawns per 100 does higher than the next closest area in the state. So that incredible growth potential on the summer range allows that population to grow very rapidly and outstrip the available winter range in even an average winter. So what has happened uh, traditionally is we've seen these uh, rapid growth and catastrophic winter losses rapid growth for several years, catastrophic winter losses. And what we're trying to do is ameliorate some of those population swings so that perhaps that area six doesn't get quite so high so that in an average or above average winter, it doesn't have to drop so low. We can take advantage of some of that opportunity and main that, maintain that population um, at you know closer to an, an average that's uh, in the balance with the carrying capacity and not see it undergo these, these wide fluctuations. Commissioner Barnes. I just want to kind of add to uh, <clears throat> what Commissioner Almerick had to say. I would uh, I would support Elko's reductions, um, but if if I was really going to uh, to make a reduction to increase the herd, I think I'd cut those quotas by 200 if we're going to make any kind of difference. But I don't think that's a direction. Um, obviously, that the department wants to go right now. And, and maybe that's, that might not be something that where we should go right now. Maybe we ought to give it a couple more years for that winter range um, to come back. And then, uh, and then let's really, then let's, let, let's go a little further. Like Tony said, they'll keep it, keep it kind of, keep some moderate growth. Let's grow it, but, but grow it moderately. And then as far as like the area 10, um, though heard that their, their recommendation recommendations are only, um, 40 head less and, and the fire that I'm really familiar with that burned with about three three miles from where I am now um, it burned a pretty significant portion of uh, a range where where deer winter and there was talk um, last year about uh, a potential 500 head um, emergency hunt 
and and we didn't have that and we we had a a really easy winter and, and the deer did really well so um but i think that maybe we need we ought to keep that uh maybe keep that number where it is now that the department's proposing just so that we don't have to uh, be looking at a potential um, antlerless hunt later in the fall with large numbers. Okay, any other comments or? Commissioner Keel. Thank you, Mr. Sherry. Um, yeah, I think from my perspective, I really, and we've talked about it a lot today, support the science and all the work that the biologists have done. Um, I was fortunate enough to go out in the field last fall and do a postseason aerial survey and was extremely surprised about the amount of bucks that were in the herds with the does, um, which was really reassuring to me. Um, but I think I'm in line with uh, Commissioner Barnes uh, with the doe situation in Washoe, uh, or excuse me, not in Washoe, in uh, Elko County. Um, fortunately, there isn't a doe hunt in Washoe, so we're not affecting uh, recruitment in there by way of the hunt. Um, but there is strong support from Washoe Cab to uh, boost the population based on the discussions from Cody and everybody else today. I'm not sure that uh, decreasing the quota on the bucks uh, is going to achieve that. Um, but I think at this point, if we're going that direction, I'd probably be supportive of reducing those numbers as well. Okay, any other comments? Saying no comments. Someone want to make a motion? Commissioner Keel? Yeah, with that, I'll move to adopt the mule deer portion of Commission Regulation 20 11, the game quotas for the 2020 and 2021 season, as presented with the following uh, exceptions. Uh, to the antler, antlerless illegal weapon hunt 1181 uh, for simplicity sake for units 061, 062, 064, 066 through 068 early to go to the 2019 approved quota of 225 for unit 062, 067, 068 late the same to 225 as last year's quota for unit 071 through 079 and unit 091 to last year's quota of 275. And in the resident mule deer antlered any legal weapon hunt 1331 to follow the Washoe CAB's recommendations for unit 011 through 013 to 50. Unit 014, a quota of 15. For unit 15, a quota of 35. And for unit 022, a quota of 35. And with that, the corresponding uh, non-resident uh, quotas to fall out of that. I'll second that motion. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner Keel, seconded by Commissioner East, that uh, would approve the mule deer portion of CR 20-11 as presented with the following changes. In the resident mule deer antlerless and illegal weapon hunt, the quota in the 061626466 to 682 67688 late 225 071 to 079 and 091 to 275 and then in the resident mule deer antlered any legal weapon hunt 1331 011 to 013 
50, 014, 15, 015, 35, and 022, 35. And then with any commensurate reductions in the non-resident tags uh, in those units. And that would only be with the antlered uh, hunt for the non-resident, correct? We don't have a non-resident antler this hunt, I don't believe. Correct, right, Commissioner Johnson. Is the department clear on the motion? Yes. Okay. Is everyone else clear, Commissioner Hubs? My only question is, does the department have any serious concerns with the proposed motion in those areas? Um, Commissioner Hubs, for the record, Cody Schroeder, definitely don't have serious concerns on the antlerless hunts. Um, I don't know about serious biological concerns on the changes to the antlered uh, any legal weapon hunts in Washoe, but I just feel it's needless reduction. I'll just leave it at that. Mr. McNitch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, I, I'm supportive of the department. Um, if they're good with the antlerless, um, I can, you know, I, I, I know that that's a, that's a tough place to go. And, uh, um, if they're okay with those then I can support the, uh, the antlerless stuff, um, with regards to the other, um, I guess I was going to make this comment a little bit later, but I'll make it now, um, kind of blend in, the uh, some of the comments that I've gotten on the mule deer stuff. I'm, I'm sorry, on the, on the bear stuff, um, where, uh, pretty persistently and consistently uh, receive information or, or comment that um, I need to uh, uh, I need to be more supportive of the department's recommendations when it comes to the quotas for bears and the bear hunt in general um, because of the science and to support the biologists. Um, yet uh, right after that, I get an email from the same people. Uh, that are suggesting that if we do, if we follow the department's recommendations and uh, follow and support the biologists on some of their um, mule deer recommendations, uh, that we're being irresponsible. So I struggle with that. Um, I find it a real irony, and um, I think what it does is it just highlights the fact that uh, uh, that there are social aspects of um, managing these animals. Uh, this is anecdotal stuff. Um, I tend to support the department on these as well, um, on the mule deer stuff for sure. And um, I'm, I'm struggling because I, I appreciate the motion, uh, Commissioner Keel. Um, I think you really did simplify it, but I'm struggling with the Washoe stuff. Um, what I'm hearing is that, uh, you know, we're gonna lose some, uh, uh, some things um, uh, if we deviate from the department's recommendations. So I'm struggling with it a little bit. Uh, I guess we'll find out if it's enough to keep me to support the whole thing here in a second, but uh, that's kind of where I'm at. I just wanted to point out the irony and, um, you know, uh, uh, my tendency when it's come to the mule deer has been to support the department um, uh, and my, my voting record shows that over the years. So um, I'm not sure where I'm going to go over those few tags. I'm just not sure yet. Any additional comments? Commissioner Hubs. So let's go over the Washoe County area with the mule deer. So we're at, we're asking the department to pull back those numbers. That's what I'm hearing. Is that correct? It would be a reduction of, I believe, a total of 80 tags across 022, 015, 014, 011 to 013. And what are those areas again? The unit, hunt, hunt unit groups again. So I just, it's the what? It's O. O one one and O one three, O one four and O one five. Yeah, so it's. And geographically, where are they at? No, I know where they're at. <laughs> I'm just trying to relate them to the the hunt groups because I don't. I, the unit hunt groups, I, I sometimes try to just lay them out in my mind. Um, so I am. 
I actually really appreciated Commissioner McNinch's comments. Thank you very much. Um, I feel the same way at times, and I know um, my um, expertise is not in the area of, of going out and seeing what's on the landscape. And I do respect everyone's opinion as to what they see, because I'm not one to, that goes out and hunts a lot, but um, or at all, I, in fact. But um, I. I am concerned that I had Mr. Schroeder telling me that he has concern for the Washoe County area, and that is in itself a big concern for everybody. So I just would like to make sure we're making the best decisions of a biologist that has concern in a very weakened area, and that makes me nervous. Commissioner East, let's stay focused on the fact that we have a motion in a second. So if there's discussion on the motion, let's have that and then we're gonna call for the vote. Commissioner East. Okay, yes. Uh, Cody, you mentioned doing a study in the Northern Washoe area, that there's a study potentially coming. Um, would that help us next year get to a, a maybe a different understanding of that situation? Uh, yes, Commissioner East, the record, Cody Schroeder. Um, so this really is, we're in the very, very early stages of it. It's, it's actually part of the uh, predator management plan. Um, you know, we've been in talks with some researchers. Um, we've, we've got callers out now that would be a great baseline for it. Um, but I do think it would help us get at this issue of abundance, total abundance of deer, predators, other factors that might be playing in, whether it be, you know, horses or just the habitat conditions. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't want to overstate the magnitude. Uh, when I look at these quota recommendations, ours and the alternatives, we talked a lot about 0 and 4, the granites. I mean, we're, we're talking about it, the, the difference of, you know, 20 versus 30. And I think the motion is 15. It's probably insignificant biologically um to be honest so you know we're definitely we can live with those uh it's not going to cause a significant biological impact by reducing these quotas to what the alternative recommendations are or having them to what we're recommending we simply look at it as there's bucks out there to harvest and we're managing towards our guidelines and why not take advantage of them but certainly cognizant that there are issues we, I mentioned it before, we're uh, committed to, you know, looking into those, whether it be a research project, predator control, habitat projects, working with BLM to remove wild horses. Um, and hopefully this study might shed some light on some of those, some of those, you know, interactions we're looking at. Okay, so yes, I have a second, so I'm gonna slow down support it, but I think we may have left out 033 um was that in the motion because i know it was included in washoe county's recommendations so i just want to double check that and then i'm fine to move forward yeah good catch thanks this is east um so that would be included and if we take it to last year's quota of 20 or unit 033. And is the second acceptable? Yes. Okay. So the motion would include a reduction in tax from 30 to 20 in 033. So um, was everybody clear on the motion? I will I will say I do think there is a distinction between some of the comments we have received regarding the bear hunt and the comments regarding the mule deer hunt. And the distinction being is that the department recognizes the declining population of mule deer in certain areas and in Northern Washoe County and trying to then address that issue. That, that's not what we're hearing from the department in, in respect to the bear population. And so I can see where the public comes and says, well, we, we'd like to reduce the quotas 
in light of the declining population. Um, I, though, I have a bit of a problem with the reduction uh, in the number of tags in the sense that we've now gotten that number to about 90 tags that will be reduced. That's 90 opportunities that are gonna be denied. And biologically speaking, according to the department, the reduction in that number of tags is not gonna be significant. That's one reason why I may support it, but the other reason is it's not gonna have the intended consequence helping address the population decline. And so I have, I have a significant struggle with denying uh, 90 people when the supply of tags we have does not meet demand and, and denying those 90. But I, I do believe in the CAP system and I know that Washoe County is adamant about this. And so I will, reluctantly support the motion based upon what I've heard from the department uh, and taking everything else into consideration. So uh, I've got a, I've got a Excel spreadsheet up so I can't see everybody. Uh, so I don't know if there's any additional comment or question, but I'll just go ahead and then call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries 9-0. Did I get that correct? Is there any nays? Okay, motion carries 9-0. Okay, with that, we will move on to agenda item number 6B, Commission Regulation 20-02, Amendment Number 1, 2020 Black Bear Quotas, Wildlife Staff Specialist Pat Jackson for possible action. Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, sorry to interrupt. There's um, were we going to handle the resident and non-resident mule deer and antelope landowner compensation tags at the end, or do you want to handle that now? I think that's just a mathematical formula that we don't set. Understood. I, I don't know if we've voted on those in the past or not, or recognized it. I be I believe that just goes from the quota we just set on those tags and by mathematical, you'll get to the limitation. Am I wrong on that? That is something that the uh, commission has passed. Um, in the past, it's been a couple different ways. Either the commission has waited for that calculation or the commission has said with the adoption, uh, the resulting number, I believe it can happen either way. You I'm fine either way personally. I just wanted to make sure that we had that conversation. Yeah, I think I think that's appropriate to take that action. Okay, so then we need to do the resident and non-resident mule deer and antelope landowner compensation tags, which would be uh, two and a half percent of what the 2020 quota total. And we are going to have to then stop and take quick public comment on that too. So is there any discussion on the resident, non-resident mule deer and antelope landowner compensation tax? Mr. Schroeder? Uh, yes, Commissioner Johnson, if I may, um, for the record, Cody Schroeder, uh, I'll, I can share my screen here real quick. Just, it might make it clear. Uh, so I believe the motion just addressed the resident, any legal weapon, not the any uh, non-resident, any legal weapon. Typically what we've done is adjust those and pass the motion that way. And then because the, the landowner compensation tag percentage and total number of tags is depending on the total the total number of tags. Um, and and if, I, if you'll allow me, I can kind of show you what that looks like right now. Okay, well, I did, I did, my understanding was Commissioner Keel's motion did include the commensurate reductions in non-resident tags. That's correct. Yeah, yeah but 
uh, I guess what my point is, is I need to change these numbers really fast before we get down to uh, this part right here. Right. Uh, because that, in essence, will be what you're approving is the total uh, number of tags. It actually may not even move it too much because the, the non-resident tag is a very uh, small change. Okay. I can do that quickly here. Um, we have to have two tags, so one rounds up to two. Chairman Johnston, this is Jack Rob for the record. Yes. Uh, I don't think we've taken an action on youth tags without a formal action. I don't know if we can go forward with that youth hunt without a formal action. I'd... I thought that was covered by Commissioner Keel's motion as well. It was all okay. the tags with the following couple exceptions. Okay, if we're if we're all good with that, it is a different hunt number. But if we're all good with that, I'm good with that. I just wanted to make sure that was clear with everybody. Okay, so if if it's not clear to everybody, my understanding was that Commissioner's Keel motion was to adopt all the mule deer quota recommendations as presented in 20-11, with only the changes in 1181, which was the resident mule deer antlerless and illegal weapon hunt, and the changes in 1331 and units 033, 22, 1514, 11, and 13. That's how I understood the motion. I'm good with that if everybody understands that. I just wanted to have that clarified. And so there was no changes to the junior analog or the junior mule deer hunt quota. It was adopted as presented by the department. Yeah, I don't want to take opportunity with kids. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, if I may, uh, so this these numbers, if you're looking at the screen, if you can see or what uh, the motion, I believe I tried to capture it. Um, requested just for the antler list and the uh, any legal weapon. Uh, resident hunts. Yeah, uh, that is, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So then really what we're talking about is just this little part right here, the two and a half percent. And really, I think actually you can just um, make a motion to approve the, the percentage, I believe. Uh, but this is what the numbers would be. It would be a max of 540 nine tags um, with this total number of approved um, mule deer and pronghorn tags. That's accounting for the motion that was that was passed. That makes sense. Okay. So the potential action would to be approved uh, landowner compensation tags equivalent to two and a half percent of the total number of resident and non-resident mule deer and antelope tag issued in 2020. Mm -hmm. Correct? That's correct. Okay. But it is an action item. We didn't take public comment on it. So I'm going to break until 420, which is four minutes from now. So if anyone has public comment on the landowner compensation tags, um, please provide it in the next four minutes. We'll reconvene at 420.
All right, it's 420. And we have not received any public comment on, let me check just again. We have not received any public comment on the landowner compensation tax. Is there any discussion or comment on that? Seeing none, then I would make a motion that the total number of deer and antelope landowner compensation tags be equivalent to two and a half percent of the total number of 2020 tags issued for mule deer and antelope. Second. I'm not sure who got the second. Commissioner Barnes, is everybody clear on the motion? Is that sufficient for what the department needs? I see. Director Wasley nodding his head. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 9-0. Okay, then we can move on to commission agenda item 6B, commission regulation 20-02 amendment number one, 2020 black bear quotas, wildlife staff specialist, Pat Jackson for possible action. The commission will establish regulations for the numbers of tags to be issued for black bear for the 2020 season. Once the commission members have discussed this agenda item, a recess of a specific duration will be taken in order for the public to provide input at the following email address, wildlifecommission at endow.org. Before reconvening the meeting, public comments will be shared with the commission prior to taking any action. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson, I don't want to cut you short, but we have been going since 10 with intermittent breaks. And I know I am hungry and have a headache. So let's try to move through this as efficiently as possible. Uh, Pat Jackson, for the record. Thank you, Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, Chairman, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Great. I, uh, I've been here uh, all day since 9 a.m. So I'm right, I'm right there with you. So let me uh, share a very short presentation and uh, we will go from there. Okay, and here I am uh, recommending harvest limits and quotas. Uh, the recommendations are going to be 45 resident and five non-resident tags with independent total and female harvest limits for each uh, series of hunt units. These are the recommendations the department's bringing forth for our 2020 bear season. They are the exact same as last year. Uh, just to quickly go over harvest, uh, during the uh, 2019 season, we had three females, 14 males harvested uh, with mean ages for males at 8.6 and mean age for females at 4.7 and females were just under 18% of that harvest. So looking at percent females in the harvest, uh, that was a light harvest. Uh, the mean age of females uh, stood up for that one year is heavy. Uh, looking at mean age of males, 8.6 years, that's a, a light harvest, and we use a three-year average, so you can see that we saw this harvest as light, stable, and light, uh, and with that, I'll entertain any questions. Any questions for Mr. Jackson? Okay, uh, Pat, if you could, can you take down the shared screen? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, thank you. It just helps me be able to see everybody. Okay, any questions for Mr. Jackson? Commissioner McNinch? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so Pat, when was the last time um, program mark was run? Uh, that was before the commission meeting last year with uh, with Dr. Sedinger. Okay, I guess the reason I had asked is my recollection was is that it hadn't been run last year. So I must have misunderstood or Maybe I um, that it, because he had retired that he hadn't uh, that it hadn't been run for a year or two. So um, that's just that that was my recollection. So if I'm so and that's what the estimation uh, numbers in the documents are are uh, uh, based on. Uh, 
Yes, however, for recommending the uh, the hunt, I look at three different harvest metrics, which are that uh, mean age of female, mean age of male, and percentage of female in the harvest. Okay. Thanks. Fisher Hubs. So the mean age of females for this last year was three years, seven months. Is that correct? I, I, I'm sorry, uh, can you please repeat that question? The mean age for females this last harvest season was three years and seven months. Oh, I'm sorry, it's four years and seven months. Four years and seven months, okay. Thank you. Any, enough, any additional questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Jackson, for the efficient presentation. We'll go ahead and I should comment. I, I, we received a number of correspondence uh, regarding the bear hunt, several in support of the quota re being recommended and, and, and several in opposition to the quota. So uh, we did receive those. I forwarded those on to the department and they've been shared with the entire commission. Uh, with that, we will do our quick break to receive public comment on the bear quota recommendations. And it's 426 by my clock on my computer. So at 435, we'll reconvene. If you have a public comment, it should be emailed to wildlifecommission at endow.org. And we will be in recess until then 435.
All right, it's 435. Okay, so I believe we're all back. Uh, I hope everyone had a chance to review the public comment we received. We received, uh, by my count, uh, six, six correspondence with respect to the black bear quotas. Two are in opposition, four in support. Uh, Therese Campbell is the newest member of the Clark County CAB. Uh, wish to voice her opposition to the, the black bear hunt and quota, uh, noting that Nevada wildlife belongs to all Nevadans, including Nevadans who, who are not hunters. She expressed her opposition to the bear hunt as a trophy hunt and the trophy hunts uh, are questionably, if not indefensible from an ethics uh, point of view. Uh, Fred Volts, uh, offered public comment saying that the quota recommendations for 2020 black bear killing season need to be substantially reduced given the number of deaths uh, to other causes attributable to other causes. Uh, he also questioned the population estimates. Uh, Paul Dixon uh, voiced his support. He noted how many years the hunt has been occurring, uh, that the there's been no detrimental impact on the bear population and that the quotas continue to be uh, reasonable. Uh, Steve Robinson, Washoe Cab, voiced support, uh, noted that the bear hunt has been a success both from a biological and hunter satisfaction standpoint. Joe Krim and Rex Flowers also sent in correspondence voicing their support for the black bear hunt. That was the extent of the public comment. I will make sure none were pasted uh, after that. There were no additional public comments. Any further discussion or comments from the commission? Commissioner McNinch and then Commissioner Hubs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so yeah, I won't take, uh, I'll, I'll try not to take too much time here. Um, you know, when it, I guess I tried to jot down some notes here um, based on uh, some of the public, uh, the comment and correspondence that we've had. Um, I guess, uh, unfortunately, some of it might come off as a little defensive. Um, I'm not trying to, uh, um, I'm not trying to perpetuate uh, major conversations. I, I just feel I would be remiss if I didn't share my thoughts on some of this stuff. Um, there's been a lot of comment made about uh, um, you know, if you disagree with this bear hunt, then it's all based on emotion. And, um, you know, there, there are certainly emotions. That's why everybody's, that's why these calls to action have gone out on both sides of the issue, on all sides of this issue. It is a passion. It is an emotional issue for everyone. Um, it's not just one side or the other. It's for everyone. That's why we have uh, such divergent views. That's why everybody's in different camps. It's, it's one of those issues. And um, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay, so... Um, so I don't apologize for, uh, any of the emotion that I might feel for it. Um, uh, I do try to stay, uh, somewhat grounded. I won't get into the details. It, it might not, uh, probably not going to carry a lot of weight today. I do have some concerns. I don't believe, uh, program mark is run often enough to help, um, with the bear estimates. Um, um, I understand that there are passive methods and some conservative, uh, uh, the way that this, the, the hunt is set up, it's uh, designed to be conservative. I appreciate that. Um, but um, I'm just not where other people are when it comes to uh, feeling comfortable with those, uh, with those methodologies. It's just where I'm at. Um, my concerns with the bear hunt aren't any different than others' uh, concerns with maybe the U and doe hunts that we see in other areas. Um, I just happen to have different opinion about it with regards to bears. Um, so, um, uh, so I say that I do want to say a couple things though. Um, number one, I don't want my comments or my, um, my position on this to be a reflection of, uh, uh, that I, that I don't respect or appreciate the department and the biologists and the science that they put together. Um, I have great respect for these guys. Um, Mike, I've known Mike for, 
35 years, if you can believe that. Congratulations, Mike, by the way. Um, I know you're going to do a great job. Um, and I trust these guys. Um, always have, always will. And, uh, um, but, it, but it's a little bigger than that for me. So um, I just want those guys to know that, um, that I respect that, and I appreciate everything that they do. I also want the sportsmen to understand that I very much appreciate everything that they do um, for wildlife conservation, not just in their particular counties, not just in the state of Nevada, but, but um, across the board, everywhere. So I have great appreciation for that stuff. Um, I also want everybody to know that um, my vote is not um, tacit acceptance or approval or that I condone some of the actions that are going on. Um, it bothers me to no end that people get harassed over um, uh, over the, the that, that sportsmen are, are partaking in illegal activity that's been approved, it's lawful. Um, it bothers me. It bothers me that in-down employees would get uh, followed in vehicles down highways um, unsafe. I'm not condoning any of that stuff with my position. I want everybody to know that. I want that on the record. Um, I don't condone harassment of property owners who are having trouble with bears and are having a hard time dealing with it. Um, I don't condone people standing outside of their houses and uh, taunting, taunting the homeowners and stuff. I don't condone any of that stuff. So with my vote, I want everyone to understand that I don't condone those things, that I do appreciate the sportsmen. I do appreciate the biologists. I just fall on a different spot on the conservation scale. We're all, we're all interested in the conservation of wildlife and bears this, in this particular instance, it happens to be with bears. I just happen to fall on a different spot on that conservation scale. And that's where my vote is. That's where, that's just where I'm at. Um, others, uh, my fellow commissioners, some of you are further down that conservation line where you're comfortable with um, establishing quotas and hunts. I'm just not quite there. And that's what this is all about. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, supporting, um, you know, being <laughs> causing problems out there and harassing people. And uh, it's not a, a function of disrespect for for sportsmen or, or, uh, um, or biologists or anything like that. And I just felt like it was important for me to say that. So that's, that's enough out of me. Thank you, Commissioner McManch, Commissioner Hubs. Yes, I just wanted to say um, this time around, I received a lot of comments from, I believe, sportsmen. And I really appreciated that. I don't know. Um, I think we all received the same comments, but I know some were kind of sent over to me. I'm going to go through and make sure that the um, department has everything that was sent to me. And um, I wanted to echo some of the same sentiments as uh, Commissioner McNinch. It's not that this is an anti-hunting stance by me at all. Um, I serve a certain role and we know our roles on the commission. And um, we, we know too, that we're outnumbered. We're outnumbered and we have seen social science, which is hard science. Finally, they, we were able to um, come to that holding that shows that this hunt is not supported by the general public overall, especially with dogs. And that's not changing. And I think what's happened is, and it's sad to me, is that the public, general public is getting apathetic. Um, in regard to pleading their case, because there's not going to be a change here. But in that light, I'll continue to vote what I think their vote would be, be serving as a voice for the general public, because I do not see the data reflecting that they're on board with this hunt. And that is hunters and non-hunters, right? That's just everybody. So for that reason, I continue to hold my stance. It's no disrespect to anybody else, but I feel that they need a voice on this board. And so for that reason, I will only vote in support of a quota if it reduces it. Any additional comments? I think I adequately said my piece at a prior meeting with respect to the bear hunt. It's been going on for a number of years. I think we get at least over 5,000 applicants a year. 
to draw 45 resident tags, five non-resident tags with a harvest limit that is not equivalent to the tags. It is, it is limited um, and I continue to support uh, the hunt. Uh, if there's no other comments, then I'd make a motion to approve CR 20-02 amendment number one, the 2020 black bear quotas is presented. I'll second that. The motion, second by Vice Chair East. Everyone clear on the motion? Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-2 with Commissioners McNinch and Hubs dissenting. With that, we'll move on to agenda item number seven. Future commission meetings and commission committee assignments, Secretary Tony Wosley and Chairman Brad Johnson for possible action. The next commission meeting is scheduled for June 26th and 27th, 2020 in Murrington. The commission will review and discuss potential agenda items for that meeting. The commission may change the, the time and meeting location at this time. The chairman may designate and adjust committee assignments and add or dissolve committees as necessary at this time. Any anticipated meeting that may occur prior to the next commission meeting may be discussed. Once the commission members have discussed this agenda item, a recess of a specific duration will be taken in order for the public to provide input at the following email address, wildlifecommission at endow.org. Before reconvening the meeting, public comments will be shared with the commission prior to taking any action. Commissioner Wosley, or Director Wosley. Thank you, Chairman Johnston. Um, as indicated, the current scheduled date, June 26, 27, at the Lyon County Community Chambers in Yarrington. Of course, we'll uh, continue to monitor the COVID-19 and uh, associated um, shutdown, stay-at-home orders, and need to respond accordingly, of course. Um, that has presently been extended to May 15th, I believe. So we'll definitely have some, some time. Uh, we'll regroup on May 15th. If we are able to hold that meeting at the Lyon County Community Chambers in Yarrington, uh, we do not plan to video stream or teleconference that meeting since we would be in a, a rural location. Um, we have a few action items that would be brought forward from the uh, March meeting that would need to be heard. Um, we are looking at having some subcommittees, some of the committee meetings uh, here in a couple weeks. Uh, one of those uh, could include um, the draft predation uh, management plan. We do need to uh, bring that uh, back before the commission. So that is on the agenda as a potential action item. Um, then we have some Additional action items for the June meeting that would include the CAB budget requests, uh, the duck stamp and upland game stamp projects. And I know the commission is well aware of the fact that we dissolved the physical stamps themselves, but we still have those restricted reserve accounts and essentially use the percentage of total revenue uh, that was generated from the various stamp programs. We use the seven year average to determine the percentage of revenue that continues to go into those restricted reserve accounts. And so those duck stamp projects and upland game stamp projects would come before the commission, typically at that June meeting for action. Uh, we need to set the upland game and fur bearer seasons and, and limits at that meeting. Amend uh, wildlife heritage tag vendors and organizations, and then look at uh, heritage proposals, extensions and reallocations uh, that's another uh, committee meeting that we're hopeful of uh, being able to have between uh, now and then with tentative plans, I believe, to try to set something up for the, the middle of this month. And then uh, amend, uh, as required, the Upland Game Release Plan. Those are uh, some of the action items. We also have three potential regulations for workshop that include CGR 488, Landowner Compensation Tag, uh, regulation, CGR 489, the shed antler regulation, CGR 490, which is the bonus point and first come first serve regulation. Um, we discussed that briefly, uh, I believe in the same agenda item back in 
April. Um, we did talk about um, that we wouldn't want anything to change for this year's applicants. Again, um, that wouldn't necessarily be effective upon passage. Uh, <clears throat> ultimately, it, it must be approved by the Legislative Commission. Therefore, if we were to workshop it on one day and pass it on the next, it still would not become active until upon passage by the Legislative Commission. So for possible adoption, we would have that uh, bonus point, first come, first serve reg. Also, CGR 485 tag transference, uh, deference and return program has been discussed considerably, as well as CGR 491 uh, notification of draw results. There are a number of um, <clears throat> committee, potential committee meetings and associated reports. Again, we're, we're kind of playing catch up a little bit from the April, uh, formerly March uh, scheduled meeting, as well as this meeting, since the last two meetings have been kind of bare bones and um, you know strict uh, business action items only. But um, as chairman um, and as your uh, last meeting, I believe, um, you did express a desire to kind of address the committee structure, potential revisions or uh, dissolution. So that is a, a potential agenda item as well. Status report on the application hunt system. Of course, by that time, we will be uh, completely through the application and draw process. And uh, as specified in uh, the contract, our um, vendor, uh, Calcomai, um, will provide us a, a presentation on, on that system. Um, big game status report. I'm not exactly sure um, what that entails. It's on my list of possible items here. Uh, wildlife Heritage Committee and report. And so we will need, um, again, to hopefully have a Heritage uh, Committee meeting in the middle part of this month uh, to be able to narrow down those projects and present those to the commission for or full approval. The Wayne E. Kirch Wildlife Conservation Award Committee and report with the uh, possible selection of a recipient for the Wayne E. Kirch Wildlife Conservation Award. Uh, tag allocation application hunt committee, uh, possible meeting and report. Uh, wildlife damage and management committee, possible meeting report. The regulation simplification committee, meeting and report. Um, ledge committee and committee and report, um, landowner comp tag committee to present a report for protocols in hunt units, public lands committee, finance committee, um, and commissioner appreciation, realizing that this is uh, likely more than we could accomplish in that meeting, but I wanna put it all out there to, to certainly get uh, feedback and, and perspective for, for folks to consider uh, what would be their priorities. And then um, we have some informational items. Uh, we have an item um, from the Nevada uh, Operation Game Thief Citizens Board asking uh, if they could present the Law Enforcement Professional of the Year Award to uh, individuals at that commission meeting. Um, certainly like to accommodate that if, if possible. Uh, standing agenda item regarding an update on the Fallon Naval Range and, and Training Center and the Nevada Test and Training Range. Uh, we also uh, were looking at an informational item on the possibility of reinstituting a mandatory indoctrination seminar for bighorn ram tag holders. We have a conservation partner spotlight um, as a standing item as well. We, we do have a possibility in that we have a Walker Basin Conservancy out there. Certainly, uh, Chairman Johnston, you'd probably be familiar uh, with um, conservation partners in that part of the world. And, any ideas you'd have, uh, we'd certainly welcome. And then uh, if there's any project updates also from that part of the world. And then lastly, um, we have a petition from Mr. John Zenz regarding the big game tag drawing changes. He'd like to uh, present this in person and has requested that this item be postponed until the commission meets in person to be able to present his petition uh, pertaining to a uh, bonus point and, and uh, application uh, and drop drop process. And that concludes my fairly comprehensive list of possible agenda items for that June 26, 27 meeting in Yarrington. Okay. 
Uh, I didn't have any others. Uh, I know in the past we have oftentimes tried to get out during these rural meetings, but I suspect given the limited agenda today and the limited agenda that we had in April, that we're not going to have that opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, that we're going to have to put as much on this agenda as we can to get caught up. Uh, and so I will work with the director's office in, in that regard. Um, maybe we can, but I, I don't know. And I think there's going to be a number of committee meetings too. So, um, Mr. Burkett, it, this, this agenda item says public comment. Do I need to do public comment if we're not going to take action? I think what we did last time is you went ahead and took the public comment and we'll add it on to the YouTube video at the end. Okay. Um, but I'm certainly, um, I'm hopeful that we all get to meet in person in June here in Yarrington. Um, I'm looking forward to having the commission here again in my hometown and uh, Hopefully we will all be in person, I hope, for everyone's sake, not just as it relates to uh, commission business. Uh, so with that, I think I can then move on to the public comment period. Is that correct, Mr. Burkett? Yes. Okay. We'll then move on to agenda item number eight, public comment period. Persons wishing to speak must put their comments in writing and send them to wildlifecommission at indow.org. Uh, it's 455. If you have public comment, uh, please submit them by 5 p.m. to the email address wildlifecommission at indal.org. We will reconvene at 5. Thank you.
You too. I'm almost done. All right. Brad, this is Kirsten. Can you hear me? Yes. Your mic is on. Huh? Just... Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted you to know. I didn't know if you knew or not. <laughs> I wasn't no, saying anything, was I? No, I just wanted you not to say anything if you didn't know it was on. So I'm just letting you know, looking out for you. Oh, I, I appreciate it. I'm just reading the public comment now. <laughs> Yeah, so, so just take it in and no comment. Okay. Okay, it's a little after five o'clock. So we received, I believe, two public comments. Uh, Mel Belling offered the following comment. I would like to commend you all on a meeting that was ran very well. I don't think it would go as smooth. As, I didn't think it would go as smooth as it did. See you in Urington. We received a comment from Fred Volz. There's been another major development regarding the long festering subject of wildlife killing contests. Today, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission, Colorado's equivalent to the Nevada Wildlife Commission, voted to outlaw wildlife killing contests. Colorado becomes the sixth state after California, Vermont, New Mexico, Arizona, and Massachusetts to address these unscientific, dangerous, both to wildlife and public safety and destructive contests. Once again, the question becomes, when will Nevada act to similarly eliminate these regressive contests rather than remaining mired in backward 19th century thinking about wildlife? On a separate subject for future commission meetings conducted online, staff would be well advised to consult with the State Public Utilities Commission and determine how they have managed to implement a phone connection for the public to offer their verbatim comments on actions items during public meetings. It is technically possible to offer active, not passive public participation. So let's see it implemented. Again, that was from Mr. Volz. Uh, um, from Andrew Wolf. This was the first commission meeting I have watched or attended. Thank you for broadcasting it live. I watched all day long. It was a well-run board and the Endow staff were knowledgeable and well-prepared. Very informative, thank you. And from Mr. Cooney, uh, thanks Chairman Johnston and commissioners for making the best of a challenging situation. So with that, that is the public comment that we received. I wanna thank everybody from the department uh, Mr. Cox, Mr. Schroeder, Mr. McKee, Mr. Scott, uh, Director Wasley, Deputy Director Rob, I, Brandy. Uh, I don't even know all the names of everybody who helped uh, put this together. And I also want to thank my fellow commissioners uh, for their efforts today in getting through uh, the quota setting under unique circumstances. It's a challenging meeting always, but especially challenging when we have to do it uh, via Zoom. So I hope everyone remains healthy and safe. I hope to see you in Earrington in June. I can't believe it's already May 1st. Um, 
but everyone take care of themselves and thank you all so much again. And I also wanna thank the public for continuing to participate both before and during the meeting uh, in circumstances where it's not as easy to do so. Uh, but I do appreciate all the input from everyone uh, during the course of the day. I know it's been long, but thank you all. And we'll see you in June, we'll be adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Brad.